Preface to At the Point of the Bayonet, A Tale of the Maratha War by G. A. Henty. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. At the Point of the Bayonet, A Tale of the Maratha War. Preface the story of the war in which the power of the great Maratha confederacy was broken is one of the most stirring pages of the campaign which begun by clive ended in the firm establishment of our great empire in the indian peninsula when the struggle began the marathas were masters of no small portion of india their territory comprising the whole country between bombay and delhi and stretching down from rajputana to Allahabad, while in the south they were lords of the district of Cuttack, thereby separating Madras from Calcutta. The jealousies of the great Maratha leaders, Holkar and Skindiar, who were constantly at war with each other, or with the Peshwa at Pune, greatly facilitated our operations, and enabled us, although at the cost of much blood, to free a large portion of India from a race that was a scourge faithless intriguing and crafty cruel and reckless of life the marathas conquering race as they were yet failed in the one virtue of courage they could sweep the land with hordes of wild horsemen could harry peaceful districts and tyrannize over the towns they conquered but they were unable to make an effective stand against british bayonets and british sabres they were a race of freebooters and even the most sentimental humanitarian can feel no regret at the overthrow of a power that possessed no single claim to our admiration and weighed like an incubus upon the peoples it oppressed the history of the marathas as written by grant duff whose account i have throughout followed is one long record of perfidy murder and crime of all sorts end of preface Section 1 of At the Point of the Bayonet, A Tale of the Maratha War by G. A. Henty. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. At the Point of the Bayonet, A Tale of the Maratha War. Chapter 1 a faithful nurse part one on a swell of ground in the wild country extending from bombay to the foot of the ghauts stood a small camp in the centre was a large pavilion the residence for the time of major lindsay an officer whose charge was to keep the peace in the district it was no easy matter the inhabitants wild and lawless lived in small villages scattered about the rough country for the most part covered with forests and subject to depredations by the robber bands who had their strongholds among the hills major lindsay had with him a party of twenty troopers not for defence there was little fear of attack by the natives of the concan but to add to his authority to aid in the collection of the small tax paid by each community and to deter the mountain robbers from descending on to the plain he generally spent the cool season in going his rounds while during the hot weather his headquarters were at bombay he had with him his wife and infant child the child was some three months old and was looked after by an ayah who had been in major lindsay's service ten years for three elder children had been born to him all however dying from the effects of the climate before reaching the age of five the ayah had nursed each in succession and had become greatly attached to the family especially to her youngest charge she had come to speak english well but with the child she always talked in her native tongue as the major saw the advantage it would prove to the boy when he grew up to be able to speak fluently one at least of the native languages the nurse was a maratha she had been in the service of the british resident at Pune and when he was recalled had entered that of major lindsay 
at that time a captain who acted as secretary to the resident a young officer from bombay had just ridden out to spend a day or two with the major and was sitting with him at the entrance to the tent the news from the army he said is most unsatisfactory as you know to the astonishment of everyone colonel edgerton was appointed to the command in spite of the fact that he was so infirm as to be altogether unfit for active service and mostyn our late resident at Pune, and karnak accompanied him as deputies of the council that is altogether a bad arrangement the major said it has always been a great disadvantage for a general to be accompanied by civilians with power to thwart his combinations against mostyn's appointment no one could raise any objection as having been for some years at Pune, he understands the marathas and indeed is much liked by them so that in any negotiations he would have far more chance of success than a stranger but karnak is hot-headed and obstinate with a very high idea of his own importance and it is certain that there will be difficulties between him and edgerton i am sorry to say major that these anticipations were very speedily verified as you know the advance party landed at apti on november the twenty third and seized the roads over the gorge and on the twenty fifth the main body disembarked at panwell no sooner had they got there than there was a quarrel between edgerton and karnak most unfortunately mostyn who would have acted as mediator was taken ill on the very day after landing and was obliged to return to bombay and i hear there is hardly any chance of his recovery the army did not reach the top of the gorts till the twenty third of december instead of at the latest three days after landing and actually spent eleven days before it arrived at Kali, only eight miles in advance of the boer gorts of course this encouraged the enemy and gave plenty of time for them to assemble and make all their arrangements and when we last heard they were harassing our march for the past two days no news has arrived and there seems to be little doubt that the marathas have closed in round their rear and cut off all communications it is monstrous that they should march so slowly the whole thing has been a hideous blunder and the idea of encumbering a force of four thousand men with something like thirty thousand camp followers and with a train of no less than nineteen thousand bullocks to say nothing of other draught animals is the most preposterous thing i ever heard of in fact the whole thing has been grossly mismanaged i don't say that the conduct of the marathas has not for some time been doubtful if not threatening it is well known that the governor-general and the council at calcutta have most strongly disapproved of the whole conduct of the council at bombay indeed no explanation has ever been given as to why they took up the cause of ragopa the scoundrel who grasped the crown and who was privy to if he did not instigate the murder of his nephew the young peishwa he was not unopposed for nuiz and hurry punt two of the leading mahratta ministers formed a regency under gunga bai the widow of the murdered peishwa while matters were undecided the bombay council opened communications with rugoba who they thought was likely to be successful and promised to assist him if he would advance a considerable sum of money and cede to the company salsette the small islands contiguous to bombay and bassain which had been captured from the portuguese by the marathas an altogether inexcusable arrangement as the marathas were at peace with us and rugoba was not in a position to hand the islands over that matter however was settled by sending an expedition which captured salsette and tanna in 1775 four years ago since then rugoba has become a fugitive and without a shadow of reason is making war against the whole force of the Maratha confederacy who although divided amongst themselves and frequently engaged in the struggles for supremacy have united against us for they say that Sindhya, holkar and hari punt are in command of their army 
to send four thousand men of whom less than six hundred are europeans against the whole maratha power is a desperate step i know we have fought and won against greater odds many times in the history of india but our forces have always been well led marched with the smallest amount of baggage possible and made up for inferiority in numbers by speed activity and dash here on the contrary we have a force hampered to an unheard-of degree by baggage and camp followers with an invalid at its head controlled by two civilians and moving at a rate which in itself testifies to divided councils and utter incompetency on the part of its commander it is almost impossible even to hope for success under such conditions the lookout is certainly bad the younger officer agreed however before now the fighting powers of the british soldier have made up for the blunders of his commanders and we may hope that this will be the case now if a disaster happens the major said we shall have the marathas down at the gates of bombay and as soon as i hear a rumor of it and news travels wonderfully fast among the natives i shall return to the city oh i don't think you need fear anything of that sort major besides this is not on the direct line between the ghauts and the city and even if they find they cannot push on i should say our force would be able to secure their retreat the maratha horse will never be able to break our squares but of course in that case we should have to abandon all our baggage and baggage animals i agree with you that the marathas would doubtless hang on the skirts of our force and follow them down the boar ghaut and so would not come anywhere near us but they might detach flying parties to burn and plunder as is their custom brave as they are the marathas do not fight for the love of fighting but simply from the hope of plunder and from enlarging their territories well we may hope in a day or two to hear that a battle has been fought and that a victory has been won not that one victory would settle the matter for the maratha force consists almost entirely of cavalry and as we have only a handful they would if beaten simply ride off and be ready to fight again another day if we had pushed on and occupied Pune directly we landed which should have been easy enough if the baggage train had been left behind for it is but forty miles from panwell to the maratha capital the position would have been altogether different the marathas would not have had time to collect their forces and we should probably have met with no opposition and once in Pune, could have held it against the whole maratha force besides it is certain that some of the chiefs seeing that rugoba was likely to be made paishwa would have come to the conclusion that it would be best for them to side with him of course the baggage should all have been left at panwell and in that case the force should have entered Pune three days after landing instead of delaying from the twenty fifth of november until to-day the seventh of january and even now at their present rate of advance they may be another fortnight before they arrive at Pune. i don't think there has been so disgraceful a business since we first put foot in india at any rate i shall send mary and the child down to bombay to-morrow it is all very well to have her with me when everything is peaceable but although i do not think there is any actual risk it is well that in turbulent times like these with nothing but a force under such incompetent leading between us and a powerful and active enemy she should be safe at bombay just before daybreak next morning there was a sudden shout from one of the sentries who had for the first time been posted round the camp the warning was followed by a fierce rush and a large body of horse and foot charged into the camp the escort were for the most part killed as they issued from their tents the major and his friend were shot down as they sallied out sword in hand the same fate befell mrs lindsay then the marathas proceeded to loot the camp the ayah had thrust the child underneath the wall of the tent at the first alarm a maratha seized her and would have cut her down had she not recognized him by the light of the lamp which hung from the tent ridge why cousin sufta she exclaimed do you not know me he loosed his hold and stood back and gazed at her why soyera he exclaimed is it you 
It is more than ten years since I saw you. It is my cousin, he said to some of his companions who were standing round, my mother's sister's child. Don't be alarmed, he went on to the woman. No one will harm you. I am one of the captains of this party. I must speak to you alone, Sufta. She went outside the tent with him. You have nothing to fear, he said. You shall go back with us to Junir. I have a house there, and you can stay with my wife. Besides, there are many of your people still alive. But that is not all, Sufda. I was Aya to the Major and his wife, whom your people have just killed, and whom I loved dearly, and in my charge is their child. He is but a few months old, and I must take him with me. It is impossible, Sufda replied. No white man, woman, or child would be safe in the Deccan at present. No one would see his face, the woman said. I would wrap him up, and will give out that he is my own child. As soon as we get up the gorts, I would stain his face and skin, and no one would know that he was white. If you will not let me do it, tell your men to cut me down. I should not care to live if the child were gone, as well as his father and mother. You cannot tell me how kind they were to me. You would not have me ungrateful, would you, Sufda? Well, well, the man said good-naturedly, though somewhat impatiently. Do as you like, but if any harm comes of it, mind it is not my fault. Thankful for the permission, Soyera hurried round to the back of the tent, picked up the child and wrapped it in her robe, and then when, after firing the place, the Marathas retired, she fell in behind them and followed them in the toilsome climb up the mountains, keeping so far behind that none questioned her. Once or twice Sufda dropped back to speak to her. It is a foolish trick of yours, he said, and I fear that trouble will come of it. I don't see why it should, she replied. The child will come to speak Maratha, and, when he is stained, no one will guess that he is English. In time, I may be able to restore him to his own people. The other shook his head. That is not likely, he said, for before many weeks we shall have driven them into the sea. Then he must remain a Maratha, she said until he is able to make his way to join the English in Madras or Calcutta. You are an obstinate woman, and always have been so, else you would not have left your people to go to be servant among the whites. However, I will do what I can for you, for the sake of my mother's sister and of our kinship. On the way up to the hills, Soyera stopped several times to pick berries. When they halted, she went aside and pounded them, and then boiled them in some water in a lota, a copper vessel, Sufda lent her for the purpose, and dyed the child's head and body with it, producing a colour corresponding to her own. The party, which was composed of men from several towns and villages, broke up the next morning. Have you money? Sufda asked her as she was about to start alone on her journey. Yes, my savings were all lodged for me by Major Lindsay, with some merchants at Bombay, but I have twenty rupees sewn up in my garments. As to your savings, Soyera, you are not likely to see them again, for we shall make a clean sweep of Bombay. However, twenty rupees will be useful to you, and would keep you for three or four months, if you needed, but as you are going to my wife, you will not want them. Take this dagger. When you show it to her, she will know that you are come from me, but mind, she is, like most women, given to gossip. Therefore, I warn you not to let her into the secret of this child's birth, for if you did so, half the town would know it in the course of a day or two. Now, I must go back with my men to join a party who are on their way to fight the English. I should have gone there direct, but met the others starting on this marauding expedition, which was so much to the taste of my men that I could not restrain them from joining. I shall see you at Junir, as soon as matters are finished with the English. Then I shall, after staying a few days there, rejoin Scindia, in whose service I am. Soyera started on her way. At the villages through which she passed, she was questioned as to where she came from, and replied that she had been living down near Bombay, 
but now that the english were going to fight the marathas she was coming home having lost her husband a few months before as the road to junir diverged widely from that to Pune, she was asked no questions about the war all were confident that the defeat of the english was certain now that scindia and holkar and the government of the peishwa had laid aside their mutual jealousies and had joined for the purposes of crushing the whites End of section one. Section two of At the Point of the Bayonet, a tale of the Maratha War by G. A. Henty. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. At the Point of the Bayonet, A Tale of the Maratha War Chapter 1, A Faithful Nurse, Part 2 On arriving, after two days' journey at Junir, she went to the address that Sufder had given her, but was coldly received by his wife. As it is Sufder's order, of course I must take you in, she said, but when he returns I shall tell him that I do not want another woman and child in the house. Why do you not go to your own people? As you are Sufder's cousin, you must be the sister of Ramdas. Why should you not go to him? I will gladly do so if you tell me where he lives. He has a small farm. You must have passed it as you came along. It is about a mile from here. I will go to him at once, Soyera said. No, no, the woman exclaimed, that will never do. You must stop a day or two here. Sufder would be angry indeed, were he to find that you did not remain here, and would blame me for it. I should be willing enough for you to stay a week, or a month. That is a different thing from becoming an inmate of the house. I will wait till tomorrow, for I have made a long two days' journey from the top of the gorts, and, as I am not accustomed to walking, my feet are sore. In the morning I will go and see my brother. I did not so much as know that he was alive. I feel sure he will take me in willingly, for he is but two years older than myself, and was always kind to me. Accordingly, the next morning she retraced her steps, and had no difficulty in finding the farm of Ramdas. Choosing the time when he would be likely to be in for his dinner, Soyera walked up to the door of the house, which was standing open. As she stood there, hesitating, Ramdas came out. He was a man of some forty years of age, with a pleasant and kindly face. He looked at her inquiringly. "'Do you not know me, Ramdas?' she asked. "'Why, it is Soyera!' he exclaimed. "'And so you have come back. After all these years, thirteen, is it not, since you went away? Welcome back, little sister. And he raised his voice and called, Anandi! A young woman, two or three and twenty years of age, came to the door. Wife, he said, this is my sister Soyera, of whom you have often heard me speak. Soyera, this is my wife. We have been married six years, but come in and let us talk things over. You have come home for good, I hope, he said. So you too have married, and, as you have come alone with your child, have, I suppose, had the misfortune to lose your husband. Yes, I was alone in the world, and came hither not knowing whether you were alive or dead, but feeling sure of a welcome if I found you. And you were not mistaken, he said heartily. And, Andy, you will, I am sure, join me in the welcome, and willingly give my sister and her child a place in our home assuredly it will be pleasant for me when you are in the fields to have someone to talk to and perhaps to help me about the house soyera saw that she was speaking sincerely thank you anundi you may be sure that i shall not be idle i have been accustomed to work and can take much of your hands and will look after your two children for two boys three and four years old were standing before her staring at the newcomer that will be pleasant soyera indeed sometimes they hinder me much in my work i am accustomed to children anundi as i was for years nurse to english children and know their ways well now let us to dinner ramdas broke in 
I am hungry and want to be off again. There is much to do in the fields. The woman took a pot of the embers of a wood fire and poured its contents into a dish. The meal consisted of a species of pulse boiled with ghee, with peppers and other condiments added. And how did you like being among the English, Soyera? I liked it very well, the woman said. They are very kind and considerate to nurses, and although they get angry when the Gorowala and other men neglect their duty, they do not punish them as a Maratha master would do. They are not double-faced. When they say a thing, they mean it, and their word can always be trusted. As a people, no doubt they are anxious to extend their dominion, but they do not wish to do so for personal gain. They are not like the princes here, who go to war to gain territory and revenue. It was reasonable that they should wish to increase their lands, for they are almost shut up in Bombay, with Salsette and the other islands occupied by us, who may any day be their enemies. Her brother laughed. It seems to me, Soyera, that you have come to prefer these English people to your own countrymen. I say not that, Ramdas. You asked me how I liked them, and I have told you. You yourself know how the tax collectors grind down the people, how Sindhya and Holkar and the Peishwa are always fighting each other. Do you know that in Bombay the meanest man could not be put to death unless fairly tried, while among the Marathas men are executed on the merest excuse, or, if not executed, are murdered? That is true enough, Ramdas said. None of the three princes would hesitate to put to death anyone who stood in his way, and it seems strange to me that even the Brahims, who would not take the life even of a troublesome insect, yet support the men who have killed scores of other people. But it is no use grumbling. The thing has always been, and I suppose always will be. It is not only so in the Deccan, but in the Nizam's dominions. In Mysore, and, so far as I know, in Uda and Delhi, it seems so natural to us that the powerful should oppress the weak, and that one prince should go to war with another, that we hardly give the matter a thought. But, though, as you say, the English in Bombay may rule wisely and dislike taking life, they are doing now just as our princes do. They are making war with us. That is true but from what i have heard when the english sahibs were speaking together it is everything to them that a prince favourable to them should rule at Pune, for were holkar and sindhya to become all-powerful and place one of their people on the seat of the peishwa the next step might be that a great maratha force would descend the ghats capture bombay and slay every white man in it but they are a mere handful ramdas said how can they think of invading a nation like ours because they know or at least they believe that sindhya holkar and the peishwa are all so jealous of each other that they will never act together then you see what they have done round madras and bengal and few as they are they have won battles against the great princes and lastly my mistress has told me that although there are but few here there are many at home and they could if they chose send out twenty soldiers for every one there is here besides it is not these alone who fight the natives enlist under them and aid them in their conquests and this shows at least that they are well treated and have confidence in the good faith of the english it is all very well soyera to talk that way but i would as willingly believe that the stars will fall from the sky as that these englishmen who simply live in bombay because we suffer them to do so should ever conquer the marathas as they have subdued other portions of india where as every one knows the people are not warlike and have always been conquered without difficulty look at our power at delhi the emperor is a puppet in our hands and it is the same in all the districts on the plain of the great river the rajputs fear us and even the pindaris would not dare carry their raids into our country that a small body of merchants and soldiers should threaten us seems to me altogether absurd well brother we will not argue about it time will show 
as a woman of the Marathas, I trust that day will never come. But as one who knows the English, I have my fears. Of one thing I am sure, that were they masters here, the cultivators would be vastly better off than they are at present. Ramdas laughed. What do you think of my sister's opinions, Anandi? I do not know what to think, the young woman said. But Sayera has seen much and is a wise woman, and what she says are no idle words. To us it seems impossible when we know that the Marathas can place a hundred thousand horsemen in the field. But I own that, from what we know of the English, it might be better for people like us to have such masters. And now, Soyera, Ramdas said when he returned from his work in the evening, tell us more about yourself. First, how did you learn where I was living? I learned it from the wife of our cousin, Sufta. How did you fall in with him? Well, I must tell you something. I had meant to keep it entirely to myself. But I know that you and Anundi will keep my secret. Assuredly we will. I am not a man to talk of other people's affairs, and as to Anundi, you can trust her with your life. Well, in the first place, I deceived you. Or rather, you deceived yourself when you said, I see that you have been married. But the children were here, so I could not explain. The infant is not mine. It is the son of my dear master and mistress, both of whom were killed three days ago by bands, of which Sufda commanded one, who attacked them suddenly by night. What? The child is white? Ramdas asked in a tone of alarm. It is not white because I have stained the skin, but it is the child of English parents. I will tell you how it happened and she related the instances of the attack upon the little camp, the death of her master and mistress, another white officer and all their escort, told how she had hidden the child under the cover of the tent, how Sufda had saved her life, and her subsequent conversation with him regarding the child. Now what do you intend to do with him, Soyera? I intend to bring him up as my own. I shall keep his skin stained, and no one can suspect that he is not mine. Then you do not think of restoring him to his people? Not until he grows up. He has neither father nor mother, and to whom could I hand him now? Moreover, if, as you say, our people intend to drive the English from Bombay, his fate would be certain. When I am by myself with him, I shall talk to him in English, as soon as he is old enough to understand that he must not speak in that language to others, then, when he joins his own people, he will be able to converse with them. In the ten years I have spent in English service, I have come to speak their language well. Though I cannot teach him the knowledge of the English, I can do much to fit him to take his place as an Englishman when the time comes. It is a risky business, her brother said, but I do not say that it cannot be carried out. At any rate, since you have so decided to keep him, I can see no better plan. Two days later, Sufda came in. So you got here safely, Soyera? Yes, I had no trouble, but I did not expect you back so soon. The matter is all settled, though I think we were wrong to grant any terms to the English. We had them in our power and should have finished the matter straight off. Delay and inactivity, the natural consequences of utter incompetence and of divided counsellors, had occurred. Colonel Edgerton, in consequence of sickness, had resigned the command and had been succeeded by Lieutenant Colonel Coburn. On the 9th of January, they were within 18 miles of Pune, and they still had three weeks' provisions with them. Two or three skirmishes had taken place, but without any result. Yet Mr. Carnac, without having suffered any reverse, and now within a day's march of the capital, proposed that a retreat should be made at once. The proposal was combated by Captain Hartley, a gallant young officer, and Mr. Holmes of the civil service. Coburn, being called upon for his opinion, said he had no doubt the army could penetrate to Pune, but that it would be impossible for it to protect its enormous baggage train. Mr. Carnac, however, persisted in his opinion. In spite of the prayers of Rugoba, 
and at eleven o'clock on the night of the eleventh of january the heavy guns were thrown into a large pool a quantity of stores burnt and the force began its retreat in face of enemies estimated differently at from fifty to a hundred thousand men against such vigilant foes there was but little hope indeed that the movement would be unnoticed and at two o'clock in the morning a party of horse attacked the advance guard coburn sent forward two companies of europeans to support them but the marathas had succeeded in plundering part of the baggage in a very short time the rear was also attacked this was covered by some six companies of sepoys with two guns commanded by captain hartley these received the charge of the enemy's horse and foot with great steadiness and several times took the offensive and drove their assailants back when morning broke the little force found themselves altogether surrounded by the whole army of the marathas hartley's sepoys were now sorely pressed but still maintained their position and were reinforced by five companies of europeans and two more companies of sepoys with his support hartley beat off every attack at ten o'clock he received orders from colonel coburn to retreat but the officer who carried the message returned begging that he would allow captain hartley to await a more favorable opportunity coburn agreed to this but sent major frederick to take command of the rear with orders to retire on the main body this movement he effected without serious loss and joined the rest of the force at the village of Wurgaum. it was already crowded with camp followers and the wildest confusion reigned the enemy's horse took advantage of this and charged through the baggage and the troops were unable to act with effect being mixed up with the crowd of fugitives however they soon extricated themselves drove off the enemy and placed the guns in commanding positions round the village at four o'clock the enemy retired early the next morning the maratha artillery opened fire on the village some of the sepoy troops now became dispirited but hartley's men stood firm and the marathas did not venture to attack the loss of the previous day was found to amount to three hundred and fifty two killed wounded or missing including many who had deserted during the night among the killed and wounded were fifteen european officers whose loss was a great misfortune for although the sepoys fight well under their european officers they lose heart altogether if not so led mr palmer the secretary of the committee was now sent to negotiate with the enemy the first demand made was the surrender of rugoba which the committee would have agreed to but rugoba had privately arranged to surrender to scindia the next demand was that the committee should enter on a treaty for the surrender of the greater part of the territory of the bombay government together with the revenue of brooch and surat these terms were so hard that even the craven committee who were entirely responsible for the disaster hesitated to accept them coburn was asked whether a retreat was wholly impracticable and declared that it was so captain hartley protested against this opinion and showed how a retreat could be managed his opinion was altogether overruled and mr holmes was sent with powers to conclude the treaty which however the committee never intended to observe scindia took the principal part in arranging the details superseding the authority of nana fernuiz the peishwa's minister scindia's favour was purchased by a private promise to bestow upon him the english share of brooch besides a sum of forty one thousand rupees as presents to his servants for their share in this miserable business mr karnak colonel edgerton and colonel coburn were dismissed from the company's service and captain hartley was promoted to the rank of lieutenant colonel the governor of bombay refused to ratify the treaty on the ground that the officials with the expedition had no power whatever to enter into any arrangement without the matter being previously submitted to and approved by the government fortunately at this moment a force that had been dispatched from bengal under colonel goddard to support rugoba was nearing the scene of action and that officer learning the danger to which bombay was exposed took the responsibility and marching from Husingabad, avoided a body of twenty-two thousand horse which had been dispatched from Pune, to cut him off 
and reached Surat without encountering any opposition. This welcome reinforcement materially altered the situation, and Bombay lay no longer at the mercy of the Marathas. There was now Goddard's force, and the army that had fallen back from Pune, and, what was still more important, Scindia had by his secret convention deserted the Confederacy, and it was morally certain that neither the Peishwa nor Holkar would send his forces against Bombay, leaving to Scindia the power of grasping the supreme authority in the Deccan during their absence. In 1779, General Goddard, who was now in command at Bombay, entered into negotiations with Nana Furnuwees. These were carried on for some months, but were brought to a conclusion by Nana, declaring that the surrender of Salsette and the person of Rugoba, who was again a fugitive in Bombay, were preliminaries to any treaty. Bombay received a reinforcement of a European regiment, a battalion of sepoys, and a hundred artillerymen from Madras, but before they arrived, Goddard's force had captured Dubois, and a treaty had been effected. The town of Ahmedabad was to be handed over to our ally, Fute Singh, but it declined to surrender, and was taken by assault, the storming party being commanded by Lieutenant Colonel Hartley. Scindia had, as usual, changed sides, and was now operating in conjunction with Nana, and he and Holkar, with 20,000 horse, marched to Baroda. Goddard advanced to give battle, but Scindia, to gain time, opened negotiations. Goddard, however, was not to be duped. The negotiations were broken off, and he advanced against the Marathas. Their horse, as usual, charged, but were driven back by the artillery fire, and routed by a regiment of Bengal cavalry. Scindia, however, encamped a short distance off, but when Goddard again advanced to the attack, retired. Goddard, however, was not to be drawn into pursuit. He captured some small forts and sent Colonel Hartley to relieve Callan, which was being besieged by the Marathas. Hartley surprised their camp, pursued them for some miles, and killed a great number, while Lieutenant Welsh, who had been sent forward to relieve Surat, which was threatened by a large Maratha force, defeated these, killed upwards of a hundred, and captured their guns while one of Scindia's detachments on the banks of the Nebuda was routed by a detachment of Bengal sepoys under Major Forbes. On the other side of India, great successes had been gained by a Bengal force under the command of Captain Popham, who attacked and routed a body of plundering Marathas, captured by assault the strong fort of Lahar, and not only carried by surprise the fortress of Gwalior, regarded by the natives as impregnable, but took it without the loss of a single man. In December, General Goddard laid siege to Bassein. He and Hartley, whose force was covering the siege, were attacked on the 11th of that month by 20,000 cavalry and infantry. These, however, were defeated after making several desperate charges, and on the following day another battle took place in which the Marathas were totally routed, and their general killed, after which Bassine surrendered. End of section two. Section three of At the Point of the Bayonet, A Tale of the Mahratta War by G. A. Henty. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dave Gillespie, Ashland, Kentucky. At the Point of the Bayonet, A Tale of the Mahratta War, by G. A. Henty. Chapter 2. A Strange Bringing Up, Part 1. The war went on during the following year, but in 1782, peace was concluded. In 1784, the Mahrattas joined the Nizam and the British in an alliance, having for its object the overthrow of Mysore, which state, first under Hyder Ali, and afterward under his son Tippo, was a source of danger to all the Allies. In the meantime, Harry Lindsay, who is now called Puntoji, had been living quietly on the farm of Ramdas. 
and no suspicion whatever had been excited in the minds of the neighbors, or of any of the people of Junior, that he was aught but what he seemed, the son of Soyera. Once a week he was restained, and even his playmates, the two sons of Ramdas, believed that he was, like themselves, a young Maratha. They knew that sometimes their aunt talked to the child for hours in a strange language, but she led them to believe it was the dialect of Bombay, which she thought it might be useful for him to learn. The child was shrewd and intelligent, and strictly obeyed Soyera's instructions never, on any account, to talk in that language with her except when they were alone, for she said that, if he did so, some great misfortune would happen to him. Thus at six he was able to speak English and Maratha with equal facility. As soon as his hair began to grow, it had also been dyed, for its color was fair, and would at once have excited attention. He was a sturdy boy, and had never known a day's illness. Four more years passed, and Soyera then revealed to him the fact that she was not as he supposed his mother, but that he was of English parents, and related to him the manner in which they had come by their death and how she had saved him. The language which you are speaking, she said, is English. I spoke truly when I said it was the language in use in Bombay, for it is the tongue of the white man there. Now you will understand why I wanted you not to speak in it to anyone but myself and why I have stained your skin once a week. At present we are at peace with the English, but there may be war again at any time, and in that case, were it known that you are white, your life would not be safe for a moment, or you might be thrown into some dungeon, where you would perish miserably. She then explained to him why she had not attempted to take him down to Bombay and restore him to his countrymen. She had always hoped the time would come when she could do so, but until he grew up to manhood, it was necessary that he should stay with her. For, being without friends in Bombay, he would, as a boy, be unable to earn his living. The boy was greatly affected at the news. There were things that he had never been able to understand, especially why Soyera should consider it necessary to wash him with dye so often when neither his cousins nor the other children of his acquaintance were so treated, as far as he knew. For, as he had been strictly charged never to speak of the process, which he considered an infliction, he had never asked questions of others. He had never, therefore, for a moment, suspected that he was not like those around him. He knew that he was stronger than other boys of his own age, more fond of exercise, and leader in all their games, but he had accepted this as a natural accident. The fact that he belonged to the race that were masters of southern India, and had conquered and slain the Nabob of Bengal, was a gratification to him, but at present the thought that he might some day have to join them and leave all those he loved behind far overpowered this feeling. I shall never become English if you do not go with me, he said. You saved my life, and have been a mother to me. Why should I go away from your side to people that I know nothing of, whose ways would be all strange to me? It is right that you should do so, Puntoji. I will not call you by your proper name, Harry Lindsay, lest it should slip out before the others. Your life should be spent among your own people, who I think will some day rule over all India. They are a great people with learning of many things unknown here, from whom I always received the greatest kindness. They are not, like the Mahrattas, always quarreling among themselves. They are not deceitful, and they are honorable. You should be proud to belong to them, and I have no doubt some day you will be so, though at present it is natural that, knowing no place but this, you should not like the thought of leaving. Harry Lindsay, whose spirits had hitherto been almost inexhaustible, and who had never been happy when sitting quiet, was greatly impressed with what he had heard, and for some time he withdrew himself almost entirely from the sports of his friends, 
hiding himself in the groves from their importunities, and thinking over the strange position in which he was placed. Soyera at last remonstrated with him. If I had thought you would take this matter to heart, Puntoji, I should not have told you about it. I did so because I thought you could scarcely be stained much longer without demanding the reason for what must have seemed so strange a thing. I do not want you to withdraw yourself from your playmates or to seize your games. Your doing so will, if it continues, excite talk. Your friends will think that a spell has fallen upon you and will shun you. I want you to grow up such as your father was, strong and brave and skillful in arms. And to do this, you must be alert and active. It may well be that you should not join your countrymen until you are able to play the part of a man, which will not be for ten years yet. But you know that my cousin Sufder has promised that as soon as you are able to carry arms, he will procure a post for you under Sindia. There you will learn much and see something of the world, whereas, if you remain here, you would grow up like the other cultivators and would make but a bad impression among your countrymen when you join them. Sufter himself has promised to teach you the use of arms, and as all say he is very skillful, you could have no better master. At any rate, I wish you to resume your former habits, to exercise your body in every way, so that you may grow up strong and active, that when you join your countrymen, they will feel you are well worthy of them. They think much of such things, and it is by their love for exercise and sport that they so harden their frames that, in battle, our bravest peoples cannot stand against them. But the Marathas are strong, mother. Yes, they can stand great fatigues, living as they do, so constantly on horseback. But like all the people of India, they are not fond of exercise, save when at war. That is the difference between us and the English. They will get up at daybreak, go for long rides, hunt the wild boar or the tigers in the jungles of the Konkan, or the bears among the Ghats. Exercise to them is a pleasure, and we in the service of the English have often wondered at the way in which they willingly endure fatigues, when they might pass their time sitting quietly on their verandas. But I came to understand that it was to this love of theirs for outdoor exercise that they owed their strength and the firmness of their courage. None can say that the Marathas are not brave, but although they will charge gallantly, they soon disperse if the day goes against them. So also with the soldiers of Tipu, they overran Arcot and threatened Madras. Tanjore and the Carnatic were all in their hands, and yet the English never lost their firmness, and little by little drove Tipu's troops from the lands they had conquered. And it may be that, ere long, Tipu will be a fugitive, and his dominions divided among those whom he has provoked. Is it not wonderful that, while not very many years ago, the whites were merely a handful living on sufferance in Calcutta, Madras, and Bombay, they are now masters of southern India and half of Bengal, and even venture to engage a great empire like that of the Mahrattas, stretching from the sea on the west to Delhi, and holding the mastery over all central India? There must be something extraordinary about these men. Why, you would scarcely believe it, but I have seen often, and wondered always, when they have an entertainment, instead of sitting quietly and having dancing girls to posture for their amusement, they dance themselves with their women, not a mere movement of the body and hands, such as you see among our dancers, but violent dancing, exhausting themselves till the perspiration streams from their faces and this both men and women regard as amusement. So, Puntoji, if you are to take your place among your countrymen again, you must accustom yourself to fatigues, and strengthen your body in every way, or you will be regarded with contempt, as one who, although of their blood, has grown degenerate and unworthy of them. I will do so, the boy said. You shall not complain of me again. Hitherto I have played for amusement, and because I liked to exercise my limbs, and to show the others that I could run faster and was stronger than they were. But in future I shall have a motive in doing so, and will strive to be worthy of my father. From that time, 
Harry Lindsay devoted himself to exercises. He learnt from Sufdar, who when he visited his native town, and from old soldiers when he was away, to use a sword and dagger, to hurl a light spear accurately, to shoot straight with a musket that Sufdar had picked up on the field of battle at Carli, and also with a pistol. He rose at daybreak and walked for miles before coming into his morning meal, and exercised the muscles of his arms not only by the use of the sword, but by holding heavy stones at arm's length. Soyera, although still retaining her own religion, had carefully instructed him in that of the English, with which she had, during her service, become fully acquainted. I am only a servant, an ignorant woman, and it is not for me to decide which religion is the best, and I have never thought of giving up that of my people, but the religion of the Christians is much simpler than ours. They believe in one God only, and in his son who, like Buddha, was a great saint and went about doing good. I will tell you all I know of him, for my mistress frequently spoke to me of him, and hoped, I think, that in time I should accept him as she did. When you join your people, it is necessary that you should be of their religion, as of their race. And so, in time, Harry learned at least the elements of Christianity. As usual, he had been, at the age of six, marked, like Soyera, with three perpendicular lines on the forehead, the sign of the worshippers of Vishnu. You are twelve years old now, Harry, Soyera said to the boy one day. Now I must do what I have concluded after a talk with Ramdas and Sudfar is the best thing for you. We have agreed that it will be better that you should not join your countrymen and claim to be the son of Major Lindsay until you are a man. I do not know what they would do with you. They might send you back to England, but I cannot say what would become of you there. But we have agreed that when you do join them, you must be like other young English gentlemen and not be looked down upon as one who, though he has white skin, is but a Mahratta peasant. In the first place, you must learn to speak English. But I do speak English, Harry said in surprise. Yes, such English as I do, but that is not as the white sahibs speak it. We who have learned it speak the right word, but not in the right way. I have seen young white ladies, when they first come out here, and came to the house of your mother, sometimes smile and scarcely understand what I said to them. It is not like that you must talk English good enough for an ayah, not good enough for a sahib. So we have decided, Sudfar, Ramdas, and I, that you must go down to Bombay and learn to talk proper English. We have thought much about how this shall be done, and have settled that our thinking here is no good. I must wait till I get to Bombay, where I can get advice from people I know. Will you stay there with me, Soyera? I cannot say what will be best, she answered gravely. I must wait till I get there. Ramdas will go down with me. It is a good time for him to go. The harvest work is done. He can be spared for a month. He would like to go. He has never seen Bombay. We shall go in the wagon. The distance from Junir to Bombay was but about 80 miles, and the journey was performed in five days, and Ram Dass took down a light load of maize, whose sale would pay the expenses of their journey. Soyera rode and slept in the maize, except in two villages where she was able to procure a lodging for the night. Ram Dass and Harry walked by the bullocks and slept at night by the roadside wrapped in their blankets. On arriving at Bombay, they put up at a khan in the native town, and the next morning, leaving Ramdas and Harry to wander about and look at the wonders of the city, Soyera went to the shop of a Parsi merchant, who was in the habit of supplying the canteen of the troops, contracted for supplies of forage and other matters, and carried on the business of a native banker. She had often been to his place with Mrs. Lindsay, and had, from the time that she had entered her service, deposited her savings with him. She had, in the first place, asked her master to keep them for her 
but he had advised her to go to Jumaji. The Parsi was himself in his shop. She went up to him. You do not remember me, Sahib, she said. I was the ayah of Major Lindsay. I was often here with the Memsab. I remember you now, he said. I do not often forget those I have known. Yes, your master and mistress were killed at their little camp in the Konken. Nothing was heard of you, if I remember rightly. I have some money of yours in my hands. Have you the receipts? I have them, Sahib, but it is not for that that I come to see you. I wish to ask your advice on a private matter. The Parsi looked a little surprised. Come in here with me, he said, leading the way to his private room behind the shop. Now, what is it? he asked, as he closed the door behind them. It was believed, Sahib, that Major Lindsay's infant boy was killed at that time, like all the others in the camp. It was not so. I saved him. It is about him that I want to speak to you. The Parsi thought for a moment. Yes, there was a child. Its body was not found and was supposed to have been eaten by the jackals. Is it alive still? Yes, Sahib. I have brought him up as my own. His skin has been always stained, and none but my brother, with whom I live, his wife and one other, know that he is English. I love him as my own child. I have taught him English, as I speak it, but I want him in time to be an English sahib, and for that he must learn proper English. But why have you not brought him down here? The Parsi said. Who would have looked after him and cared for him, sahib, as I, his nurse, have done? Who could have taken him? What would have become of him? I am a poor woman and do not know how these things would be. I said to myself, it will be better that he should live with me till he is old enough to go down as a young man and say to the governor, I am the son of Major Lindsay. I can talk Maratha like a native. I can ride and use my sword. I can speak English well. I can be useful. Then perhaps for his father's sake, the governor will say, I will make you an officer. If there are troubles in the Deccan, you will be more useful than those sahibs who do not know the language. I can do all that for him, but I cannot teach him to speak as English sahibs speak. That is why I have come to you. You have twelve hundred rupees of mine in your hands, for I laid out nothing while I was in the sahib's service, and my mistress was very kind and often gave me presents. My brother, Ramdas, had five hundred rupees saved, and this he has given to me, for he too loves the boy. Thus, there are seventeen hundred rupees, and this I would pay for him to be for two years with someone where he would learn to speak English as sahibs do, so that none can say this white boy is not English. Then he will go back for two or three years to Junior. He will learn to use his arms and to ride and to be a man until he is of an age to come down and say, I am the son of Major Lindsay. But... If you were to tell this at once, the Parsi said, they would doubtless send him home to England to be educated. And what would he do there, Sahib? He would have no friends, none to care for him, and while his Maratha tongue would be of great service to him here, it would be useless to him in his own country. Do not say that my plan cannot be carried out, Sahib. For twelve years I have thought it over. I have taught him all that I could so far and convince myself that it would be for the best. The boy loves me and is happy. He would be miserable among strangers, who would laugh at his English and would make him unhappy. Jamaji sat for some time and thought. I am not sure that your plan is not the best, he said. And after saving his life and caring for him, at the risk of your own for all these years, you have assuredly a better right than any other, to say what shall be done now. I will think over what you have asked of me. It is not very easy to find just such a home as you want, but I should consider the sum you offer is sufficient to induce many Englishmen living here to take him. But it is not everyone from whom he would learn English as you would wish him to, or who could teach him the manners of white officers. Come to me tomorrow evening but you must not expect 
that I shall be able to answer you then. I must think it over and make inquiries. It was three days, indeed, before anything came of Soyera's visits to the Parsi trader. Then he said, I think that I have found just the place of which you are in search. I spoke to a friend yesterday, and he at once mentioned one whom I wonder I had not thought of at once. Some years ago, a cadet who came out here with a young wife died shortly after his arrival. As he had only been four years in the service, the pension of his wife was but a small one. She did not go back to England, as widows generally do. I know not why, except that once I heard two officers speaking of her. They said they believed her family had quarreled with her for her marriage, and that she was too proud to go back again. She had two girls, who must be about the age of this boy. Her pension was not sufficient for her to live upon comfortably, and she opened a little school for the children of officers here. There are not many, you know, for they are generally sent home to England when they are quite young. But she has always had four or five, sometimes eight or ten. They come to her every morning and go home in the middle of the day, and she sees no more of them. After I had heard this, I went to her. I supply her with many things, for she gets her books and other things from me. I said to her, I have a white boy whose father and mother are dead. He is twelve years old. There are reasons why I cannot tell you who they were. But I can say that the boy's father was an English officer. He has been brought up by natives and speaks English in the way that natives speak it. Those who have brought him up desire that he should learn to talk English well and learn to have good manners so that some day when he goes to England, people should not say of him, This is not an English gentleman or he would not speak like that. I said that I had interested myself in the matter, and knew that it was right, and had come to her to ask if she would take him into her house, which was very comfortable and well furnished and everything as it should be. She asked questions. I told her enough to interest her, and said that when the time came, it was hoped that he would be able to obtain employment under the government, perhaps in the army, as his father had been. I said that those who brought him up were ready to make great sacrifices for his sake, but that they could not pay for him for more than two years, and that, as the boy knew so much English, they hoped this would be enough. I asked how much, if she agreed to take him, she would charge. She said that she would think it over and would call here tomorrow and tell me whether she would take him. She will be here at three. I think you had better come at that hour. I am sure she would like to speak to you. I do not see why you should not say that you had been his ayah and had saved his life and brought him up. Many officers have been killed, and indeed, I do not see why you should not tell her the whole story. It will interest her more in the boy. But of course, before you tell her, you must ask her to promise not to repeat it. Soyera went on the following day. She found that Jamaji was already, with the lady, in his private room. She waited until the door was opened, and the merchant beckoned her in. This is the woman who has brought the child up, Mrs. Sankey, he said. As I have told you, she was his ayah, and has behaved most nobly. Turning to Soyera, he said, Naturally, Mrs. Sankey asked why you had not come forward before. I told her your reasons and she thinks that perhaps you have acted for the best for him. At any rate, she has consented to take the boy for two years, and I am to pay her for you the sum that you have named. In reality, Mrs. Sankey had asked a thousand rupees a year, but the Parsi, with a generosity for which his race is distinguished, had agreed to pay the extra three hundred rupees himself. Before it is quite settled, Mrs. Sankey said, I should like to see the boy. As Mr. Jumanji has told you, I have two daughters about the same age. I must therefore be guided in my decision by my impression of him. I will bring him here to see you in three or four days, Soyera said. His stain is already faded a good deal, and I should be able to get it off by that time. I have to get English clothes for him. I am greatly obliged to you, 
for saying that you will take him in if he pleases you. That I think he will do. I have taught him manners as well as I could. He is as anxious as I am to improve himself, and will, I am sure, give you no more trouble than he can help. I will see that he is properly clothed, Mrs. Sankey, Jumanji remarked. I knew his father, and have a great interest in him. Mrs. Sankey chatted for some little time to Soyera, gave her her card with her address on Malabar Hill, and then left. Soyera began to thank the Parsi for his introduction, but he said, It was a little thing to do, and as I knew his father, it was only right that I should help as far as I could. Will you bring me tomorrow morning the measurement of the boy's height, size around his shoulders and waist, the lengths of his arms and legs? You need not trouble yourself no further about it. I shall take that matter upon myself. Come three days later for his clothes. Goodbye. I have other matters to see about, and without waiting for any thanks from Soyera, he at once went into his shop and began to talk to his assistant. Many were the scrubbings Harry had to undergo during the next few days, and his hair and face were nearly restored to their proper color when Soyera returned one evening with a coolie carrying a trunk of some size. It contained the whole outfit for a boy, one dark suit, and four white nankeen, with a stock of shirts, underclothing, and shoes. Soyera showed Harry how these garments, with which he was wholly unacquainted, should be put on. Think that you capitally, she said, when she surveyed them, and you look like a little English sahib. They feel very tight and comfortable, he said. They are sure to do so at first, but you will soon get over that. Now, Ramdas will take you out for a walk for two or three hours, so that you can get accustomed to them. I should not like you to look awkward when you go with me to Mrs. Sankey's tomorrow. End of section three. Section four of At the Point of the Bayonet, A Tale of the Mahratta War by G. A. Henty. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dave Gillespie. At the Point of the Bayonet, A Tale of the Harada War by G. A. Henty. Chapter 2, A Strange Bringing Up, Part 2. The interview next day was altogether satisfactory. The carriage and bearing of the natives of India is easier and more graceful than that of Europeans, and the knowledge Harry had possessed for some years that he belonged to a conquering race, the injunctions of Soyera, his strength and activity, and his unquestioned leadership among the boys with whom he played, had given something of confidence to his manner. Mrs. Sankey was greatly taken with him, and he at once became an inmate of her house. He remained there for two years, and became so great a favorite that Mrs. Sankey insisted on his staying with her without charge for three or four months after the time for which she had received payment for him. He had worked hard and earnestly, and now spoke English as well and accurately as any English boy of his own age. He had, after being there a year, made the acquaintance of several boys of his own age, the sons of officers or officials. They knew him only as the orphan son of an English gentleman in government employ, and he was often asked to the houses of their parents, and none suspected that he had been brought up among natives. At the end of his term, Sudfer came down for him. Jumanji, who had remained his steady friend, arranged that he should go to his house and there resume his native dress and stain. In this garb, he felt even stranger and more uncomfortable than he had done when he first put on European clothes. But this was not long in wearing off, and by the time he reached Junior, he was again at home in it. He took with him, at Mrs. Sankey's suggestion, a number of English books by authors she recommended, so that he could, by reading and learning some of them by heart, retain his knowledge of the language. For the next three months, 
he spent his whole time in practicing with sword and pistol and gun under the tuition of an old soldier engineer who had been a noted swordsman in his time he was already far stronger than the sons of ramdas although these were now young men anxious to at once exercise his muscles and gain in skill he now attached himself to a famous shikari who seeing the boy's strength and courage took him as an assistant when he went on excursions among the hills here harry learned to dig pits for the capture of tigers to smear leaves with a sticky substance obtained from a plant resembling mistletoe so that when a tiger or bear trod upon them and finding them sticking to his feet paused and rubbed these on his head until he became blinded and bewildered with a mass of sticky foliage a well-placed shot would stretch him dead for a year he worked with the shikari sometimes they hunted simply for the value of the skins but more often they were sent for by villagers who were suffering from the depredations of tigers or leopards and who were willing to pay for having them killed harry lindsay acquired quite a reputation in junior in the surrounding country for the shikare spoke freely of his bravery intelligence and skill with his arms his width of shoulders and the strength of his muscles caused him to be regarded as a prodigy and it was generally considered that when he grew up he would become a great fighter and attain wide renown as a leader of bands in the service of holkar or the peishwa when he was sixteen sudfer who had watched his progress with great approval said to him you are scarce a man in years yet printerji but you are strong skillful with your weapons and far more of a man than many ten years older than yourself it is time that you should see something of war since the death of scindia a few months back and the succession of his nephew dulut who is about your own age things have become even more unsettled than before scindia was a great man and although at time worsted by his rivals always managed to repair his fortunes and add to his power but whether the young scindia will keep the wide territory that his uncle won is doubtful holkar although at times he and scindia united as when the english marched against Pune, has been his rival and enemy the peishwa has sometimes been in alliance with one of these great princes sometimes with the other his minister nana Fernuis, is a man of commanding talent had it not been for him it is probable that scindia and holkar would long since have become altogether independent but he has always contrived to play one off against the other and by securing the services of the secondary chiefs such as the raja of nagpur and the raja of kolapur to hold the balance of power but he is an old man and at his death there is no saying how things will go matters are complicated too by the fact that scindia has now in his service sixteen battalions of drilled infantry commanded by french officers and these have proved so valuable in the various sieges he has undertaken that holkar has been obliged to imitate his example there are many who think that the introduction of infantry will in the end prove disastrous to the power of the Mahrattas, whose strength has hitherto lain in their cavalry, which could perform long journeys, strike a blow, and be off again, and so were more than a match for the infantry of other Indian princes. But with infantry all this will be altered, for the marches must be no longer or faster than they can journey. The order of battles, too, will be changed altogether, and we shall depend more upon foot, while a horse, until now almost invincible, will become of secondary importance. However, that is not the question at present. The first thing to be considered is, to which of the three great leaders you are to attach yourself. As you know, I was for many years in Scindia's service, but at his death the position was changed. Scindia knew that I was active and capable. Had he lived, I should soon have gained much promotion. However, 
his chief minister took a dislike to me, and I felt that, now the Maharaja was gone, Dulut would be easily swayed by the counsels of those around him, and that instead of promotion, I should be more likely to lose my command, and perhaps be put out of the way. Therefore, I left Dulut's service, and have entered that of the young Paishwa, who at the advice of Nana Furnuis, has given me the command of a troop of a hundred men. Years ago, I gained Nana's goodwill by apprising him of the hostile intentions of the Raja of Nagpur, when he promised me that should I at any time leave Sindhya's service, he would give me as good a position as I held there in that of the Peshwa. The young prince is but twenty-one, and I will ask Nana to present you to him as one who, in time, will become a valuable officer, and it is likely that Madhu Rao will receive you well when he hears that, though so young, you have gained great credit as a slayer of wild beasts, and that, as he will see for himself, you promise to grow into a strong man and a brave soldier. Nana Furnuis is a man who, by his conciliating manner, gains the confidence of all who come under his influence, and it is wholly due to him that the authority of the Poishwa has not been entirely overthrown by Sindhya and Holkar. He is a reader of men's minds, and has always surrounded himself with friends of discernment and courage, and I think you would be likely, if you remained in the Peshwa's service, to rise to a very much higher rank than I should ever do, being myself but a rough soldier with a heavy hand. Holkar at present is fast becoming altogether imbecile, he is worn out both in mind and body, and I should not advise anybody to join him. Therefore, the choice rests between Dilut Rao, Sindhya, and the Peshwa. As far as I can see, there is an equal chance of your seeing service with either. I can choose without hesitation, Harry said. Had you still been in the army of Sindhya, I would have joined it too. But as you have now entered that of the Peshwa, who is the lawful ruler of the Marathas, though overshadowed by Sindhya and Holkar, I should certainly choose his service. In any case, I would rather be with you. You have taught me the use of arms, and to you I owe it that I was not killed when an infant. Therefore, I would assuredly rather fight under your orders than take service with Holkar or Sindhya. As to their quarrels, I know nothing. Ramdas has often told me as much as he knew of these matters, but it all seemed to me to be confusion, and the only thing I could understand was that they were always intriguing against each other, instead of putting all their forces in the field and fighting it out fairly, and so deciding who was to be the chief lord of the Maharatas. Although but a soldier, Puntaji, I cannot but see that this constant antagonism between these three principal leaders of the Maharatas, is unfortunate in the last degree. We are wasting the strength that, if properly employed, might bring all India into subjugation, and when trouble really comes, we shall be a divided people, instead of acting under one head and with one mind. However, it is not for us soldiers to meddle with these things, but to do our duty to the chief under whom we serve. Well, if such be your choice, I will present you to Nana Furnuis. I am glad you have chosen that service, for in the first place, being young, he may take a liking to you, and you may obtain rapid promotion, and still more, because I should prefer to have you with me. Hitherto, Harry had worn only the scanty clothing in use by the peasantry and the small cultivators, but Sufdar now brought him clothes such as were worn by youths of a superior class. So Yera had offered no objection to his departure, and indeed, Sufdor had spoken to her on the subject before he had broached it to Harry. "'Tis hard upon me to give you up,' she said to the lad. "'But I have always known that it must be so, and indeed, for the last year, I have seen little of you. The change will be good for you. You will learn the manner of war, 
and take an interest in the intrigues and troubles that are constantly going on, and of which we hear little. When you rejoin your countrymen a few years hence, I shall go with you. You need my testimony to show that you are the son of Major Lindsay, and I can be useful to you in managing your household. But at present, it is best that I should stay here. A young soldier would not care to have his mother looking after him, and it is for your good that you should go your own way, and besides, you will have the counsels of Sufder to aid you. I should be out of place, and for the present, I am happy here with my good brother and sister-in-law, the latter of whom would miss me sorely. Moreover, Pune is but two days' ride from here, and you will no doubt be able sometimes to come over and see us. I have done what little I could for you. You are now old enough to make your own way. The bird that has taught its nestling to fly does not try to keep it in the nest when it is once able to take care of itself. I can never be sufficiently grateful for all that you have done for me, Harry said earnestly. You have been more than a mother to me, and wherever I go, I shall not be happy unless you are with me, though I see it is best this time that I should go alone. But assuredly, when I join my people and have a home of my own, it would not seem like a home to me if you did not share it. Two days later, Harry mounted a horse that Ramdas had given him and started with Sofdar for Pune. On arriving there, they rode to the little camp half a mile out of the town where Sofdar's troop was stationed. You don't carry your tents with you when you are on service in the field? Not one on expedition when haste is needed, for we should make but poor progress if we were hampered by luggage. When on a distant expedition, we take tents. This is a standing camp, and there are a score like it round the town. They always remain in the same position. Sometimes one troop occupies them, sometimes another. When we go on an expedition, we leave them. When we come back, if they are still unoccupied, we again take possession. If they have been allotted to another troop, a vacant one is found for us. Only one regiment of horse and two of foot are in the city where they have lines of huts. We differ from the rest of the army, being always on service. The others are only called out when there is occasion for them, each under its own chief, and, in case of necessity, the Peshwa can put 30,000 horsemen in the field, besides those of the Rajas in alliance with him. The next morning, Sufder, in his best attire, went with Harry into the city, the latter for the first time carrying a sword, dagger, and pistols in his cummerbund or sash. Without being questioned, they entered the chamber where Nana was giving audience to all who waited upon him on business. Sufder took his place at the lower end of the chamber, moving forward as one after another applicant was disposed of until, at length, his turn arrived. The minister, who knew that he was a brave soldier who had enjoyed the confidence of the late Scindia, acknowledged his deep salutation with a friendly nod. What can I do for you, Sufder? I desire nothing, Your Excellency, save that I may be permitted to present to you one of my family, the son of a relation of mine who, although still young, I may venture to recommend to you as one possessing great courage and intelligence. I have myself given him lessons in the use of his arms and he has had other instructors, and done credit to them. For the past year he has been working with a famous shikari, and he has killed many tigers that were a scourge to the villages near the Ghats, together with many bears and leopards. And his master reported that his fearlessness was great, and that as a marksman his skill was equal to his own. He was most unwilling that he should leave him, but I considered it was time for him to enter the army, in which I believe he will soon distinguish himself. How old is he? the minister asked. He is as yet but sixteen, but, as your highness may see, he is as strong as most men, having devoted himself to exercises of all sorts since he was a child. He is indeed cast in a strong mould, and his face pleases me. And so, you would enter the service of his highness, the Peshwa? That is my desire, your excellency. 
you are young to serve as an officer, and for the present you had best remain with Sifter's troop. In the meantime, I will see what suitable post can be found for you. With an expression of thanks, Sufter and Harry left the audience hall. It is a good beginning, Puntaji, the soldier said, as they left the minister's palace. Nanifer Nuiz was evidently pleased with you, and I think he will give you special employment. At the same time, serving one master here is not without its danger. Nana especially, powerful as he is, has enemies as powerful, for he has always stood in the way of the ambition of Scindia. That evening an officer brought from Nana an order conferring upon Harry the appointment of an assistant officer in Sufter's troop, with the usual pay and allowances, and, three days later, an order came for him to attend the audience of the minister. On arrival, he was told by the officer of the chamber that he was not to present himself at public audience, but that Nana would speak to him privately. He was therefore taken to an inner chamber, where an hour later Nana joined him. I think by your face, Puntaji, that you can be trusted and I have decided to place you in the service of His Highness the Peshwa. What position you will hold there must depend upon yourself and him. I shall simply recommend you as one of whom I have heard much good. It would be as well for you not to mention your age, but let him suppose that, as you look, you are about the same age as himself. He is amiable and kindly, and your position will be a pleasant one. I am anxious to prevent evil advisers from obtaining influence over him. He is young and unsuspicious, and much harm might thus come to the state. It is then for the general interest that he should be surrounded by those whom I can trust, so that if any plotters are endeavoring to poison his mind, their plans may be thwarted. I have, of course, officers about his person who are thoroughly trustworthy, but these are much older than himself, and he chafes somewhat at what he wrongly considers his tutelage. But indeed, as he is but twenty-one, and wholly unversed in matters of state, it is needful that the management of affairs should rest in the hands of those who have long controlled it. Scindia would be the first to take advantage of any imprudence. He is already by far the most powerful of the Maharatta princes. His possessions are of immense extent. He holds the emperor at Delhi in the palm of his hand. He can put 100,000 horse into the field, and has large numbers of infantry, including 16 battalions drilled by French officers and commanded by de Boyne. And although de Lutrao is but 20, and as yet we know but little of his disposition, he is, of course, surrounded by the advisers of his uncle, and may be expected to pursue the same policy. His uncle gained great ascendancy over the Peshwa, and his death was a fortunate circumstance. Still, it is certain that the prince, until his powers are matured, will yield to the advice of those to whom the conduct of affairs is entrusted. Now, I am going to the palace and have requested a private audience with Madhu Rao, and I will take you with me. Followed by a train of officers with whom Harry fell in, the minister proceeded to the palace. His train remained in the public hall, and Nana went into the Peshwa's private apartment. In a few minutes, an official came in and called Puntaji, and Harry at once followed him to an inner room where the Peshwa and his minister were alone. Harry bowed to the ground. This prince is the young man of whom I have spoken to you. He bears an excellent character for his skills in arms, and has killed many tigers and other beasts. It was but the other day that you complained that you had no one of your own age to whom you could talk freely, and I have selected this young officer as one who I thought would be agreeable to you. I thank you heartily, Nana. In truth, I sometimes need a companion, and I think by his face that this officer will be an agreeable one. To what post, think you, 
had I best appoint him? As he is a famous shikari, I should say that it would be suitable were you to make him director of the chase. But I never go hunting. That is true. But in time, when your occupations of state lessen, you might do so, Nana said. And indeed, even at present, there is nothing to prevent your hunting sometimes in the royal preserves, where there must be an abundance of game of all sorts. So let it be, then, the Peshwa said. In truth, I care not for the killing of beasts unless they do harm to the villagers. But it is right that there should be someone to direct the men who have charge of the preserves, and as an official you will have the right of entry here at all times, and will be frequently about my person, and I will confer with you about other things, as well as the chase. You will, of course, have an apartment assigned to you. You will arrange about the emoluments, Nana. You had better go to my house and wait for me there, Nana said. And Harry, bowing deeply to the prince and his minister, left the palace. He did not deceive himself as to the reason for which Nana had thus placed him in a position in which he was likely to be frequently in the company of the young prince. He intended him to act as a spy. This he was firmly determined not to do in any manner save in thwarting any designs Scindia might have. That was a public duty. By this time, he had learnt much of the events that were passing. Ramdas and the other ryots of his acquaintance regarded Nana Furnuis as the guardian of the country. For many years, it was his wisdom and firmness alone that had thwarted the designs of Scindia whose advent to supreme authority would have been regarded as a grave misfortune by all the cultivators of the Deccan. Scindia's expenses in keeping up so great an army were enormous, and the exactions of his tax-gatherers ground to the dust the cultivators and peasantry of his own wide dominions. And Harry was therefore ready to give Nana a faithful support in all public matters. He knew that the minister had many enemies, even among the Rajas in the Peshwa's dominion, and in those round it, for they regarded him with reason as a curb upon their private ambitions, and for years intrigues had been going on for his overthrow. On the other hand, Harry was much pleased with Madurao, who was a most amiable and kindly young man, while determined, then, to do all that he could in support of Nana, he decided that he would, on no account, give him any report that would be unfavorable to the Peshwa. His interview with the minister on the return of the latter was a short one. Here, the latter said, is a purse of five hundred rupees, with which to obtain garments suitable for one in attendance on the Peshwa. Your emolument will be two hundred rupees a month. I shall issue orders to the men employed in the forests and preserves to report to you, and have requested the Chamberlain to allot an apartment to you in the palace, and to tell off two servants to be in attendance on you. You understand that your mission, as far as I am concerned, is to give me early warning if any of those favorable to Scindia, you shall be furnished with a list of their names are endeavouring to obtain an undue influence over the prince, who is of an altogether unsuspicious character, and would be likely to fall an easy victim to bad counsels. You can depend upon my doing so, Harry said. I have been taught to regard Scindia as an enemy to the public peace, and shall use all diligence in carrying out your excellency's orders. And, leaving the minister, Harry went to Sufter and told him what had happened. In truth, Pontoji, you were born under a lucky star. I never dreamt that Nana Furnuis would have thus introduced you to the Peishwa. Now, lad, you have a fine career opened to you. It will need caution, but as Scindia's ancestor was but a slipper-bearer and rose to the highest rank and honor, so it is open to you to win a great position if you steer clear of the dangers that attend all who play a part in public affairs. 
I foresee that you will become a favorite with the prince, but remember to put your trust in Nana. He is at present the greatest power in the land, and has been for many years. But unlike most who have attained such authority, he is liked by the people, for he uses his power well and for the good of the state. You see, even now the young Peishwa is by no means secure on the Musnud. The adherents of Rugaba, who was undoubtedly the lawful ruler of the Deccan, still live, and may one day raise the flag of revolt in favor of his sons, Baji Rao and Shamanji Appa, who, with Ahmad Rao, his adopted son, are all in close custody in the hill fort of Sunuri under two of Nana's officers. There is a general feeling of pity for these young men, even among those who regard their imprisonment as necessary, for, were they free, a civil war would assuredly break out again, and the feeling is increased by the fact that Baji Rao is a youth of extraordinary accomplishments. He is graceful in person, with a handsome countenance and a charming manner, and although but nineteen, he is an excellent horseman, skilled in the use of the bow, and considered to be the finest swordsman in the country. He is deeply read in all our religious books, and in all the country there is no one of his age so learned. All these things, however, only add to the necessity for his being kept in prison. A youth so gifted, and as many people consider, the lawful heir to the throne, would speedily be joined by all the enemies of Nana and might not only drive the minister into exile, but dethrone Madurel. Such being the case, no one can blame Nana for keeping them in confinement, at any rate until Madurel has been master for some years, and has proved that he is able to maintain his position. Now, lad, I will go into the town with you and purchase dresses fit for an official of the palace. I quite see that I have been most fortunate in obtaining such a position, Sudfer, but I own I should have preferred to remain with you and learn to do service as a soldier. That you may learn later on, Sudfer said. Having the confidence of the Peishwa, you may soon obtain military rank, as well as civil, and, if war breaks out, may hold a position vastly better than you could hope to attain as the mere chief of a troop. It seems ridiculous, Sufter, that I should be thus put forward without any merit of my own, while you, who have fought in many battles, are still only commander of your troop. I have no desire for more, Sudfer replied. I am a soldier, and can do my duty as ordered. But I have no head for intrigues, and I consider the risks of a battle are quite sufficient without those of being put out of the way for mixing myself up in plots. Again, your rise is not altogether undeserved. You have, by your exercises, attained the strength of manhood early, and your experience as a tiger hunter has fitted you for the post for which you are appointed, just as your diligence in exercise of arms will be of good service to you if you come to hold military command. But you must be circumspect, and above all things, do not forget to use the dye with which Soyera has furnished you. Hitherto, your white skin has done you no harm. But were it discovered here that you are English, it would at once be imagined that you were a spy, and little time would be given you to explain how matters stand. I will certainly be careful as to that, and now that I am to have a private apartment, I shall be able to apply the dye without fear of being interrupted, as might have been the case in camp. On the following day, Harry, having obtained clothes suitable to his position, betook himself to the palace, where one of the officers of the chamberlain conducted him to his apartment and assigned to him two men appointed to his service. End of section 4 Section 5 of At the Point of the Bayonet A Tale of the Maratha War by G. A. Henty 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Suman Barwa. At the Point of the Bayonet. A Tale of the Maratha War. Chapter 3. A Change in Affairs. Part 1. Harry Lince's duty were little more than nominal. The reports sent in to him by those in charge of the royal preserves could scarcely be considered as satisfactory, as they stated that, owing to the fact that for years there had been no hunting there, the tigers had greatly increased in number and had thinned down the stags and indeed in some cases had so destroyed other game that they were driven to escape from the enclosures and to ravage the villages. But beyond receiving these reports, and riding over occasionally to the preserves, Harry had little to do save to take part in any court ceremonies and, when called upon to do so, to accompany the Peshwa in his walks in the palace garden. He therefore determined to learn to read and write in Maratha and, for two or three hours a day, a man of the wench or mercantile class came in to teach him. So careful was Nana Furnuis in preventing Scindia's adherents from approaching the prince that Harry had nothing whatever to report on his head. One day when Madhu Rao, who had taken a great liking to him, was walking in the garden, chatting familiarly to him of his life in the country and his adventures with tigers and other wild beasts, he said, Have you seen my cousin Baji Rao? No, your highness, I have never seen him. You have heard of him, of course, and nothing but good. That is so, Prince. It seems that, both in sports and learning, he is wonderfully well instructed. I should like to see him, the Prince said. I admire what I have heard of him greatly, and it is hard that he should be shut up in prison, and yet he is scarcely more a prisoner than I am. Harry was struck with dismay. But your Highness is in no way a prisoner. I am not shut up in a fortress, the young prince said, but I am no more my own master than Bajirao is. Nana Furnuis treats me as if I were a child. He is, I know, devoted to me, but that makes it no more pleasant. I can go where I like, but it is always with my retinue. I cannot choose my own friends. Your Highness will forgive me if I say that it is for your own safety and for the peace of the country that your minister watches over you so jealously, and doubtless he thinks that, having been the chief adviser to your family for so many years, having guarded it so successfully from those who would have lessened your authority, for the present it is of the greatest importance that he should continue to guide the state. I am at least very glad that he allows me a companion of my own age to whom I can talk freely. On all subjects, Your Highness, excepting state matters. Nana presented me because I was ignorant of the court and knew nothing whatever of intrigues and was not likely to take any part in them. Therefore, Your Highness, I pray you but to speak upon ordinary matters. Be assured I am your devoted servant, but the courtiers would grow suspicious were you to talk of state matters with me. These things speedily become known and I should fall under Nana's displeasure. Perhaps you are right, the Peshwa admitted in a tone of melancholy. No doubt whatever passes in this house is known to my minister, and indeed it is his duty to make himself so acquainted. Still, I feel it hard that I should not have one friend to whom I can speak. The time will come, Prince, when you will be able to do so and, doubtless, there will be at hand those who will dare to have your confidence. The prince was silent, but, after this, he abstained from any remarks to Harry concerning the state. He had indeed for some time been in correspondence with Baji Rao, who had gained the confidence of one of those appointed to look after him and, though there was nothing save expressions of friendship on the part of both princes, Nana was furious when he found out, from his spies, what was going on. The news came as a shock to the minister. Nana had been the greatest enemy of the house of Rugoba, 
and the discovery of this correspondence and the friendship between the two young men so threatened his authority that after ordering that bajee rao and his brother should be more strictly confined than before he visited the peshwa and upbraided him bitterly for having entered upon a friendship with the head of a party which had harassed his family and had brought innumerable troubles on the state then he sent a message to harry bidding him to come at once how is it pantoji he said sternly that you have altogether failed to justify the faith i put in you and have already assisted madhu rao to enter into relations with my enemy bajee rao harry was thunderstruck at this sudden attack my lord you must have been misinformed i know nothing of any such correspondence and if it really went on i think the peshwa would have taken me into his confidence do you mean to say that madhu has not spoken to you about his cousin no sir i do not say so for some four months ago he spoke in terms of admiration for bajee rao but he did not pursue the subject and never afterwards alluded to it the minister looked at him fixedly i believe you he said you do not look like a double-faced man but as one who would tell the truth whatever were the consequences moreover i felt that if you had known of madhu rao's intentions and had not reported them to me you would on receiving my message have endeavoured to make your escape i have of course inquired and found that you spent your afternoon as usual with your scribe and that you afterwards rode out to safda's camp and there talked for half an hour sitting outside the tent and conversing on ordinary matters and then you returned here to the palace these proceedings go far to assure me that you were ignorant of the discovery that had been made that a correspondence had been going on between madhu and bajee still i thought you might have known of the correspondence though not of the discovery but now i am quite convinced that you were altogether ignorant of what was going on the scene with nana and the knowledge that he had brought upon his cousins even stricter confinement than before acted most painfully upon the mind of the young peshwa already embittered by the restraint in which he was being held he now shut himself up in his room and absolutely refused to leave it his absence from the darbars was put down to illness nana paid no great attention to him believing that the young prince would speedily recover himself this however was not the case for settled melancholy took possession of him on the twenty second of october he appeared at the dadera a high ceremonial went among his troops and in the evening received his chiefs and the representatives from the great rajas but three days later he threw himself from a terrace in front of his palace broke two of his limbs and so seriously injured himself that he died two days afterwards having almost in his last breath expressed to nana his strong desire that bajee rao should succeed him on the masnad the consternation of the minister was unbounded it seemed that by this sudden and unexpected blow the whole of his plans were overthrown and that not only his position but his very life was in danger he sent for harry two hours after the peshwa's death answer me frankly he said can i depend upon you absolutely and have you had no communication of any kind from my enemies you can depend upon me my lord everyone knows that you have saved the state a score of times and will i doubt not do the same again i have the will the minister said gravely but whether i have the power is another thing I sent off a messenger to the general, Purusuram Bhau, bidding him gather as many troops as possible and march hither, and I shall send letters to the Raja of Nagpur and Sindhya. Holka being in Pune, I have already seen and, as he has always supported me against Rugoba, he is as anxious as I am as to the succession. I shall now send you with a duplicate letter to Purusuram Bhau for, since the terrible accident to Madhu Rao, whom I love dearly for his amiable character, it is probable that the adherents of Bajee Rao have been active, 
and that my every movement is watched and attempts may be made to stop any messengers that i may send out take sufther's troop with you if you are stopped fight your way through whatever their force it is a matter of supreme importance that this letter should reach the general it shall reach him my lord harry said as he took it in five minutes i shall be on my way going to his room he changed his attire mounted his horse and rode to sufther's camp the men were all ready as nana had sent an order to sufther to prepare instantly for a journey so it is you pantoji the captain said as he rode up the orderly did not tell me whom i was to escort nor our destination in which direction do we ride i am bearer of a letter to purusaram how then i know the direction and giving orders to his men he rode off at once by the side of harry this is a terrible business pantoji i am greatly grieved indeed for no one could have been kinder to me than madhu rao yes yes Safda said that is all very well but the serious side of the matter is that just as everything seemed settled we may be entering upon another civil war more terrible than the last of course i am sorry for the young peshwa but i doubt whether he was in any way fit to rule over the marathas kindness of heart goes for nothing with a people like ours split up into many factions led by many chiefs and ever ready for war it needs a strong as well as an able man to hold in check all the parties in the state scindia was the sort of man to rule us he was strong in every way was troubled with no scruples would strike down without mercy any who opposed him he took great care of his troops and they were always ready to follow him that is the man we want on the musnad not a young prince of whom we can only say that he was kindly and why did nana choose you i am a second string to his bow he sent off a messenger as soon as he heard of madhu rao's accident but fearing he might be intercepted on the way he has chosen me as being a person no one would be likely to suspect of being his messenger on so important a matter it is important indeed pantoji there is no saying what may be the result of the peshwa's death there is no doubt that sindhya and holka will for once be in complete accord with nana furnuis and will combine in any plan to keep rugoba's son from succeeding still there are many of the friends of rugoba who will be ready to declare for his son and moreover there are the stories that have been so widely circulated as to bajee's personal appearance and his many accomplishments these will gain for him a great number of partisans the journey was performed without interruption at one time a body of some fifty horsemen made their appearance on rising ground near the road but drew off when they saw how strong was the party and after a ride of sixty miles they arrived at pursuram bhau's camp harry dismounted in front of the general's tent and entering handed him the letter what is your news the latter asked before opening it there is none general beyond what the letter sent to you three hours before i left will have prepared you to hear i only bear a copy of that letter in case the first should not have reached you it is well that the precaution was taken for in truth the messenger has not arrived it is possible that he may have been murdered on the way sir for we saw a party of fifty horsemen on the road whose intentions seemed to be hostile but as i had sufter's troop of a hundred men with me they drew off but what is the news then that is so important that steps are taken to stop messengers that bear it harry related what had taken place the old officer giving many ejaculations of regret and horror at the news of madhu rao's death is a terrible misfortune indeed he said and is like to throw the whole country into disorder again he opened the dispatch now and glanced through it 
he called some of his officers who were gathered near the tent and ordered them to cause the trumpets to be sounded for all the troops to be in readiness to march at once leaving only a small body of infantry to pack up the tents and follow at a more leisurely pace with the baggage an hour later two regiments of cavalry started infantry men being taken up behind the troopers and late the next day they arrived at Pune. Sindhya and the Raja of Bara had also been sent for in haste and as soon as they arrived a council was held as to the choice that should be made of a successor all were opposed to the selection of Baji Rao for he would have been brought up by his mother with the deepest enmity towards those who had successfully combined against his father it was therefore proposed that the widow of madhu rao should adopt a son in whose name the government should be carried on it was not until two months had been spent in negotiations that the matter was finally settled one of Sindhya's ministers named baloba alone opposed the course decided upon and baji rao opened communications with him and succeeded in winning him over to his cause having done this he addressed Sindhya, offering him a very large addition to his territory and payment of all his expenses if he would assist him to gain his rightful position as baloba had great influence over the young Sindhya, the offer was accepted the arrangement was made so secretly that nana furnuis had received no intimation whatever of what was going on until the agreement had been concluded pursuram bhau was again summoned to Pune and with his usual energy made a march of one hundred and twenty miles in forty-eight hours the position was a difficult one indeed at one blow the plans that had been so carefully laid by nana were shattered Sindhya, who had but a month or two before formed one of the confederacy had now gone round to the side of baji rao who regarded the minister as his greatest enemy holkar was not to be depended upon and in Pune there were many adherents of the son of rugoba the council held by nana pursaram and two or three other great officers was long and at times stormy but it was finally agreed that the sole way out of the perilous position caused by Sindhya's desertion was to anticipate him and to release baji rao and declare him peshwa end of section five Section 6 of At the Point of the Bayonet A Tale of the Maratha War by G. A. Henty This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Suman Varua At the Point of the Bayonet a tale of the maratha war chapter three a change in affairs part two pursaram started at once to the fort where the brothers were confined harry who was now deeply interested in the course of events was one of nana's officers who accompanied pursaram on hearing the general's errand the officer in command of the fort at once sent for Baji, his brother Chimnaji, and Amrut, who was the adopted son of Rugoba, and who stood on an equal footing with regard to the succession. Baji Rao listened calmly to the proposals made to him in Nana's name, asked several questions, and demanded guarantees, but was evidently disposed to accept the proposals if assured that they were made in good faith. Amrud strongly urged him to decline the offer, but Baji, upon Pursaram taking the most solemn oath known to the Hindus, in proof of his sincerity, accepted the offer and, with his brother Chimnaji, rode with Pursaram to Pune. Amrud being left behind in the fort, 
as Purusaram considered that he would continue to exercise his influence over Baji in a direction hostile to Nana's interest. As soon as the party arrived at the capital, an interview took place between Baji and Nana when, in the presence of many of the great officers, both saw to forget all enmities and injuries, and Baji promised to retain Nana at the head of his administration. That same evening the minister sent for Harry. Pantoji, he said, I have a commission for you. I know that you are loyal to me and that I can depend upon you. I wish you to go at once to Sindhya's camp, which is now on the bank of the Godavari, and ascertain how he takes the news. Doubtless Baloba, his prime minister, will be furious at finding that, instead of Baji becoming a mere creature of Sindhya's, I have placed him on the Masnad and retained my place as his chief minister. I can employ you for this business better than most others, for the greater part of my officers are personally known to those of Scythia, while you have scarce been seen by them. I have also a high idea of your shrewdness, and I have no doubt that you will, in some way, be able to gain the information that I require. Indeed, it will probably be the public talk of the camp. If you should find an opportunity of entering into negotiations with any influential person in Sindhya's court, I authorize you to do so in my name, and to agree to any reasonable demands that he may make, either for a payment in money or in estates. Sindhya's character is wholly unformed, and, though today he may be guided by Baloba, tomorrow he may lean on someone else. You can go in any guise you think fit, either as a trooper or as a camp follower. In either case you had better take Saftar and twenty men with you, and leave them in concealment within a few miles of the camp so that, in case of necessity, you can join them, and his men can act as messengers and bring your reports to me. As it was now a year since Harry had first gone to Pune and he had during that time worked diligently, he could now both read and write the Maratha language, and was thus able to send in written reports. Instead of being obliged to rely upon oral messages, which might be misdelivered by those who carried them, or possibly reported to others instead of to the minister, whereas reading and writing were known to but few of the Marathas outside the Brahmin class. Saftar expressed himself much pleased when he heard that he was to accompany Harry. I'm sick of this life of inactivity, he said. Why, we have had no fighting for the past five years, and we shall forget how to use our arms unless there is something doing. I would willingly accompany you into Scindia's camp, but I am far too well known there to hope to escape observation. However, I will pick out twenty of my best men so that, if there should be a skirmish, we shall be able to hold our own. Of course, I shall choose men who have good horses, for we may have to ride for it. Harry himself was very well mounted, for Madhu Rao had given him two excellent horses, and as he had, when out with Safta's troop, tried them against the best of those of the Sawars, he felt sure that he could trust to them in case of having to ride for his life. The trooper who looked after them had become much attached to him, and he determined to take him with him into Sindhya's camp, one of Savda's other men looking after the horses. After a consultation with Safda, he decided on adopting the costume of a pity trader or peddler carrying garments, scarves and other articles used by soldiers. Of these he laid in a store, and three hours after his interview with Nana, started with his escort, the trooper leading his spare horse, on which his packs were fastened, and his own man riding a country pony. The distance to Sindhya's camp was under a hundred miles, and they took three days in accomplishing it. 
it was important that the horses should not be knocked up as their lives might depend upon their speed when within ten miles of their destination they halted in a grove near the moolah river here harry changed his clothes and assumed those of a small merchant then he mounted the pony a portion of the packs was fastened behind him and the rest carried by his servant cynthia's camp lay around toka a town on the godavari at the foot of a range of hills on arriving there he went to the field bazaar where a large number of booths occupied by traders and country peasants were erected the former principally sold arms saddlery and garments the latter the produce of their own villages choosing an unoccupied piece of ground harry erected a little shelter tent composed of a dark blanket thrown over a ridge pole supported by two others giving a height of some four feet in the centre the pony was picketed just behind this in front of it a portion of the wares was spread out and harry began the usual loud exhortations to passers-by to inspect them having thus established himself he left wasil in charge explaining to him the prices that he was to ask for each of the articles sold and then started on a tour through the camp here and there pausing to listen to the soldiers he picked up scraps of news and learned that there was a general expectation that the army would march in a day or two towards Pune, it being rumoured that Scindia and his minister Baloba had been outwitted by Nana Furnuis, and that Baloba had made no secret of his anger, but vowed vengeance against the man who had overthrown plans which, it had been surely believed, would have resulted in Scindia's obtaining supreme control over the Deccan returning to his little tent he wrote a letter to nana telling him what he had gathered and giving approximately the strength of scindia's force adding that from what he heard the whole were animated with the desire to avenge what they considered an insult to their prince this note he gave to wasil who at once started on foot to join Safther, who would forward it by four troopers to Pune the next morning he returned and after purchasing provisions from the countrymen and lighting a fire for cooking them he assisted harry at his stall the latter was standing up exhibiting a garment to a soldier who was haggling with him over the price when a party of officers rode by at their head was one whose dress showed him to be a person of importance and whom harry at once recognized as baloba having often noticed him during the negotiations at Pune, As his eye fell upon Harry, he checked his horse for a moment and beckoned to him to come to him. "'Come here, wench,' he said, using the term generally applied to the commercial caste. Harry went up to him and salaamed. "'How comes it?' the minister asked that so fine a young fellow as you are is content to be peddling goods through the country when so well fitted by nature for better things you should be a soldier and a good one for so young a man i've never seen a greater promise of strength it seems to me that your face is not unknown to me where do you come from from juni your excellency where my people are cultivators but having no liking for that life i learned the trade of a shopkeeper and obtained permission to travel to your camp and to try my fortune in disposing some of my master's goods as juni was but some sixty miles from toka the explanation was natural enough and as the former town lay near to the main road from scindia's dominions in Kandesh, it afforded an explanation of Baloba's partial recognition of his face. And as a merchant you can read and write, I suppose? The latter went on. Yes, your highness, sufficiently well for my business. 
Well, think it over. You can scarcely find your present life more suitable to your taste than that of a cultivator, and the army is the proper place for a young fellow with spirit and with strength and muscles such as you have. If you like to enlist in my own bodyguard, and your conduct be good, I will see that you have such promotion as you deserve. Your Excellency is kind indeed, Harry said humbly. Before I accept your kind offer, will you permit me to return to Junir to account for my sales to my employer, and to obtain permission of my father to accept your offer, which would indeed be greatly more to my taste than the selling of goods? It is well, Baloba said, and then broke off. Ah, I know now why I remember your face. Tis the lightness of your eyes, which are of a colour rarely seen. But somehow or other, it appears to me that it was not at Junir, but at Pune, that I noticed your face. I was at Pune with my master when your highness was there, Harry said. That accounts for it. The minister touched his horse's flanks with his heel and rode on, with a thoughtful look on his face. Harry at once joined Wasil. Quick, Wasil, there is no time to be lost. Throw the saddle on to the pony and make your way out of the camp at once. Pitch all the other things into the tent and close it. If you leave them here, it will seem strange. Baloba has seen me at Pune, and it is likely enough that, as he thinks it over, he will remember that it was in a dress altogether different from this. Go at once to Safda. If you get there before me, tell him to mount at once and ride fast to meet me. Two minutes later everything was prepared, and Wasil, mounting the pony, rode off while Harry moved away among the tents. In a quiet spot behind one of these, he threw off his upper garments and stood in the ordinary undress of a Hindu peasant, having nothing on but a scanty loin cloth. He had scarcely accomplished this when he heard the trampling of horses and saw past the tent four troopers ride up to the spot he had just left. Where is the trader who keeps this tent? One of them shouted. He is a spy and we have orders to arrest him. Harry waited to hear no more, but walked in the opposite direction, taking care to maintain a leisurely stride and to avoid all appearance of haste. Then going down to the road by the side of which the bazaar was encamped, he mingled with the crowd there. Presently one of the troopers dashed up. Has anyone seen a man in the dress of a trader? and he roughly described the attire of which Harry had rid himself. There was a general chorus of denial from those standing round, and the trooper again galloped on. Harry continued his walk at a leisurely pace, stopping occasionally to look at articles exposed for sale until he reached the end of the bazaar. Then he made across the country, Trumpets were blowing now in the camp, and he had no doubt that Baloba had ordered a thorough search to be made for him. He did not quicken his pace, however, until well out of sight, but then he broke into a swinging trot, for he guessed that, when he was not found in the camp, parties of cavalry would start to scour the country. He had gone some four miles when, looking behind him, he saw about twenty horsemen far back along the road. The country here was flat and open with fields irrigated by canals running from the Mula and affording no opportunity for concealment. Hitherto he had been running well within his powers, but he now quickened his pace and ran at full speed. He calculated that Wasil would have at least half an hour start of him, and that, as he would urge the pony to the top of his speed, he would by this time have joined Safda, and he was sure that the latter would not lose an instant before starting to meet him. He had hesitated for a moment, 
whether he should break into a quiet walk and allow the troopers to overtake him relying upon the alteration of his costume but he reflected that baloba might have foreseen that he would change his disguise and have ordered the arrest of a young man with curiously light eyes harry had always attempted to conceal this feature as far as possible by staining his eyelashes a deep black but when he looked up the colour of his eyes could hardly fail to strike anyone especially noticing them his constant exercise as a boy had given him great swiftness of foot and the year passed as a shikari had added to his endurance and speed and divested of clothing as he was he felt sure that the horsemen who were more than a mile in his rear when he first caught sight of them would not overtake him for some time he was running as he knew for life for he was certain that if caught baloba would have him at once put to death as a spy although hardy and of great endurance the maratha horses which were small in size were not accustomed to being put to the top of their speed except for a short charge and the five miles that they had galloped already must have to some extent fatigued them after running at the top of his speed for about a mile he looked back the party was still a long distance in his rear again he pressed forward but his exertions were telling upon him and before he had gone another half mile the marathas had approached within little more than half that distance far ahead he thought he could perceive a body of horsemen but these were nearly two miles away and he would be overtaken before they could reach him therefore he turned suddenly off and took to one of the little banks dividing one irrigated field from another as soon as the horsemen reached the spot where he had left the road they too turned off but harry who was now husbanding his strength saw a sudden confusion among them the little bank of earth on which he was running was but a foot wide and was softened by the water which soaked in from both sides it could bear his weight well enough but not that of a mounted man only one or two had attempted to follow it the others had plunged into the field here their horses at once sank up to the knees some endeavoured to force the animals on others to regain the road they had quitted the two horsemen on the bank were making better progress but their horses hoofs sank deeply in the soft earth and their pace in spite of the exertions of the riders was but a slow one harry turned when he came to the end of the field and followed another bank at right angles and was therefore now running in the right direction he was more than keeping his lead from the foremost of his pursuers some of the others galloped along the road parallel to him but ahead the horsemen he had first seen were now within a mile on they came at the top of their speed and the troopers on the road halted not knowing whether this body were friends or foes while those on the bank reined in their horses and rode back to join their comrades harry continued to run till he came to another bank leading to the road and following this he arrived there just as safda galloped up with his party one of the troopers leading his horse they gave a shout of welcome as he came up i thought it must be you safda said from the way you ran rather than from your attire shall we charge those fellows i think not harry said in the first place scindia has not as yet declared war against nana and baji in the second there may be more men coming on behind therefore it will be best to leave them alone though if they attack us we shall of course defend ourselves i think that is their intention pantoji see they have gathered together i suppose they daren't go back and say that you have escaped give me either your sword or spear 
the latter was part of the regular equipment of the Maratha horsemen. Safdar handed him his sword and, as the pursuers advanced towards them at a canter which speedily became a gallop, he took his place by the side of Safdar and, the latter giving the word, the band dashed forward to meet their opponents. The combat was a short one. Safdar's followers were all picked men and were better mounted than Scindia's troopers. These made special efforts to get at Harry, but the latter's skill with the sword enabled him to free himself from his most pressing opponents. Safta laid about him stoutly and, his men seconding him well, half their opponents were speedily struck to the ground, and the rest, turning their horses, fled at full speed. Safta's men would have followed, but he shouted to them to draw rein. Enough has been done and well done, he said. If Scindia means war, nothing will be said about this fight. But if he does not, complaints will doubtless be laid against us, and it is better that we should be able to say that we fought only in self-defence, and that, when the attack ceased, we allowed them to ride off unmolested, though we might easily enough have slain the whole of them. On arriving at the grove where the troop had halted, Harry at once resumed his own clothes, for although in his early days he had been accustomed to be slightly clad, he felt ill at ease riding almost naked. Here too he found Wasil, who had ridden with such speed that his pony was too much exhausted for him to ride back with the rest. He received his master with the greatest joy, for he had feared he would be captured before leaving the camp. They continued their journey to Junir, where they halted for the night. Safda went to his house, and Harry rode out to the farm. End of section 6「Section 7 of At the Point of the Bayonet, A Tale of the Maratha War by G. A. Henty. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Suman Barua At the Point of the Bayonet, A Tale of the Maratha War Chapter 4 A British Resident Part 1 As Harry drew rein at the farm, Soera ran out, followed by her brother and Anandi, with cries of joy at his unexpected return. It was nearly fifteen months since she had last seen him, though he had, when opportunity offered, sent messages to her assuring her that he was well and hoped ere long to be able to come over to see her. I should scarce have known you, she said, in those fine clothes of yours. You sent word that you were an officer in the Peshwa service, but I hardly thought that you could be so much changed. You have grown a great deal, and are now much taller than Ram Das's sons. The worthy farmer and Anandi were also delighted to see him. How long are you going to stay? The former asked. Only till tomorrow at daybreak. I have to ride forward with all haste to Pune, for I have been on a mission for Nana Fulnuis. Surely it is not so important that you cannot stay a few hours, Pantoji? It is of importance. You may have known that Nana has placed Bajirao on the Masnad, and he has installed himself as his minister, thereby defeating the plans of Baloba and Sindhya, who will probably come along here with their whole force in a day or two. Late that evening, when the others had retired to bed, Soera and Harry had a long talk together. Have you thought, Harry? she asked after speaking for some time about his doings and position at court, of joining your people again? There is peace between the Peshwa's court and the English. 
there is a British resident at Pune, and, as you have now gained a certain rank there, you could go to him with a much better face than if you had come direct from here as a peasant. Then it would probably have been supposed that you were an impostor. That you were English, of course, could be seen by your skin, but it might have been thought that I had adopted some English child, and was now trying to pass it off as the son of an officer. I think, mother, that I had best continue for some time as I am. You see, I have, at present, nothing in common with the English except their blood. Were another war to break out between the Marathas and Bombay, I would at once declare myself to the resident here, and go down to Bombay, but, even then, my position would be a doubtful one, and unless I were to enlist in their army, I do not see how I should maintain myself. Moreover, you must remember that I have now a deep interest in matters here. Nana Furnuis has treated me with much kindness and placed his confidence in me. He has many enemies, as I have told you. Sindhya is about to advance against Pune, and it is probable that he may succeed in driving Nana into exile or imprisoning him for life, and establishing Baloba or some other person devoted to his interest as minister, in which case Sindhya would be absolutely supreme. Nothing would persuade me to desert Nana, who has for many years alone withstood the ambition of Sindhya's party. I do not say for a moment that my aid would be of the slightest use to him, but at any rate, he shall see that I am not ungrateful for his kindness, and will be faithful to him in his misfortunes, as he has been kind to me when in power. That is right, Soyara said. The cause of Nana is the cause of all in this part of the Deccan, for we should be infinitely worse off were Sindhya to lay hands on us. But there is an alternative by which you could at once remain faithful to Nana and prepare your way for joining the English when you considered that the time for doing so had arrived. What is that, Soera? You might go to the English resident and tell him who you are and how you have been brought up. Say that, at present, you wish to remain in the service of Nana, who has been a good friend to you, and with whom your sympathies, like those of nearly all the cultivators in the Peshwa's dominions, accord. Say that you hope, when the time comes, to return to your countrymen, and that, in the meantime, you will give him any information in your power as to what is going on, subject only to your friendship for Nana. Thus, by making yourself useful to the resident, you may prepare your way for joining your countrymen and, at the same time, be able to remain with Nana until either he is victorious over his enemies or his cause is really lost. The plan is an excellent one, Harry said and I will certainly adopt it. Undoubtedly the feeling among the English must be in favour of Baji Rao and Nana. As Baji is the son of Rugoba, he is their natural ally. Moreover, they would object most strongly to see Sindhya become master of the whole Maratha power, which he would probably use against them at the first opportunity. It would, as you say, greatly facilitate my obtaining a fair position among the English, and I might also be able to do Nana a service. Of course, I have seen the English resident many times in the streets of Pune, and more than once on special occasions at Madhurao's court. As it is his business to know something of all connected with the palace, it is probable that he may have heard of me. At any rate, it would be easier to explain to him my position than it would be to go down as a stranger to Bombay, where I should be ignorant as to whom I should first approach and how to declare myself, a matter I have very often thought over. The next morning the troops started at daybreak and, riding fast, reached Pune by noon. 
Harry went at once to report what he had seen to Nana. I received your letter yesterday, the minister said, and the news was indeed bad. Purseram Bhav has offered to go out to give battle to Scindia, but my forces would have no chance. Not only is Scindia's army much larger, but he has the infantry regiments commanded by foreign officers, and against these my infantry could not prevail. It would be madness to risk fighting under such circumstances. The wheel may turn, and ere long I may be in a position to thwart the schemes of Scindia and Balova. Nana had never been conspicuous for personal courage, though his moral courage and his ability to meet any storm were unbounded. He was now an old man and dreaded the shock of battle when the chances appeared to be so much against him. He could not depend upon the support of Baji, who had already shown himself willing to side with the strongest and to make terms for himself without the slightest regard for those who had befriended him. But if your excellency does not think of fighting, what course will you pursue? I shall leave the country at once, he said. If I stop here, I know that Baloba, who is my personal enemy, will have me put to death. I only need time to recover from this sudden misfortune, and it would be madness for me to wait here and to fall into the power of my enemies. Pursuram Bhau is greatly offended, because I will not allow him to fight. But I, who have for so many years done my best to prevent civil war in this country, a war which, however it ended, would break up the Maratha power, would not bring its horrors upon Pune. It is against me that Baloba is marching and, if I retire, bloodshed will be altogether averted. Will you accompany me, Pantoji? he asked almost wistfully. Assuredly I will do so, sir, and I think that I can answer for Safda, who has, I know, a great regard for your excellency. As to myself, I have little hope that I should escape unharmed if Baloba arrive here before I leave. He detected me even in my disguise in his camp, and I had a narrow escape, for a party of his cavalry pursued me, and would probably have caught me had not Safda with his band met me and defeated them with a loss of half their number. You may be sure that Baloba will learn who was in command, and Safda's life would be no safer than my own. May I ask when your Excellency is going to leave Pune? Scouts were sent out yesterday, as soon as your letter was read, and directly Scindia's army gets in motion, I shall receive news. When I do, I shall leave. The horses will be saddled in readiness, and I shall be at the edge of the carts by the time Scindia arrives here. You can tell Safda to come at once. He knows the disposition of the captains of the various troops, and will be able to tell me who can be depended upon. Saftar was indeed outside the palace, having told Harry that he would wait until he had learned the result of his interview with Nana. Harry briefly related to him his conversation with the minister. I think he is right, he said. Pusarambhau is a stout fighter and is as brave as a lion but Scindia's force would be double that which he could gather at such a short notice, and Nana does right not to risk everything on the chance of a single fight. He is a wily old fox, and has got safely through dangers which would have crushed an ordinary man. You will see that, before long, he will be back again, and reinstated in power. At any rate, I will accompany him. After that thrashing we gave Baloba's horsemen, my head would not be safe here an hour after his arrival. On the road Harry had informed him of the decision at which he had arrived upon Sawara's advice, and Safdar agreed that it would certainly be a wise step. Accordingly, when the latter entered the palace, Harry went straight to the British residency. 
he sent in his native name to Mr. Mallet and asked for an interview, and was at once shown in. "'You wish to speak to me, sir?' the resident said, in the Maratha language. "'I think I have seen you at Madhu Rao's court.' "'I have seen Your Excellency there,' Harry replied in the same language. Then, seeing that the resident spoke the language with difficulty, he went on in English. It is a matter chiefly personal to myself. The resident looked at him in surprise, for it was the first time he had heard a Maratha speaking English. I am the son of Major Lindsay, who, with his wife and escort, was murdered by a party of Maratha seventeen years ago at the time when the English army was advancing against Pune. I was saved by the fidelity of an ayah who had been in the family for ten years. A cousin of hers was, fortunately, one of the leaders of the party who attacked the camp and, with his connivance, she carried me off and made her way back to her family near Junir. She stained my skin, as you see, and allowed it to be supposed that she had married in Bombay and that I was her own child. She has brought me up with the intention of my rejoining my countrymen as soon as I became a man, for she did not see how, until then, I could earn my living among strangers. She taught me as much she knew of the language and religion of the English, and when I was twelve, took me down to Bombay and left me for some two years and a half in the house of Mrs. Sankey, a lady who taught some of the children of officers there. When I left Bombay, I was able to speak English as well as other English boys of my age. My nurse had, from the earliest time I can remember, encouraged me in taking part in all sports and games, and when I was but eight, a soldier, a cousin of hers, began to teach me my first exercise in arms. I continued to work at this until I went down to Bombay and, on my return, spent all my time for some months in riding and shooting. After this I was, for a year, with a famous shikari and took part in the killing of many tigers and other wild beasts. This was fortunate, for when, through this relation of my nurse, I was introduced to Nana Furnuis and by him to Madhu Rao, the latter was pleased to take a fancy for me and appointed me to the charge of the game preserves. At the present moment I have just returned from a mission in disguise to Sindhya's camp. Nana has shown me great kindness. My intention is to remain with him until he has passed through his present difficulties, which are very serious. After that I hope to be able to go to Bombay and to obtain a commission in the company's service. I remember well the circumstances of the murder of Major Lindsay and his wife, for I was in Bombay at the time. It was a matter of deep regret to us all, for he was greatly liked, but at the time everyone was excited over the infamous treaty of Borgham. I remember that when a party was sent out on our receiving the news of the attack, the bodies of the major and his wife were found, as also those of his servants and so ours. But it was reported that no trace could be discovered of the infant or of his ayah. It was thought possible that they had escaped, and hopes were entertained that the woman might have carried off her charge. I have no doubt as to the truth of your story. Is your nurse still alive? She is, sir as is also the man who assisted her. His name is Safdar, and he commands a troop of the Peshwa's cavalry. Both will testify at the right time to the truth of my statement. I can the more readily believe it, the resident said, inasmuch as, in spite of your colour, I can perceive a certain likeness to Major Lindsay, whom I knew intimately. My intention in coming to see you now, sir, was to offer to furnish any information to you concerning the movements and plans of Nana Furnuis, so far as such information could do him no harm. 
I heard that there had been discussions between Nana and Pursuram Bhau, the latter wishing to give battle to Sindhya. But I think that Nana is right in refusing to sanction this for, from all I hear, Sindhya's army is very much the stronger. It is, sir, and I should say that Pursuram's army could hardly be depended upon to fight under such circumstances. What is Nana going to do? He is going to retire as soon as Sindhya's army is fairly in motion. He is in an awkward position, Mr. Mallet said, but he has reinstated himself several times when it seemed that everything was lost. I have great respect for his abilities, and he is the only man who can curb the ambition of Sindhya and his ministers. Sindhya's entire supremacy would be most unwelcome to us, for, indeed, it is only owing to the mutual jealousy of the three great chiefs of the Maratha nation that we have gained successes. Were the whole power in one hand, we should certainly lose Surat, and probably Basin and Salset, and have to fight hard to hold Bombay. I shall be very glad to receive any reports you can supply me with, for it is next to impossible to obtain anything like trustworthy information here. We only hear what it is desired that we should know, and all these late changes have come as a complete surprise to me, for what news I do obtain is, more often than not, false. Unfortunately, truth is a virtue almost unknown among the Marathas. They have a perfect genius for intrigue, and consider it perfectly justifiable to deceive not only enemies but friends. And when do you think of declaring yourself, Mr. Lindsay? I shall remain with Nana, so long as there is the slightest chance of his success, unless indeed the course of affairs should lead to the English intervening in these troubles, then in case they declare against Nana, I should feel it my duty to leave him at once. I do not think there is any probability of that. Our policy has been to support him, as the Peshwa's minister, against either Sindhya or Holkar. I shall, of course, report your appearance to the authorities at Bombay, and I am sure there will be a disposition to advance your views for the sake of your father, and moreover your knowledge of the language of the Marathas, which is of course perfect, or you could not have maintained your deception so long, will of itself be a strong recommendation in your favour. After thanking Mr. Mallet for his kindness, Harry returned to Safda's camp and gave him an account of his interview with the resident. That is satisfactory indeed, Pantoji. It shows the wisdom of the step you took. Now, as to our affairs here, I have mentioned the names of five captains of troops, all of whom can, I think, be relied upon. However, I am now going out to see them, and have only been waiting for your return. Six hundred men is but a small body, but it is a beginning, and I have no doubt that others will join Nana later on, but I am not sufficiently sure of their sentiments to open the matter to them, and it is essential that no suspicion of Nana's intention to leave the town should get about. There might be a riot in the city, and possibly some of the captains, who have not received the promotion which they regard as their due, might try to gain Sindhya's favour by arresting him. On the following day, a messenger arrived from Nana, requesting Safda to place himself with his troop and such other captains as he could rely upon on the road a mile west of Pune. He himself would leave the town quietly with a small body of his friends and join them there. Safda at once sent off five of his men with orders to the captains whom he had seen on the previous afternoon and within an hour six hundred men were gathered at the point indicated half an hour later a party of horsemen was seen coming along and furnovi soon rode up accompanied by several of his strongest adherents the officers were gathered at the head of their troops nana drawing rein said to them 
thanks for your fidelity. I shall not forget it, and hope, when the time comes, to reward it as it deserves. He motioned to Harry to join him. Scindia's army was to march this morning, he said, and his horsemen will be here by tomorrow evening at latest. End of section 7「Section 8 of At the Point of the Bayonet – A Tale of the Maratha War by G. A. Henty This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Suman Barua At the Point of the Bayonet – a tale of the Maratha War. Chapter 4 A British Resident, Part 2 They rode to Satara, where Nana had arranged to stop until he received news from Pusaram Bhau as to the course of events at Pune, and two days later a messenger rode in with news that Sindhya had arrived near Pune and had had a friendly interview with Baji Rao. Baloba had seen Pusaram and had pretended great friendship for him, but the old soldier was by no means deceived by his protestations. If we had only to do with Sindhya, Nana said, matters could be easily arranged, but the young Raja is only a puppet in his minister's hands. Several days passed and then another letter came from Pusaram. It said that Baloba had resolved to oppose Baji Rao and to have both a minister and a Peshwa of his own nomination, and that he proposed to him that Madhu Rao's widow should adopt Chimnaji as her son, that Baji should be placed in confinement, and that he, Pursuram Bhau, should be his minister. He asked Nana's advice as to what course he should take. He stated that Baloba had said he was greatly influenced in the methods he proposed by the hope of rendering them in some degree acceptable to Nana. As the latter had only placed Baji Rao on the Masnad as a means of checkmating Sindhya, he advised Pursuram to accept the offer, but pointed out the absolute necessity for his retaining Baji in his own custody. Pursuram omitted to follow this portion of the advice, and a formal reconciliation took place by letter between Baloba and Nana. The latter was invited to proceed at once to Pune, but on finding that Pursuram had allowed Baloba to retain Bajir in his hands, he suspected that the whole was a scheme to entice him into the power of his enemy, and he therefore made excuses for not going. Baji, ignorant of the plot that had been planned, went to Sindhya's camp to remonstrate against a heavy demand for money on account of the expenses to which Sindhya had been put, and to his astonishment he was, then and there, made a prisoner. Chimnaji positively refused to become a party to the usurpation of his brother's rights, but he was compelled, by threats, to ascend the Masnad. On the day after his installation, Pusaram Bhav wrote, proposing that Nana should come to Pune to meet Baloba and to assume the civil administration of the new Peshwa's government, while the command of the troops and all military arrangements should remain as they stood. In reply, Nana requested that Pusaram should send his son, Hari Pant, to settle the preliminaries, but instead of coming as an envoy, Hari Pant left Pune with over 5,000 chosen horse. This naturally excited Nana's suspicions, which was strengthened by a letter from Rao Purke, who was in command of the Peshwa's household troops, warning him to seek safety without a moment's delay. Now that he saw himself that half measures were no longer possible, Nana ceased to be irresolute and, when his fortune seemed to all men to be desperate, commenced a series of successful intrigues that astonished all India. He had quietly increased his force during the weeks of waiting since he had left Pune. He had ample funds, 
having carried away with him an immense treasure accumulated during his long years of government there was no time to be lost and as soon as he received the letter of warning he left the town of wai and made for the konkan as soon as he reached the ghats he set the whole of his force to block the passes by rolling great stones down into the roads in addition strong barricades were constructed and a force of two hundred men left at each point to defend them the infantry he had recruited he threw into the fort of Rigar and added strongly to its defences baloba had proposed that nana should be followed without delay and offered some of scindia's best troops for the purpose but purseram acting in accordance with the advice of some of nana's friends raised an objection he had now however resolved to break altogether with the minister whose timidity at the critical moment was considered by him as a proof that he could never again be formidable and he accordingly gave up nana's estates to scindia and took possession of his houses and property in Pune for his own use after remaining for a few days waiting events and sending off many messengers nana sent for harry i have a mission for you he said it is one that requires daring and great intelligence and i know no one to whom it could be better committed than to you you see that owing to the turn events have taken baji rao and myself are natural allies we have both suffered at the hands of baloba he is a prisoner in scindia's camp though as i understand free to move about in it i privately received a hint that baji himself recognizes this but doubtless he believes that i am powerless to help either myself or him in this he is mistaken i have been in communication with holker who is alarmed at the ever-increasing power of scindia and he will throw his whole power into the scale to aid me the rajas of barar and kolapu have engaged to aid me for the same reason and the nizam will sign the treaty that was agreed upon between us some time since rao fukre has engaged to bring the peshwa's household troops over when the signal is given more than that i have through ryaji a patel who is an enemy of baloba opened negotiations with scindia himself offering him the estates of pusarambhal and the fort of surinagar with territory yielding ten lakhs on condition of his placing baloba in confinement re-establishing bajirao on the masnad and returning with his troops to his own territory i have no doubt that when bajirao hears this he will be glad enough to throw himself heartily into the cause i may tell you that he is apparently a guest rather than a prisoner and that he has a camp of his own in the centre of that of scindia and therefore when you have once made your way into his encampment you will have no difficulty in obtaining a private interview with him it is necessary that he should have money and silver would be too heavy for you to carry but i will give you bags containing a thousand gold mohors which will enable him to begin the work of privately raising troops i will undertake the business sir the only person i fear in the smallest degree is baloba himself i must disguise myself so that he will not recognize me without delay harry mounted his horse placed the two bags of money that had been handed to him in the wallets behind his saddle exchanged his dress for that of one of Safda's troopers and then started for Pune, which he reached the next day he did not enter the town but put up at a cultivator's two miles distant from it i want to hire a cart with two bullocks he said to the man can you furnish one as i do not know you i should require some money paid down as a guarantee that they will be returned that i can give you but i shall leave my horse here and that is fully worth your wagon and oxen however i will leave with you a hundred rupees i may not keep your wagon many days 
after it was dark harry went to the town and purchased some paints and other things that he required for disguise having used these he went to the house of the british resident and on stating who he was he was shown in mr mallet did not recognize in the roughly dressed countryman the young officer who had called upon him before i am harry lindsay and being in poona called upon you to give you some information i recognize you by your voice the resident said but i fear that there is nothing of importance that you can tell me now that nana Funuis is homeless and baji rao is no longer peshwa nana is not done with yet sir why he is a fugitive with a handful of troops under him but he has his brains sir which are worth more than an army and believe me if all goes well it will not be long before he is back in poona as minister to the peshwa minister to chimnaji no sir minister to baji rao i would that it was so mr mallet said but since one is a fugitive and the other a prisoner i see no chance whatever of such a transformation i will briefly tell you sir what is preparing baji feeling certain that he will ere long be sent to a fortress has communicated with nana imploring him to aid him if he has turned to nana for support he is either mad or acting as baloba's tool on the contrary sir i think that his doing so shows that he recognizes nana's ability and feels that ere long he may become a useful ally already nana has been at work holkar who naturally views with intense jealousy sindhya's entire control of the territory of the peshwa has already agreed to put his whole army in the field rao furke will rebel with the household troops and what is vastly more important sindhya has embraced nana's offer of a large sum of money and a grant of territory to arrest baloba and to replace bajir on the masnad in addition to this he has won over the raja of bara has incited the raja of kolapu to attack the district of pusaram bhau and has obtained the nizam's approbation of a treaty that had already been settled between nana and the nizam's general the basis of which is that bajir is to be re-established with nana himself as minister and on the other hand the territory formerly seized by the peshwa to be restored my mission here is to inform baji rao of the plans that have been prepared and to obtain from him a solemn engagement that nana shall be reappointed as his minister on the success of his plans mr mallet listened to harry with increasing astonishment this is important news indeed he said marvellous and of the highest importance to me already i have been asked by the council of bombay to give my opinion as to whether it is expedient to render any assistance to nana furnuis it is to them almost as important as to nana that sindhya should not obtain supreme power i have replied that i could not recommend any such step for that nana's cause seemed altogether lost and that any aid to him would be absolutely useless and would only serve sindhya with a pretext for declaring war against us of course what you have told me entirely alters the situation it will not be necessary for the council to assist nana but they can give him fair words and even if baloba should win the day he will have no ground for accusing us of having aided nana it is impossible to overlook the value of your communication mr lindsay and i can promise you that you will not find the government of bombay ungrateful for it will relieve them of the anxiety which the progress of events here has caused them on leaving the residency harry returned to the farm where he had left his horse and early next morning put on his disguise again painted lines round his eyes touched some of the hairs of his eyebrows with white paint mixed some white horsehair with the tuft on the top of his head and dropped a little juice of a plant resembling belladonna used at times by ladies in the east to dilate the pupils of their eyes and make them dark and brilliant in his eyes so era had told him of this herb 
when he related to her how Baloba had detected him by the lightness of his eyes. He was greatly surprised at the alteration it effected in his appearance, and felt assured that even Baloba himself would not again recognize him. He bought a dozen sacks of grain from the farmer and, placing these in the bullock cart, started for Scindia's camp. He had, during the night, buried the gold. For he thought that, until he knew his ground, and could feel certain of entering Baji Rao's camp unquestioned, it would be better that there should be nothing in the cart, where he searched, to betray him. He carried in his hand the long staff universally used by bullock drivers and, passing through Pune, arrived an hour later at the camp, which was pitched some three miles from the city. As large numbers of carts, with forage and provisions, arrived daily in the camp for the use of the troops, no attention whatever was paid to him, and on inquiring for the encampment of Baji Rao, one of whose officers had, he said, purchased the grain, for his horses and those of his officers and escort, he soon found the spot, which was on somewhat rising ground in the centre of the camp. It was much larger than he had expected to find it, as beyond being prevented from leaving, Baji had full liberty, and was even permitted to have some of his friends round him, and two or three dozen troopers of his household regiment. In charge of these was a young officer who was well known to Harry during the time of Madhu Rao. Seeing him standing in front of a tent, Harry stopped the cart opposite to him and leaving it went up to him. Where shall I unload the cart? he asked. I know nothing about it, the officer said. Who has ordered it? The supply will be welcome enough, for we are very short of forage. Then changing his tone, Harry said, Do you not know me, Nujif? I am your friend Pantoji. Impossible, the other said incredulously. It is so. I am not here for amusement, as you may guess, but I am on a private mission to Baji Rao. Will you inform him that I am here? I dare not say whom I come from, even to you but can explain myself fully to him. I will let him know, certainly, Pantoji. But there is little doubt that Baloba has his spies here, and it will be necessary to arrange that your meeting shall not be noticed. Do you sit down here by your cart, as if waiting for orders where to unload it? I will go across to Baji's tent and see him. Nujif accordingly went over to the Raja's tent, and returned in a quarter of an hour. Baji will see you, he said. First unload your grain in the lines of our cavalry, place some in front of your bullocks, and leave them there, then cross to the tent next to Baji's. It is occupied by one of his officers, who carries the purse and makes payments. Should you be watched, it would seem that you are only going there to receive the price of the grain. Baji himself will slip out of the rear of his tent and enter the next in the same way. The officer is at present absent, so that you can talk without anyone having an idea that you and Baji are together. Harry carried out the arrangement and, after leaving his bullocks, made his way to the spot indicated. He found the young Raja had gone there. And you are Pantoji? the latter said. I saw you but a few times, but Rao Furke has often mentioned your name to me as being one who stood high in the confidence of my cousin Madhu. Nujiv tells me that you have a private communication to make to me, and indeed I can well believe that. You would not thus disguise yourself unless the business was important. It is, Your Highness. Nana Furnawis has received your message. He reciprocates your expressions of friendship, and has sent me here to let you know that the time is approaching when your deliverance from Baloba can be achieved. He then delivered the message with which he had been entrusted. Baji's face became radiant as he went on. This is news indeed, he said. That Fouquet was faithful to me, I knew, 
but I thought that he was the only friend I had left. Truly Nana Funnuis is a great man, and I will gladly give the understanding he asks for, that in the event of his succeeding in placing me on the Masnad, he shall be my minister, with the same authority and power that he had under Madhu. I have at the farmhouse where I am stopping a thousand gold mohus, which Nana has sent to enable you to begin your preparations, but he urges that you should be extremely careful for, as you see by what I have told you, he has ample power to carry out the plan without any assistance from yourself, and it is most important that nothing shall be done that can arouse the suspicions of Baloba until all is ready for the final stroke. I have not brought it with me today, as I knew not how vigilant they might be in camp, and it was possible that my sacks of grain might be examined. As, however, I passed in without question, I will bring it when I next come, which will be in two days. I suppose there is no objection to my telling Furke what is being done? None at all, Your Highness. He has not yet been informed, though communications have passed between him and Nana. But although the latter was well convinced of his devotion, he thought it safer that no one should know the extent of the plot until all was in readiness. Two days later, Harry made another journey to the camp, and this time with the bags of money hidden among the grain in one of the sacks. He saw Baji Rao as before and received from him a paper with the undertaking required by Nana. The sack containing the money was put down where Baji's horses were picketed, and was there opened by a confidential servant who carried the bags into the tent which was close by. As he was leaving the camp, Harry had reason to congratulate himself on the precautions that he had taken, for he met Baloba riding along with a number of officers. Harry had, with his change of costume, assumed the appearance of age. He walked by the side of the bullocks, stooping greatly and leaning on his staff, and the minister passed without even glancing at him. Harry, on his return, paid the farmer for the hire of his cart. The latter was well pleased for, in addition to the money so earned, he had charged a good price for the two wagon loads of grain. Harry then put off the peasant's dress, and resumed that of a trooper, and rode back to Rigar, where he reported to Nana the success of his mission. End of section 8 Section 9 of At the Point of the Bayonet, A Tale of the Marana War by G. A. Hempty. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Adelda Pinurole. At the Point of the Bayonet, A Tale of the Murata War. Chapter 5. Down to Bombay, Part 1. Harry's stay with Nana was a short one, as, in three days, he was again sent to Pune. This time he was to take up his abode at a large house, occupied by two of the leaders of the Baji's party, the Raji having told him that he would request them to entertain him if he should again come to Pune. He was the bearer of 50,000 rupees, principally in gold, which he was to give to them for the use of the Baji. He had no message this time for the prince, personally, Nana having said to him, I want you to let me know how matters are going on. The young man may do something rash, and if Balboa's suspicions are in any way excited, he may send him to some distant fortress, which would seriously upset my plans, for I should have to retain Chimnaji in power as representative of his brother. We know that he was placed on the Muznud greatly in opposition to his wishes, and he certainly hailed with pleasure the prospect of Baji's relief. Still, it would not be the same thing for me. A minister of the Peshwa can rule without question by the people, but acting only as minister to a representative of the Peshwa, he would be far more severely criticized, 
and it is certain that, to raise money for paying Scindia the sum that has been agreed upon, extra taxation must be put on, the odium resulting from which would fall upon me. The two officers received Harry cordially. He had personally known them both, and as Nana's representative, they would have treated him with much honour, had it not been pointed out to them that this might be fatal to their plans. For, did Baloba hear that some strange officer was being so treated by them, he would be sure to set at once about finding out who he was, and what he was doing there. Matters are going on well, they said. The old general, Manaji Furke, who was one of Rugoba's devoted adherents, is now staying in Baji's camp, and is enlisting men for his service. Where are they being assembled? In Baji's camp. He has not interfered with there. It appears to be a very rash proceeding, Harry said. It is true that Baji has apparent liberty, and can have with him in his camp many of his friends. But a gathering of armed men can scarcely escape the eye of so keen an observer as Baloba. A few days later, Harry, being out one evening, saw a party of soldiers coming along the road from the direction of Scindia's camp. This was unusual for, in order to prevent plundering, the orders were stringent that none of Scindia's troops should enter Pune. He hurried back to the house and acquainted the two leaders with what he had seen. They were inclined to laugh at his apprehension, but when a body of horsemen were seen coming down the street, they issued orders for the doors to be closed and barricaded. There were some twenty men in the house, and when the officer who commanded the detachment summoned them to open the door and to deliver the two nobles to him, he was met from a decided refusal from the chiefs themselves from an upper window. The officer then ordered his men to dismount and break open the door, but when they attempted to do so, they were met by a fire of musketry from every window. Many fell, and the officer, seeing that the house could not be taken, except by a force much larger than that at his command, rode off at full speed with the survivors to Scindia's camp. No sooner had they gone than the horses were brought out from the stables, and the two officers, with ten of their troopers, rode off at full speed. Harry refused to accompany them, as he wished to see what had really happened, in order to carry the news to Nana. He therefore rode out to the farmhouse where he had before stayed, left his horse there, and returned to Pune. Here he heard that Rao Furke had been seized, and that Baji Rao's encampment was surrounded by troops, who suffered none to enter or leave it. The next morning he went over there and found that, as the supply of water had been cut off, the garrison had surrendered, all being allowed to depart, with the exception of Baji, over whom a strong guard had been placed. Before they left, Manaji Furke gave them all directions to gather in the neighborhood of Waii. They did so, and were joined at once by the two chiefs. Nana promptly sent them a supply of money, telling them to take up their position at the Salpi Ghat, where they were speedily joined by ten thousand men, and openly declared for Baji Rayo. In the meantime, Baloba, believing that the whole plot was the work of Baji Rayo, determined to dispatch him, as a prisoner, to a fortress in the heart of Scindia's dominions. He sent him off with a strong escort, under the charge of an officer named Sukaram Gatge, who, although having command of only a troop of one hundred horse, belonged to an ancient and honorable family. Balaba could hardly have made a worse choice. Gatge had a daughter who was reported to be of exceptional beauty, and the young Scindia had asked her father for her hand. Gatge, an ambitious and enterprising man, had given no decided answer, not from really any hesitation, for he saw how enormous would be the advantage to himself of such an alliance, but in order to increase Scindia's ardor by pretended opposition, and so to secure the best terms possible for himself. The reason he gave would appear natural to any Maratha of good blood, as none of these would have given her daughter of their house to one who, however high in rank, had ancestors belonging to a low caste. Upon the way, Baji, who was aware of Scindia's wishes, and was most anxious to obtain his goodwill, 
urged Gatke to give his daughter his marriage, and after much pretended hesitation, the latter agreed to do so, on condition that Baji would authorize him to promise Sindhya a large sum of money, as soon as he again ascended the Musnad, and that he would get the prince to appoint him his prime minister, which post would be vacant at the overthrow of Baloba. This being arranged, Baji Rayo pretended that he was seriously ill, and Gatke therefore halted, with his escort, on the banks of the Para. Taking with him his disguise as a countryman, Harry, as soon as he learned that Gatke had started with Baji, mounted and followed him, and travelled at some little distance in rear of the party, until they halted. Then he went to the house of a cultivator, left his horse there, and exchanged his dress as fighting man for that of a countryman. There was no occasion for him now to disguise his age or darken his eyes, and, as before, he hired a cart, bought some grain for forage, some sacks of rice and other things, and boldly entered Gatgay's camp. As the prices he asked were low, Gatgay purchased the whole contents of his cart. When this was cleared, Harry left his cattle and wandered about, saying that he and the animals needed an hour's rest. Presently he passed Baji Rayo, who was standing listlessly at the door of a tent. "'I am Pantoji,' Harry said as he passed. "'I followed you with the horse, that I might help you to escape.' "'Stay and talk to me here,' the young prince said. "'It will seem that I am only passing my time in asking you questions about the country.' "'I wanted to ascertain the road by which you will travel, after crossing the river.' I have money with me, and will endeavor to raise a force of forty or fifty men, with which to make a sudden attack upon your camp after nightfall. I will bring a good horse with me. If you will run out when you hear the uproar, I will ride up with the spare horse. You will leap on its back, and we can gallop off. You are a brave fellow, Puntoji, and I thank you heartily for your offer, but happily I stand in no need of it. I have gained Gatke over and he will linger here until we hear that Balaba has been arrested, and that Nana Furnuiz is approaching Pune. Believe me, I shall never forget your offer, or the fidelity that has prompted it, and when I am established as Peshwa, you shall, if it pleases you, have any post at court you may desire. I thank you much, Prince, but I am an officer of Nana, and know that, in acting as I have done, I am acting in his interest as well as yours. I am glad that the necessity for making an attack upon the camp is obviated. I might have had considerable trouble in raising a sufficient force for such a purpose, for even the most reckless would hesitate to fall on one of Scindia's officers, and in the next place, although I doubt not that I should have been able to carry you off, Gatgay would, as soon as he had beaten off the attacking party, have set out in pursuit, and raised the whole country, and the give difficulty of reaching the western ghats would have been immense. I hope to see your highness at Pune. End of section 9. Recording by Adelde Pinurolet. Section 10 of At the Point of the Bayonet, A Tale of the Maratha War by G. A. Henty. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. At the Point of the Bayonet, A Tale of the Maratha War by G. A. Henty. Chapter 5. Down to Bombay, Part 2. So saying, he strolled carelessly back to the bullock cart, waiting till the animals had finished their feed, and then drove off again returned the cart to its owner and started again for Pune. on his arrival there he went to the residency and informed mr mallet that baji had gained over the officer who was escorting him and was ready to come back to Pune as soon as the blow was struck it will be struck soon mr mallet said all is in readiness i sent your report on to the council urging that as it seemed likely that baji rao would soon be on the musnad they should express their readiness to recognize him. I received a dispatch only yesterday, saying that they perfectly agreed with me, and had already sent off a messenger to Nana, 
stating their willingness to recognize Bajee as lawful heir to the late Peishwa. Things are working well. The Nizam's general has been ordered to watch Persiram's bow, who is raising troops for the purpose of aiding and crushing Bajee's supporters. Holkar and Sindhya's troops also are in readiness to move, and, after the fate of the Dussera, the regular battalions in the Peishwa's service, commanded by Mr. Boyd, will march to the Nira Bridge, and a brigade of Sindhya's regulars will move against Regor. It is evident that neither Baloba nor Perserum has the slightest suspicion of what is going on, or they would never have dispatched troops from here. I certainly have felt very uneasy since Bajee was carried away, for he is a necessary figure, and should be here as soon as Nana arrives, otherwise there would be no recognized head. It would have been hopeless to try to deliver him, once imprisoned in one of the strong fortresses in Sindhya's dominions, and the latter could have made any terms for himself that he chose to dictate. Your news has relieved me of this anxiety, and I think it probable that everything will now be managed without bloodshed, and that we may, for a time, have peace here. The next morning, Harry rode off and rejoined Nana, who thanked him warmly for the manner in which he had carried out his mission, and especially for his offer to attempt to rescue Bajee from his captors. It would have been the greatest misfortune, he said, had he been carried far away. I should have been obliged to recognize his brother Chimnaji, and Sindhya, having Bajee in his hands, would have kept up a constant pressure, and might probably have marched to Pune to restore him, which he would certainly have succeeded in doing, for the feeling of the population would have been all in favor of the lawful heir. As a token of my satisfaction, here is an order upon my treasurer for fifty thousand rupees. All being ready, Sindhya, on the 27th of October, suddenly arrested Baloba, and sent a body of his troops, with those of the Nizam's general, for the purpose of seizing Perseron Bao. The latter, receiving news of what had happened in good time, and taking with him Chimnaji, fled to a fortress, but was quickly pursued and obliged to surrender. Baji Rao was brought back to Bima, eighteen miles from Pune. His brother Amrud and Rao Perke were also released. Nana joined his army at the Salpi Gout, and Sindhya's infantry under Mr. Boyd marched for the capital, which Nana refused to enter, however, until he had received a formal declaration from Bajee that he intended no treachery against him. This pledge was given, and a treaty was, at the same time, entered into by the Nizam and Sindhya, both agreeing to establish Bajee Rao on the Musnud, and reinstate Nana as his prime minister. These matters being settled, Nana returned to Pune, from which he had been absent for nearly a year, and resumed the duties of prime minister. A fortnight later, Bajee Rao was solemnly invested as Peishwa. One of his first acts was to send for Harry, to whom he gave a robe of honour, and thirty thousand rupees in money, in token of his gratitude for the risk he had run in communicating with him, and for his daring proposal to rescue him from the hands of his escort. On the day after Nana's re-entry into the capital, Harry received a note from Mr. Mallet, asking him to call. I expect Colonel Palmer to relieve me of my duties here in the course of a day or two, I need scarcely say I shall be glad to be released from a work which is surrounded with infinite difficulty, and which constantly upsets all human calculations. Nana is in power again, but another turn of the wheel may take place at any moment, and he may again be in exile, or possibly a prisoner. It seems to me that it will be well for you to accompany me to Bombay. The remembrance of your services will be fresh, and they cannot but be recognized by the council. That body is frequently changed, and in two or three years' time there will be fresh men who will know nothing of what has happened now, and will be indisposed to rake up old reports and letters, or to reward past services, especially as the whole position here may have altered half a dozen times before that. I will gladly do so, sir, and thank you very heartily for your kindness. I will ride over to Junir tomorrow, and bring my old nurse down with me and I have no doubt Sufta will be willing to accompany us. 
he has rendered good services to nana and the latter will i am sure grant him leave of absence for as long as may be necessary i think it would certainly be best to take them both down if possible they could make affidavits in bombay that would place it beyond doubt that you are major lindsay's son it is morally certain that there are relatives of your father and mother still living in england i do not say that you require any assistance from them but when you return home as every one does two or three times in the course of his indian service it would be pleasant to find friends there and it would be well that your position should be established beyond all question i will gladly go down with you soyera said when harry laid the matter before her i am happy and contented here but should be glad to see bombay again it was my home for ten years i am very glad you have made up your mind to go for it is time that you should take your place among your countrymen and the recommendation of the resident at the court of Pune is as good a one as you could wish for i should say that you had better give up at once staining your skin i can see that you have not used the dye for some days and it would be as well to recover your proper colour before mr mallet introduces you to the council at bombay i will ride down to the town harry said and engage a gharry a native carriage to carry you to Pune. when we get there i shall learn what route mr mallet will take and how fast he will travel and shall then see which will be the best for you to go down in a gharry or to be carried in a dooley a palanquin but all this will cost money harry i am well provided with funds harry said for the nana and baji rao have both made me handsome presents for the services i rendered them there is therefore no reason why we should not travel in comfort they arrived at Pune two days later and harry having ascertained that the new resident would not arrive until the next day and that he would probably wish mr mallet to defer his departure for at least two days in order to give him his experience of the factions and intrigues there and of the character of all those who were likely to influence events rode to see nana who had not yet returned to Pune. i have come your excellency he said to tell you that it is my wish to retire from the public service the minister looked greatly surprised why puntoji he said this sounds like madness young as you are you have secured powerful protectors both in the peishwa and myself and you may hope to reach a high office in the state as you grow older i do not know though he went on speaking to himself rather than to the lad that high office is a thing to be desired it means being mixed up in the intrigues of all kinds being the object of jealousy and hatred and running a terrible risk of ruin at every change in the government here then he turned again to harry and what are you thinking of doing i will speak frankly to your highness i am not a maratha as you and every one else suppose i am the son of english parents end of section 10 section 11 of at the point of the bayonet a tale of the maratha war by G. A. Henty. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. At the Point of the Bayonet A Tale of the Maratha War by G. A. Henty. Chapter 5 Down to Bombay, Part 3. It is a strange tale he said when harry brought the story to a conclusion and explains things which have at times surprised me in the first place the color of your eyes always struck me as peculiar then your figure is not that of my countrymen there are many as tall as you but they have not your width of shoulders and strong build lastly i have wondered how a young maratha should be endowed with so much energy and readiness be willing to take heavy responsibilities on his shoulders and be so full of resource now that you have told me your story i think you are right to go down and join your own people everything is disturbed and nothing is certain from day to day here i was a fugitive but a short time ago and ere long i may be in exile moreover no one can tell what may happen to him your people are quarrelling with tippoo 
as they quarrelled with his father Hyder, and I think that before long it is possible they will overthrow him and take possession of his territory Were the various powers of India united this could not be so But the English will always find some ready to enter into an alliance with them and will so enlarge their dominions the Marathas may laugh at the idea of their being overthrown by such small armies as those the English generals command But our constant dissensions and the mutual jealousy between Holkar Sindhya and the Peishwa the Raja of Berar and others will prevent our ever acting together It may be that we shall be conquered piecemeal. I Have watched very closely all that has taken place in southern India and in Bengal I have seen a handful of traders gradually swallowing up the native powers and it seems to me that it may well be that in time they may become the masters of all India Were I to say as much to any of our princes they would scoff at my prediction But it has been my business to learn what was passing elsewhere and I have agents at Madras and Calcutta and Their reports are ever that the power of the English is increasing a few years ago it seemed that the French were going to carry all before them But they like our native princes have gone down before the English who see moreover To get on better than the French with the natives and to win their respect and liking Well young sir I shall be sorry to lose you because while I and with good reason was seldom able to trust and To give my absolute confidence to any of those around me. I have always felt that I could wholly rely on you during the past year I have seen much of you and have freely told my plans to you as I have done to no others and have chosen you for missions that I could not with safety have entrusted to any of my own followers knowing that Sindhya or Holkar would be ready to pay great sums for these secrets none except Bajee to whom I sent you with particulars were aware of the extent of my plans or that I was in communication with more than one of the Rajas you have played your part marvelously well for I should not have deemed it possible that one of your race could live so long among us without exciting any suspicion While you remain in Bombay. I hope that you will act as my confidential agent I do not ask you to divulge any secrets you may learn Relating to projects connected with the Deccan, but I should like to be informed as to the course of affairs generally of course my dealings with the council there must be carried on through the English resident But there is much information respecting the views of the council with regard to Tipu the Nizam and Bengal that will be valuable for me to know I Could not so act your excellency without permission from the council But I should imagine that they would not be averse to such an arrangement especially as perhaps you would give me private information as to the state of parties here such as you would not care to tell their resident Certainly I would do so they change their residence so frequently that it would be impossible for new men to really understand the situation Which you with your intimate knowledge of Pune could readily grasp of course the arrangement could only be temporary as my own position is so uncertain and In any case my life cannot now be a long one I Should propose that your salary as my private agent be a thousand rupees a month I thank you much sir and if I stay at Bombay and obtain the permission of the council to correspond with you I will readily undertake the part they can have little objection to the arrangement as doubtless you have agents in Bombay already Certainly I have but these are natives and necessarily can only send me the rumors current in the bazaars or known generally to the public and their news is for the most part worthless I have another favor to request Harry said namely that you will give leave of absence to Sufta in order that he may accompany me to Bombay He and my old nurse could alone substantiate my birth and identity And it would be necessary for them to give their evidence before some legal authority That I will do readily Sufta is honest and faithful and I can rely upon him absolutely for anything in his fear of duty and Have only today appointed him to the command of 200 men but although he has a hand ready to strike he has no brain capable of planning Had it not been so I should before this have raised him to a higher position When he returns from Bombay, I will grant him the revenues of a village 
of which he shall be the patal a mare so that in his old age he will be able to live in comfort on leaving the minister harry went to sufder's camp so you are back again puntoji yes and have brought soyera down with me i have great news to tell you the soldier went on it will not be news to me sufder i know that your command has been doubled and that you will now be the captain of two hundred men but i can tell you much more than that you are to accompany me down to bombay the day after tomorrow so as to give evidence about my birth and furthermore nana will on your return bestow upon you the jakir revenue of a village district so that as he says when you grow too old for service you will be able to live comfortably that is good news indeed better even than i am to have the command of two hundred men for in truth i am beginning to be weary of service i am now nearly fifty and i feel myself growing stiff nothing would please me more than to be the patal of a village community of which i hold the jack here however so long as nana lives and retains power i shall remain a soldier but at his death i shall serve no other master and shall take to country life again does nana know that you are english yes i have told him my story i was obliged to give my reasons for resigning and as nana has the support of the government of bombay there was no risk in my doing so how long will it be before i quite get rid of this colour soufta that i cannot say i should think that in a fortnight the greater part of it will have faded out but maybe soyera knows of something that will remove it more rapidly soyera when asked said that she knew of nothing that would remove the dye at once but that if he washed his hands and face two or three times a day with a strong lye made from the ashes of a plant that grows everywhere on the plain it would help to get rid of it i will go out tomorrow morning and fetch some in when she had made the lye and mixed it with oil it made a very strong soap how do you mean to dress to go down harry i have no choice but even if i had i should ride out of here in my best court suit and change it for english clothes when we got down the gorts i may have to come up here again for aught i know and it is better therefore that no one should know that i am english mr mallet however solved the difficulty for when in the evening harry went to inquire about the time that they would start he said i have been thinking of offering you a suit to ride down in but unfortunately my clothes would be a great deal too small for you however i think that after all it is best you should go down as you are in the first place you would not show to advantage in english clothes in which you would feel tight and uncomfortable at first and in the second place i think that it is perhaps as well that the council should see you as you are then they will the better understand how you have been able to pass as a Maratha all these years End of section 11section 12 of at the point of the bayonet a tale of the maratha war by g a henty this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org at the point of the bayonet a tale of the maratha war chapter 5 down to bombay part 4 I will introduce you now to Colonel Palmer. It is important that he should know you, for possibly you may be sent up here on some mission or other, for which, having the favor of Nana, you would be specially fitted. Accordingly, the next morning they started early. Sawyera had prepared the liquid soap, but as it was decided that he should go in native dress, Harry thought it as well not to use it, especially as the dye was gradually wearing off. The party consisted of Mr. Mallet, Sufter, and Harry, with an escort of ten cavalrymen belonging to one of the native regiments. The mission clerk had been transferred to Colonel Palmer, as his knowledge of affairs would be useful to the newcomer. Sawyer was carried in a dooley and followed close behind the troopers. That evening they descended the ghats into the Concan and encamped there, 
and on the following day rode into bombay where mr mallet took them to a hotel principally used by natives of rank visiting bombay you had best stay here till i send for you he said to harry i shall see some of the council to-night no doubt there will be a formal meeting to-morrow to ask my opinion about the probability of the present state of things continuing at Pune. i shall of course tell them your story and they will likely request you to go at once to see them therefore do not leave the hotel until you hear from me sufter had not previously visited bombay and the next morning early he went out with soyera as his guide to inspect the european part of the town he was much struck with the appearance of neatness and order in the fort and the solidity of the buildings it is a strong place assuredly he said to harry on his return in the first place it would be necessary for a force attacking to cross over the narrow isthmus and causeway uniting the island with the land and that would be impossible in face of a force provided with artillery guarding it then if they succeeded in winning that they would have to make their way through the native town to get on to the maiden and this would be defended by the guns from all the batteries and in addition to the artillery on land it might be swept by guns on board ship truly those who talked about driving the english into the sea cannot have known anything of the strength of the position as to carrying it by assault it could not be done nor could the garrison be starved out since they could always obtain supplies of all sorts by sea and yet except at the causeway the place has no natural strength the marathas acted unwisely indeed when they allowed the english to settle here they could not foresee the future sufter now doubtless they are sorry but if in the future the british become masters of india the marathas will have no reason to regret having given them a foothold wherever their powers extend the natives are far better off than they were under the rule of their own princes were the british masters there would be no more wars no more jealousies and no more intrigues the peasants would till their fields in peace and the men who now take to soldiering would find more peaceful modes of earning a living but do you not think surely harry for after leaving Pune, he had been told to call him so that the english can ever become masters of india they conquered the carnatic but even there they were not safe from the forays of hyder ali mysore bars their way farther north then there is the nizam to be dealt with and then berar and the marathas and then comes rajputana and beyond are the sikhs and the fierce chiefs of sind it is true that the english have beaten the people of lower bengal but these have always been looked down upon and despised as cowardly and effeminate by the fighting men of all india besides how few are the white soldiers they say too that the french have promised tippoo to send a big army to help drive the english into the sea the french have quite work enough at home harry said it is true they have got into egypt but they are shut up there by our fleets moreover even were they to cross over into arabia how could they march across a dry and almost waterless country for a thousand or two or miles when they arrived in Sindhi, they would find all the fighting men of the province and the sikhs opposed to them and they would never be able to fight their way down to mysore the thing is absurd the conversation was interrupted by the arrival of a messenger from the government house with a request that mr lindsay should at once attend there harry's horse which had been saddled in readiness was brought round for it would have seemed strange for a mahratta whose dress showed that he held a good position to go on foot sufter rode by his side soyera followed on foot dismounting at the government house he threw the reins to one of the lads who were waiting in readiness to hold the horses of officers coming to see the governor on harry mentioning his name the native doorkeeper said i have orders for you to be taken at once to the council chamber sahib on your arrival here the governor with four members of the council and mr Mallette, was seated at a long table mr Mallette rose and said this is mr lindsay gentlemen 
Truly, sir, it would be difficult to recognize you as a fellow countryman in that garb, the governor said, though your color is somewhat less dark than that of a Maratha. Since I left Pune, I have ceased to die, sir. As to my dress, this will be the last time I shall wear it, unless I should be called upon to go to Pune again. Your story is a most singular one, the governor said, but Mr. Mallet assures us that you are the son of Major Lindsay, and has been telling us how you escaped the massacre at the camp, and how your ayah has brought you up. She has come down with me, sir. I thought that her testimony would be necessary, and I have also brought down her cousin, who was present at the foray in which my father and mother were killed. My account will be confirmed by their statements. You do credit to Maratha food and training, Mr. Lindsay, but Mr. Millet has mentioned to me that at one time you were employed as a shikari to keep down the tigers which were doing havoc among the villagers near the top of the ghats. He has also informed us of the very valuable service you rendered by informing him of Nana Fernui's measures for regaining power and replacing Baji Rao on the Musnad. Intelligence was saved us a great expenditure of money in preparing to support him, with the certainty that by doing so we might excite the enmity of Scindia. He tells us also why you continued so long in the Deccan instead of coming down here and I think you acted very wisely. We have mentioned your services in that matter in our reports to the Board of Directors, and have said that partly as a recognition of this, and partly because you are the son of an English officer who was killed in their service, we should at once give you an appointment subject to their approval. Now, sir, which would you prefer, the civil or military branch? I should very much prefer the military, Harry answered without hesitation, unless indeed, sir, you think my services would be more useful in the civil. If we were at Calcutta or Madras, there would be more scope for you in the civil service. But as we hold at present little territory beyond this island, there are therefore but few appointments affording an opportunity for the display of the intelligence which you certainly possess. But should our circumstances alter, you might owing to your knowledge of the country and its language, be told off for civil work, in which the emoluments are very much higher than in the military branch of the service. You will at once be gazetted to the third native cavalry, and do duty with the regiment until your services are required elsewhere. Fresh disturbances may break out at Pune, and in that case you might be attached as assistant to Colonel Palmer. Do you think you would be known again? I think it would be very unlikely, sir, when my skin has recovered its proper color, and I am dressed in uniform. I feel sure no one would recognize me as having been an officer in the Peshwa's court. Very well, sir. Then you will see your name in the Gazette tomorrow. You will, within a day or so, report yourself to the officer commanding the regiment. I may say that it would be well if your nurse and the man who came down with you were to draw up statements concerning your birth and swear to them at the high court. These might be valuable to you in the future. After expressing his thanks to the governor and council, Harry went out and rode back to the hotel with Sufter. End of section 12section 13 of at the point of the bayonet a tale of the maratha war by g a henty this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org at the point of the bayonet a tale of the maratha war chapter 6 in the company's service part 1 there was no conversation between Harry and Sufter on the way back to the hotel, Harry saying that he would tell the news when Sawyera joined them, otherwise he would have to go through it twice. They rode slowly through the streets, and Sawyera arrived a few minutes after them. Now, Harry said, we will go up to my room and talk the matter over. 
Mr. Millet has been kind enough to give such a favorable report of me that I am appointed lieutenant to the 3rd Regiment of Native Cavalry, and should be employed as assistant to the resident at Pune, should there be fresh disturbances there. That is good fortune indeed, Sufter said. Wonderfully good fortune, and I owe it all in the first place to Soyera, and in the next to yourself. You see, I have gained greatly by taking your advice, and remained in the Deccan until fit for military service. Had she declared who I was when she took me down to Bombay before, there is no saying what might have become of me. And now the first thing to do is for me to go out and order a uniform. When I return, I will draw up in Marathi and in English a full account of the manner in which I was saved by Soyera and you from being murdered and how I have been brought up. Harry had learned at the governor's the name and address of an official at the judge's court who would get his statements copied out in proper form and writing. And when he had taken them down from the lips of Sufter and Soyera, he saw this gentleman who promised that the documents should be ready by the next day. Having thus put his business in train, Harry went to call upon Mrs. Sankey. She did not recognize him at once, but as soon as he made himself known, she received him most warmly. You looked as if you would grow into a big fellow, but I hardly expected that you would have done it so soon. It is more than four years since I left you. I don't think that I'm likely to grow any taller than I am, although, of course, I shall get broader. He then told her what had happened since he left her, and how he had just been appointed an officer in a native cavalry regiment. I am very glad you've come now. My daughters have both married, and I'm going to sail for England in a few days. Whether I shall stay there permanently or come back, I cannot say, but at any rate I shall be away at least two years. I should have been very sorry to have missed you, Mrs. Sankey. I have always looked back with the greatest pleasure at the time I spent here. You have kept up your English well, she said. I have followed your advice, and hardly ever missed reading aloud for an hour so as to keep my tongue accustomed to it, and I know many of Shakespeare's plays by heart, and could recite a great many passages from the writings of Dean Swift, Mr. Addison, Mr. Savage, and others. His next visit was to Jimaji who received him with real pleasure when he told him who he was. Harry had not learned, nor did he ever learn, that the kindly Parsee had contributed a hundred pounds toward the expenses of his education. But he did know that he had presented him with his outfit of clothes and had been the means of his being placed with Mrs. Sankey, and during the months he remained at Bombay he paid frequent visits to the man who had so befriended him. The next day he went with Safter and Soyera, who swore to their statements before the judge of the high court. As soon as his uniform was ready, Harry went to his regiment, which was encamped on the Maidan between the fort and the native town, and was introduced to the colonel. "'I've come to report myself, sir,' he said to the colonel. "'My name is Lindsay.' "'I was expecting you,' the colonel said, "'for Mr. Mollette came in this morning and told me about you.' saying that you would most likely come either today or tomorrow. I will have a tent pitched for you this afternoon, and a soldier told off as your servant. Of course, at first you will have to go through the somewhat unpleasant task of learning your drill. From what Mr. Mallette told me, I think you are not likely to be much with us, as from your perfect knowledge of Marathi and of the country, you can do better service in a staff appointment than with the regiment. You are much fairer than they had given me to expect. I have been hard at work for the last two days in getting rid of the dyes with which I have been coloured ever since I was an infant. Ah, you are not very noticeably darker now than any other officer in the regiment. Now I will hand you over to the adjutant. You will, of course, mess with us today, and I can then introduce you to your brother officers. The adjutant was sent for and soon entered. Mr. Lewis, the colonel said, this is Mr. Lindsay, who was gazetted to us two days ago. He will be very useful to us if we go up to Pune again, of which there is always a possibility, for he speaks Marathi like a native, having lived among the people since he was an infant. He is the son of Major Lindsay, who was killed here at the time of the advance on Pune. 
You will be a great acquisition to us, the adjutant said, as he left the tent with Harry. Most of us speak a little Marathi, but it'll be very useful to have one of us who is perfect in that way. Of course, you have not got your full kit yet, but you'll want a mess jacket and waistcoat. These I can lend you till you get your own made. They are ordered already, and I'm to get them in a couple of days. It was so much more important that I should get the undress uniform to enable me to begin work that I did not press the tailor quite so much as to the other clothes. Are you ready to begin work at once? The sooner the better, Harry replied. Then I shall hand you over to the native officer who has charge of the drilling of recruits. There is a small yard behind the barracks where Europeans are instructed in the first stages. To see them doing the goose step would not add to the respect the soldiers have for their white officers. They are therefore taught such matters in private, so that when they come out for company drill, they are not quite at sea. Half an hour later, Harry was at work under the instructions of a native officer. By the time he had finished, a tent had been erected for him, and he was glad to find a bath ready, for it was much warmer down in Bombay than above the Ghats, and it had been hot work drilling. The adjutant had chosen a Marathi servant, and the man's surprise when the newly joined officer addressed him in his own language was great. As Mr. Millette had told him that except when on duty the officers generally wore civilian clothes, he had purchased several white suits, consisting of jacket and trousers, as these were kept in stock by a Parsee tailor, and he put on one of these with a white shirt after he had finished his bath. He had scarcely done so when a bugle sounded. "'That is the call for Tiffin, Sahib,' Abdul said. "'Do the officers go in uniform?' no sahib not to this meal just at this moment the adjutant came in come along lindsay he said i thought i would come round for you it's rather trying going into a room full of strangers there were some twelve officers gathered in the mess tent and the adjutant introduced harry to them singly they were all curious to see him having heard from the colonel who had summoned them to the tent a quarter of an hour before the bugle sounded some particulars of his life and how he had been at once appointed to be lieutenant without going through the usual term as a cadet as a reward for important services their first impression of him was a favorable one he was now nearly six feet in height with a powerful and well-knit frame his face was pleasant and good-tempered and although the features were still boyish there was an expression of restraint and determination that had been acquired from the circumstances in which he had been placed. He had seen the barbarous splendor of the entertainments at the Peshwa's court, but nothing like the well-ordered table now before him, with its snow-white cloth, its bright silver, and perfect appointments. When the meal was over, the colonel said, "'As duty is over for the day, I think it would be most interesting if Mr. Lindsay would give us an account of his life and adventures.' As you are all here, it would save him the trouble of going over his story again and again, for you are all, I am sure, like myself, anxious to know how it was that he has been able all these years to pass as a Maratha among Marathas. There was a general expression of agreement. Cheroots were lighted, and Harry told his story with some detail. When he had finished, the colonel said, I am sure we are all obliged to you, Lindsay. You've had a remarkable experience, and few of us have, in the course of our lives, gone through anything like the same amount of adventures. To have been, at your age, a peasant boy, an English schoolboy, a shikaree, an officer in the Peshwa's court, a confidential agent of Nana Fernuiz, and now a British officer, is indeed wonderful. It speaks volumes for your intelligence and discretion." I cannot take the whole credit to myself, sir. I had two good friends. My nurse, not content with saving my life, taught me English, instructed me in the ways of our people, and even in their religion, and continually urged me to exercise myself in every way, so that when, some day, I left her, I should in bodily strength and activity not be inferior to others, and, aided by her brother, expended all her savings of years in having me educated here. 
Next to her I owe much to Sufder, who first taught me the use of arms, and then presented me to Nana. Without such an introduction, I must, had I entered the Mahratta service at all, have gone as a private soldier, instead of obtaining at once a post at court. To Mrs. Sankey I owe very much for the kindness she showed me, and the pains she took with me, and I owe much too to Mr. Jimaji, the Parsee merchant. Yes, you owe much to both of them, the colonel said, but their teaching and advice would not have gone for much, had it not been for your own energy and for the confidence you inspired in the Peshwa's minister. What are you going to do about your nurse? We have not quite arranged as yet, sir, but she will at any rate remain here for a time. She loves me as a mother, and I think that so long as I am quartered here she will remain. She has already found a lodging at the house of a woman of the same caste as herself, and tells me that she is sure she will be comfortable with her. If we move, and all goes on quietly in the Deccan, she will return to her brother's, where she is thoroughly at home and happy. And Sufter? He will return in the course of a week or so. He is greatly interested in what he sees here, especially in the shipping, never having seen the sea before. I think that probably he will remain for two or three years with his troop of two hundred men, and will then settle in the village of which and the surrounding country he has received the jag here. This, although not large, will suffice for him to live in comfort. It is but a few miles from Junior, and he will therefore be able to be near his friends and pay frequent visits to his cousin Ramdas. In a short time Harry became a general favourite, and made the acquaintance of the officers of the regiment in the garrison, for his romantic story speedily circulated, and before he had been a fortnight in the city he had received invitations to dine at all their messes. After the exciting life he had led for two years, he felt, on being released from drill, that life in a garrison town was dull and monotonous. The simple habits in which he had been brought up did not help him to enjoy heavy meals at regimental mess. Occasionally, he and two or three other officers crossed to the mainland and had some shooting in the wild district of the Concan. But he was pleased when he received an order from the governor to call upon him. Colonel Palmer, he said, has written requesting me to send him an assistant as matters do not seem to be going on well at Pune. He suggested that you from your acquaintance with the people and their intrigues, should be selected for the post. But even had he not done so, I should have chosen you as being better fitted for it than any other officer here. Your instructions are simple. You will watch and endeavour to penetrate the schemes of the various factions, and assist Colonel Palmer generally. Am I to go up in my uniform, sir, or to wear a disguise similar to that in which I came down here? that is a matter over which i have been thinking i have come to the conclusion that you will be more likely to obtain intelligence in native garb all parties look with jealousy upon us and would be chary of giving any information to an officer of the residency and therefore if you have no objection we think that it will be an advantage to you to assume native dress of course you could not go in the attire that you came down in for although you would not be recognized in uniform you would if dressed as before i would rather leave that matter entirely to you and also the manner in which you can proceed you must also decide for yourself whether to renew your connection with nana fernuiz it appears to me that he is the only honest man in the deccan and the only man who takes the patriotic view that there should be peace and rest throughout the country he is, however, no more willing than others that we should in any way interfere in the affairs of the Deccan. That certainly is so, sir, but I know that it is his most earnest desire to possess the friendship of the authorities of Bombay. He has frequently told me that he is a great admirer of the English, of their methods of government, and of the straightforwardness and sincerity with which they conduct their business. But he is afraid of them. He sees that, where they once make an advance, they never retire, and is convinced that, if they obtained a footing above the Gorts, there would be no turning them out, and that their influence would be supreme. Very well, Mr. Lindsay. 
you showed such discretion and judgment during your residence at Pune that i am well content to believe the matter in your hands the appointment as assistant to colonel palmer will carry with it a civil allowance of three hundred rupees a month of course all necessary expenses will be paid and should you find it expedient to use a certain amount of bribery to obtain the news we require in other quarters besides that of the minister you will refer the matter to the resident you will of course give your reports to colonel palmer and will be under his orders generally he will be requested to further your special mission in every way in his power when shall i start sir as soon as you like mr lindsay i shall be ready sir as soon as the clothes are made for me i must have one or two disguises of various kinds to use as most desirable some of these i can no doubt buy ready made perhaps all of them if so i will start at daylight tomorrow very well mr lindsay i shall be sending up a dispatch to colonel palmer and it will be left at your tent this evening on leaving the government house harry went to see soyera scarcely a day had passed since he came to bombay without his paying her a visit i am off again to Pune, he said i do not know how long i shall be away it must depend upon what is going on up there of course i should be glad to have you with me but that would hamper my movements i shall naturally see sufter as soon as i get there but what are you going for will you travel as an officer no i shall be in disguise it seems that things are unsettled and i am if possible to find out the intentions of the various leaders and communicate them privately to our resident i shall have to take to dyeing my skin again which is a nuisance but it cannot be helped i shall take with me three or four different disguises and get you to do the shopping for me i wish to have them by this evening as i shall start in the morning early i shall get leave to take my soldier servant abdul with me he's a sharp fellow and may be useful i shall have to buy a pony for him what sort of disguises do you want one is that of a native soldier but that is easy enough as it differs but little from the ordinary mahratta's dress one would certainly be the attire of a trader in good circumstances i can't think at present of any other i should say the dress of a brahmin might be useful soyera suggested yes that would give me an entry unquestioned to nana or to any other person of importance by nightfall soyera had bought the three disguises and obtained from a native dyer a supply of stain sufficient for a long time and harry had purchased two useful ponies for himself and his servant at mess that evening the colonel said so you're going to leave us for a time mr lindsay i have received a letter from the governor requesting me to put you in orders tomorrow as seconded from the regiment for civil employment i won't ask you where you're going that is no business of ours but i'm sure i can say in the name of my officers as well as myself that we shall all miss you very much a murmur of acquiescence passed round the table and seeing that harry in thanking the colonel made no allusion to what he was going to do they followed the example of their superior officer and abstained from asking any questions i should like to take my man abdul with me colonel harry said later on he's a sharp fellow and i might find him very useful by all means i will tell the adjutant that i have allowed him to go with you i am not going in uniform nor are you to do so harry said to abdul when he returned to his tent i am going in mahratta dress and i shall take a lodging in the town and pass as a native i know abdul that you're a sharp fellow and feel certain that i can depend upon you you can certainly depend upon me sahib you've been a kind master and i would do anything for you what part of the country do you come from abdul from rajapur in the Konkan, sahib i had no fancy for working in the fields so i left and took service with the company i have never regretted it i have been a great deal better off than if i had enlisted in the army of one of the great chiefs the pay is higher and we are very much better treated well abdul when this business which i am now starting on is over i shall recommend you for promotion and in any case will make you a present of three months pay End of section 13
Section 14 of At the Point of the Bayonet, A Tale of the Maratha War by G. A. Henty. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. At the Point of the Bayonet, A Tale of the Maratha War. Chapter 6. In the Company's Service, Part 2. The next morning they started at daybreak. When a few miles out of town they took off their uniforms, and Harry put on the dress of a trader. There was no occasion for any disguise for Abdul, who, like all the native troops, was accustomed, after drill was over for the day, to put on native garments. The uniforms were then folded up and stowed in the wallets behind the saddles. They had brought with them a good supply of grain for their horses, and provisions for themselves, so that they might not have to stop at any village. They rode at a steady pace, and mounted the ghats by eleven o'clock. Then they waited three hours to feed and rest the animals, and just as the sun was setting, entered Pune, having accomplished a journey of fifty miles. Knowing the place so well, Harry rode to a quiet street near the bazaar, and seeing an old man at one of the doors, asked him if he knew of anyone who could afford accommodation for him and his servant. "'I can do that myself,' the man said. "'I am alone in the house. Two merchants who have been staying here left me yesterday, and I can let you have all the house except one room for myself. You have no stables, I suppose?' no sahib but there is an outhouse which would hold the two horses there was a little haggling over the terms for it would have been altogether contrary to indian usages to have agreed to any price without demur and finally the matter was arranged at a price halfway between that which the man demanded and that offered by harry and in a short time they were settled in the two rooms of the second floor Harry then went out and bought two thick quilted cushions used as mattresses and two native blankets. They had still provisions enough for the evening. The furniture was scanty, consisting of a raised bed place or divan, two tables raised about a foot from the ground, brass basins, and large earthenware jars of water. Harry, however, was too well accustomed to it to consider such accommodation insufficient. Tomorrow, he said, I will get a carpet for sitting upon, and you will have to get copper vessels for cooking. Abdul presently went out and returned with two large bundles of forage for the horses. Soon afterwards they lay down feeling stiff and tired from their unaccustomed exertions. The next morning Harry went to the residency. He had again painted cast marks on his face which completely changed his appearance telling the guard that he had come from bombay and had a message for colonel palmer he was shown in you bring a message for me the colonel said shortly for he was at the time writing a dispatch yes sir harry answered in marathi i have come to be your assistant well then you are mr lindsay the resident exclaimed dropping his pen and rising to his feet i received a dispatch yesterday saying that you were coming of course i remember you now having seen you on the day i came up here but your dress is altogether different and the expression of your face seems so changed that is the result of my having adopted different cast marks larger than they were before with lines that almost cover my forehead i did not expect you to come in disguise the governor thought colonel that i might be of greater service in finding out what was passing in the town and in going elsewhere were i to come up as a native to an officer of the residency all parties would keep their lips sealed i thoroughly agree with you the resident said your disguise differs so much from your former appearance that i do not think any of your acquaintances of those days would be likely to recognize you at present i am supposed to be a trader but i have with me the dress of a peasant or small cultivator which i used when i went into scindia's camp i have also the dress of a brahmin one of the better class which i thought if necessary would enable me to enter the house of nana or other leaders without exciting surprise i also have my uniform with me i am staying at present in the street that faces the market at the house of a man named nehru i myself am baskur 
I have a soldier's servant with me, on whom I can confidently rely, and I will send him with a chit when I have any news to give you, and you can send me word at what hour I had better call. Now, Colonel, I am at your orders, and if you will indicate to me the nature of the news which you wish me to gain, or the person whom you want watched, I will do the best I can. At present I know nothing of any changes that have taken place since I left here. The only event that is publicly known is that while the Peshwa has carried out his engagement with Sindhya and with the Raja of Berar, he refused to ratify any treatment with the Nizam, and the consequence is that the latter's general quitted Pune without taking leave of Baji Rao, and returned in great indignation to Hyderabad. This matter might have been smoothed over if Sindhya had intervened, or if the Peshwa had made suitable advances to the Nizam but he has not done so. There is no doubt that he thoroughly dislikes Nana Firmnuiz, and instead of being grateful to him for having placed him on the throne, he would gladly weaken his power. At any rate, it was Nana who formed the Confederacy, and I know that his greatest wish is to keep it intact and to secure peace to the country. Moreover, matters have been further complicated by the death of Holkar. He left two sons behind him, Kasi and Molhar. Unfortunately, Kasi is next door to an imbecile, while Molhar was a bold and able prince. The brothers quarrelled. Two half-brothers took the part of Molhar, who left his brother's camp with a small body of troops, and took up his abode at a village just outside the city, and was, I believe, favoured by Nana, whose interest naturally was to have an active and able prince as ruler of Holkar's dominions. Sindhya, who was, I suspect, delighted at this quarrel in Holkar's camp, supported Kasi, and sent a body of troops to arrest Molhar, who, refusing to surrender, maintained a desperate defense until he was killed. Jeswant went to Nagpur, and Wituji fled to Kolapur. But they were almost the only adherents of Molhar who effected their escape. So matters stand at present. The fact that the imbecile, Kasi, owes his elevation to Sindhya will naturally give the latter a predominating influence over him. And thus, you see, the Confederacy has gone completely to pieces. The Nizam is estranged. The Raja of Berar has gone home to Nagpur. Holkar's power is, for the time, subservient to Sindhya. And Nana Furnuiz is therefore deprived of all those who aided to bring him back to power. You are well known to Nana, are you not? Yes, Colonel. He was kind enough to place a good deal of confidence in me. Then I think you cannot do better than to see him, to begin with, and gather his views on the matter. I myself have heard nothing from him for some time. He knows that the company are well disposed towards him, but he also knows that they can give him no assistance in a sudden crisis. But surely, Colonel, Baji Rao, who owes everything to him, will not desert him. My opinion of the Peshwa is that he is a man without a spark of good feeling, that he has neither conscience nor gratitude, and would betray his own brother if he thought that he would obtain any advantage by so doing. He is a born schemer, and his sole idea of politics is to play off one faction against another. I would rather take the word of a man of the lowest class than the oath a Baji Rao. I am sorry to hear it, sir. He seemed to me to be a fine fellow with many accomplishments, his handsome face and figure and winning manner. His manner is part of his stock in trade, the colonel said angrily. He is a born actor and can deceive for a time even those who are perfectly aware of his unscrupulous character. Remember one thing, Mr. Lindsay, that if you're in any difficulty or a tumult breaks out in the city, You'd best make your way here at once. A trooper of my escort was thrown from his horse and killed the other day, and if you attire yourself in his uniform, you will pass for one of them. Whatever happens, they are not likely to be touched. Both parties wish to stand well with me. Even were it found out that you are an Englishman, you would be safely sheltered here, for I should claim you as my assistant and an officer in our army, and declare truthfully that you would only assume this guise in order to ascertain for me the feelings of the populace. 
Thank you, sir. I will certainly come here as soon as any serious trouble begins. That evening, after rubbing off the caste marks and assuming those of a Brahmin, and putting on the dress suitable for it, padding it largely to give him the appearance of a stout and bulky man, he went to Nana's house. Will you tell the minister, he said to the doorkeeper, that Kawar Seen, a Brahmin of the Kishitri caste, desires to speak to him? The man gave the message to one of the attendants, who in two or three minutes returned, and asked Harry to follow him. The minister was alone. "'What have you to say to me, holy man?' he inquired. And then, looking more fixedly at his visitor, he exclaimed, "'Why, it is Pontuji!' "'You are right, Nana. I am sent here to ascertain, if possible, what is going on, and how things are likely to tend. But first I must tell you that I am now here as Colonel Palmer's assistant. I will take you entirely into my confidence, Nana said. Until you told me that you were an Englishman when you took leave of me two years ago, I could not quite understand why it was that I felt I could confide in you more than in the older men around me. I esteem the English highly, and especially admire them for their honesty and truthfulness. You at once impressed me as one possessing such qualities, and now that I know you are English, I can understand the feeling that you inspired. I am glad you have come. No doubt your government is well informed as to the state of affairs here. I feel the power slipping from my hands, without seeing any way by which I can recover my lost ground. Scindia is solely under the domination of Gottgay, whose daughter he will shortly marry. I have, of course, made it my business to inquire as to the antecedents of this man. I find that he has the reputation of being a brutal ruffian, remarkably alike for his greed and his cruelty. A worse adviser Scindia could not have. Holkar was but a poor reed to lean upon, for he was as weak in mind as in body. But at any rate, he was a true friend of mine, and now that he has been succeeded by one even more imbecile than himself, and who is but a puppet in the hands of Scindia, to whose troops he owes his ascension, his power and his dominions are practically Scindia's. There can be no doubt whatever that Baji Rao is acting secretly with Scindia. That is to say, he is pretending so to act, for he is a master of duplicity, and even where his own interests are concerned, seems to be unable to carry out honestly any agreement that he has made. I am an old man, Mr. Lindsay, and can no longer struggle as I did two years ago against fate, nor indeed do I see any means of contending against such powerful enemies. The Raja of Berar, although well disposed towards me, could not venture alone to support me against the united power of Scindia and Holkar, backed by that of the Peshwa. There is but one direction in which I could seek for help, namely from the government of Bombay, but even this, were it given, would scarcely avail much against the power of my enemies, and even were I sure that it could do so, I would not call it in. My aim through life has been to uphold the power of the Peshwa, and to lessen that of Scindia and Holkar, and by playing one against the other to avert the horrors of civil war. Were I to call in the aid of the English, I should be acting in contradiction to the principles that I have ever held. The arrival of a force of English here would at once unite the whole of the Marathas against them, as it did when at last they ascended the Ghats and believing as i do in their great valour and discipline which has been amply shown by the conduct of scindia's infantry which are mainly officered by europeans it is beyond belief that they can withstand the whole power of the mahratta empire but granting that they might do so what would be the result i should see my country shaken to the centre the capital in the hands of strangers and to what end simply that i an old worn-out man should for a very few years remain in power here it would be necessary for those who placed me there to remain as my guardians and i should be a mere cipher in their hands nothing therefore would persuade me to seek english aid to retain me in power 
but the english would doubtless act in alliance with the nizam and probably with the rajahs of Burrah and kolapur possibly they might do so but what would be the result each of these leaders would in return for his aid bargain for increased territory at the expense of the peshwa and i who believe that i am trusted by the great mass of the people here should become an object of execration at having brought the invaders into our country no mr lindsay my enemies can and i believe will capture me and throw me into prison they will scarcely take my life or to do so would excite a storm of indignation but i always carry poison about with me and if they applied torture as a preliminary to death i have the power of releasing myself from their hands are you established at the residency no sir i am living in disguises of which i have several in the town in that way i can better discover what is going on than if i were in uniform as assistant to colonel palmer should there be a tumult in the city or if i find that my disguise has been detected i can make for the residency and either put on my uniform and declare my true character or attire myself as one of the residents escort come here as often as you can nana said i shall always be glad to see you it is a relief to speak to one of whose friendship i feel secure as a brahmin you can pass in and out without suspicion and i will always tell you how matters stand i have not yet spoken nana of my work as your agent in bombay I have sent you reports from time to time, but there was nothing in them that could be of any value to you. At present, the attentions of the authorities of Bombay, Madras, and Calcutta are centered upon the probability of war with Mysore. Tipu has continually broken the conditions under which he made peace with us six years ago, and it is known that he is preparing for war. He has received with honor many Frenchmen and is in communication with the french government and believes that he will be supported by an army under general bonaparte and as it is certain that when the war breaks out again it will need the fighting strength of the three towns to make head against the army of mysore as far as i have been able to learn they have given but little attention to the state of affairs in the deccan i have therefore been able to furnish you with no useful information beyond telling you that the sympathies of the governor and the council are wholly with you and that they consider that the fact of your being in power here secures them from any trouble with the marathas therefore sir i have put aside the allowance you have given me considering that i have in no way earned it and have written this order upon the bankers with whom i have placed it authorizing them to pay the money to any one you may depute to receive it and he handed the letter to the nana the latter took it and without opening it tore it up your offer does you honor mr lindsay but it is impossible for me to accept it your information has not been without advantages i have foreseen that the nizam would probably enter into an alliance with your people and that the very large increase that he has made in his battalions under foreign officers was intended to make his alliance more valuable i however have not deemed it necessary to imitate his example and that of scindia by raising a similar force your communications therefore have been of real value and have saved a large outlay here but even had it not been so there can be no question of your returning your pay you undertook certain work and you have to the best of your powers carried it out and it is not because you consider that the information you sent me is not sufficiently valuable that you have in any way failed to carry out your part of the contract i consider it of very great value in the first place because as i have said it relieved me from anxiety as to the nizam's intentions of increasing his army and in the second place it eased my mind by showing that neither scindia nor holkar was intriguing with bombay which knowledge is worth a crore of rupees to me it is the first time sir i have taken part in politics that any one has offered to return money he has received on the ground that he had not sufficiently earned it or indeed upon any other ground whatever your doing so has confirmed my opinion of the honesty of your people and i would that such a feeling were common among my countrymen here 
no negotiations can be carried on no alliance can be formed without a demand for a large sum of money or for an addition of territory all our petty wars are waged not on a question of principle but entirely from greed let us say no more about it i am as of course you have heard a very wealthy man and have so distributed my money among the shroffs of all india that whatever may happen here i shall lose comparatively little and i am glad to know that some very small portion of it goes to the one whom i regard as a genuine friend and who does not draw a tenth part of what many of those around me accept without any consideration given for it thank you sir but at any rate while i am stationed here as assistant resident i cannot continue to receive pay from you i should regard it as a disgraceful action and absolutely incompatible with my duty well so far i will humour you mr lindsay though from what i hear in the carnatic and bengal the british officers civil and military do not hesitate to accept large sums from native princes harry was well aware that this was so and that many british officials had amassed considerable fortunes by gifts from native sources he only replied that is a matter for their own consciences sir they may be rewards for services rendered just as i did not hesitate to accept the sum that you so generously bestowed upon me it is not for me to judge other men but i cannot but think that the custom of officials accepting presents is a bad one where can i find you nana said changing the subject if i should need to communicate with you before you call again harry gave his address your messenger must inquire for bashkur a trader from Ahmedabad who is lodging there he chatted for some time longer with nana and then took his leave and returned to his lodging End of section 14、section、fifteen of at the point of the bayonet a tale of the maratha war by g a henty this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org Recording by Suman Barua. At the point of the bayonet, a tale of the Maratha War. Chapter Seven: An Act of Treachery, Part One. Some months passed quietly. Sindhya more openly assumed supreme power, imprisoned several leading men, and transferred their jagirs to his own relations. Colonel Palmer had gone down to Bombay on leave. His place being filled temporarily by Mr. Utoff, Baji was as usual playing a deep game. He desired to become independent both of Sindhya and Nana Furnuwees. The former, he believed, must sooner or later return to his own dominions, and he desired his aid to get rid of Nana. Therefore, it was against the latter that his intrigues were at present directed. The minister was still an object of affection to his people, who believed as before in his goodness of character, and who put down every act of oppression as being the work of Sindhya. Harry saw Nana frequently. There being no change in the position, there was little talk of politics, and the minister generally turned the conversation upon England, its power relatively to that of France, the extent of its resources. The modes of life among the population and its methods of government. It all differs widely from ours, Nana said, after one of these conversations, and in most respects is better. The changes there are made not by force but by the will of the representatives of the people in their assembly. A minister defeated there retires at once, and his chief opponent succeeds him. The army has no determining voice in the conduct of affairs, but is wholly under the orders of the minister who may happen to be in power. All this seems strange to us, but undoubtedly the system is far better for the population. There is no bloodshed, no burning of villages, no plundering, no confiscation of estates. 
it is a change in the personnel of the government but no change in the general course of affairs it is strange that your soldiers fight so well when as you tell me they never carry arms until they enter the army while ours are trained from childhood in the use of weapons and your enemies the french is it the same with them it is the same nana so far as their civil life is concerned for none carry weapons or are trained in their use there is one wide point of difference the french have to go as soldiers when they reach a certain age however much they may dislike it while with us there is no compulsion whatever and men enlist in the army just as they might take up any other trade there is however a body called the militia this like the army consists of volunteers but is not liable for service abroad and only goes out for a short period of training annually however by law should the supply of volunteers fall short battalions can be kept at their full strength by men chosen by ballot from the population but this is practically a dead letter and i'm told that the ballot is never resorted to though doubtless it would be in the case of a national emergency ah it is pleasant to be a minister in your country with no fear of plots of treachery or assassination were i a younger man i should like to visit england and stay there for a time so that on my return i could model some of our institutions upon yours but no i fear that that would be too much for the most powerful minister to effect the people are wedded to their old customs and would not change them for others however much these might be for their benefit an order that none save those in the army should carry arms would unite the whole people against those who issued it it was on the last day of seventeen ninety seven that nana funuis made a formal visit to scindia in return for one the latter had paid him a few days before michael filosi a neapolitan who commanded eight battalions in scindia's army had given his word of honour as a guarantee for the minister's safe return to his home the european officers in the service of the indian princes bore a high character not only for their fidelity to those they served but also for their honour in all their dealings and though nana would not have confided in an oath sworn by scindia he accepted that of filosi without hesitation on his arrival near scindia's camp the traitor seized him and with his battalions attacked his retinue amounting to a thousand persons among whom were many of his principal adherents some of these were killed all of them stripped of their robes and ornaments parties of soldiers were immediately sent by gartge to plunder the house of nana and those of all his adherents harry was in his room when he heard a sudden outburst of firing and a minute or two later abdul ran in scindia's men are in town sahib they are attacking the houses of nana's adherents these are defending themselves as best they can there is a general panic for it is believed that the whole town will be looted get your things together abdul i will change my dress for that of a native soldier and we will make for the residency shall we ride sahib no we will leave the horses here if we were to go on horseback we might be taken for nana's adherents trying to make their escape and be shot down without any further question i felt misgivings when i saw nana going out but it would have come to the same thing in the end for if scindia's whole army villainous as is the treachery had advanced against the town nana could have gathered no force to oppose them three or four minutes later they started abdul carrying a bundle containing harry's disguises they made their way through lanes where the people were all standing at their doors talking excitedly continuous firing was heard in the direction of the better quarters mingled with shouts and cries no one questioned them all being too anxious as to their own safety to think of anything else the residency was half a mile from the town there mr rutoff was standing at his door and the men of his escort were all under arms 
Harry had been in frequent communication with him from the time that he had taken Colonel Palmer's place. The resident did not, for the moment, recognize him in his new disguise, but, when he did so, he asked anxiously what was going on in the town. A strong body of Sindhya's troops are there, attacking Nana's adherents. I fear that the minister himself is a prisoner in their camp. That is bad news indeed. Nana told me yesterday that he intended to visit Sindhya and had received a guarantee for his safe return from Filosi. I advised him not to go, but he said that he could confide implicitly in the honour of a European officer. I told him that the various European nations differed widely from each other, and that although I would accept the word of honour of a British officer in Scindia's service, I would not take that of a Neapolitan. However, he said, and said truly, that it was incumbent on him to return Scindia's visit, and that if he did not do so it would be treated as a slight and insult, and would serve as a pretext for open war against him, and that as he could but muster three or four thousand men, the city must yield without resistance. I believe that this is the work of Baji Rao and of Ghatge, two scoundrels of whom I prefer Ghatge, who, although a ruffian, is at least a fearless one, while Baji Rao is a monster of deceit. I know that there have of late been several interviews between him and Ghatge, and I have not the least doubt that the whole affair has been arranged between them with the hope on Baji's part of getting rid of Nana, and on Ghatge's of removing a sturdy opponent of his future son-in-law, and of acquiring a large quantity of loot by the plunder of Nana's adherents. You did well to come here for, if the work of plunder is once begun, there is no saying how far it will spread. I shall ride at once to see the Peshwa and request an explanation of what has occurred. There is that trooper's dress still lying ready for you, if you would like to put it on. There is a spare horse in my stable. Thank you, sir. I should like it very much. And rapidly changing his dress, he was ready by the time the horses were brought round. He then took his place among the troopers of the escort and rode to Baji Rao's country palace, which was some three miles from the town. After seeing everything in train, the Peshwa had left Sindhya's camp before Nana's arrival there, and had summoned a dozen of the latter's adherents under the pretense that he desired to see them on a matter of business. Wholly unsuspicious of treachery, they rode out at once and each on his arrival was seized and thrown into a place of confinement. The resident learned this from a retainer of one of these nobles. He had made his escape when his master was seized, and was riding to carry the news to the British official, whose influence he thought might suffice to save the captives' lives. On arriving at the palace, four of the troopers were ordered to dismount, Harry being one of those selected and on demanding to see the Peshwa the resident was, after some little delay, ushered into the audience chamber, where Baji Rao was seated, with several of his officers standing behind him. He received Mr. Utoff with a show of great courtesy. The latter, however, stood stiffly and said, I have come, your highness, to request an explanation of what is going on. The city of Pune is being treated like a town taken by siege. The houses of a number of persons of distinction are being attacked by Scindia's soldiery. Fighting is going on in the streets, and the whole of the inhabitants are in a state of wild alarm. But this is not all. Nana Funuis has, owing to his reliance upon a solemn guarantee given for his safe return, being seized when making a ceremonial visit to Scindia. You must surely be misinformed, the Peshwa said. You will readily believe that I am in perfect ignorance of such a proceeding. I might believe it, Prince, Mr. Utoff said coldly, had I not been aware that you and your officers have decoyed a number of Nana's friends to this palace and on their arrival had them suddenly arrested. Bajirao, practised dissimulator as he was, 
flushed at this unexpected accusation. I learned, sir, he said after a pause, that there was a plot against my person by Nana Funnuis and his adherents, and I have therefore taken what I consider the necessary step of placing these in temporary confinement. It is a little strange, your highness, that the man who placed you on the musnet should be conspiring to turn you from it. However, what has been done has been done, and I cannot hope that any words of mine will avail to persuade you to undo an act which will be considered throughout India as one of the grossest treachery and ingratitude. My duty is a simple one, namely, merely to report to my government the circumstances of the case. The officers behind the Peshwa fingered the hilts of their swords, and the four troopers involuntarily made a step forward to support the resident. Baji, however, made a sign to those behind him to remain quiet, and the resident, turning abruptly and without salutation to the Peshwa, left the hall, followed by his men. They mounted as soon as they had left the palace and rode back to the residency. Mr. Utoff keeping his place at their head, and speaking no word until he dismounted, when he asked Harry to accompany him to his room. This is a bad business indeed, Mr. Lindsay. I cannot say that I am surprised because, having studied Baji Rao's character, I have for some time been expecting that he would strike a blow at Nana. Still, I acknowledge that it has come suddenly, and the whole position of affairs has changed. Baji has freed himself from Nana, but he has only riveted Sindhya's yoke more firmly on his shoulders. Like most intriguers, he has overreached himself. He has kept one object in view and been blind to all else. His cause should have been to support Nana against Sindhya and thus to keep the balance of power in his own hands. He has only succeeded in riding himself of the one man who had the good of his country at heart, and who was the only obstacle to Sindhya's ambition. The fool has ruined both himself and his country. I think, Mr. Lindsay, that the best plan will be for you to mount at once and ride down to Bombay. Your presence here just now can be of no special utility, and it is most desirable that the government should have a full statement of the matter laid before them, by one who has been present and who has made himself fully acquainted with the whole politics of the Deccan. It is better that you should not go into the town again. I will send in for your horses as soon as the tumult has subsided. We have several spare animals here and you and your servant can take two of them. I will write to the governor a report of my interview with Baji and say that I have sent you down to give him all the details of what has taken place, which will save the time that it would take me to write a long report and will be far more convenient inasmuch as you can answer any point that he is desirous of ascertaining. I do not think that you can do better than go in the disguise that you now have on, for a soldier to be galloping fast is a common sight but people would be astonished at seeing either a Brahmin or a trader riding at full speed. I will give orders for the horses to be saddled at once, and in the meantime you had best take a meal. You will have no chance of getting one on the road, and I have no doubt that dinner is ready for serving. I will tell the butler to give some food to your man at once. Twenty minutes later Harry and Abdul were on their way. Skirting round Poona, they heard the rattle of musketry still being maintained, and indeed the fighting in the streets of the city continued for twenty-four hours. By two in the morning they halted at the top of the guards, partly to give the horses a rest, and partly because it would have been very dangerous to attempt to make the descent in the dark. At daybreak they continued their journey, arriving at Bombay six hours later. They rode straight for the government house, where Harry dismounted and, throwing the reins of his horse to Abdul, told the attendant to inform the governor that a messenger from the resident at Pune desired to see him. He was at once shown in. Why, it is Mr. Lindsay, 
the governor said, though I should scarce know you in your paint and disguise. The matter on which you come must be something urgent, or Mr. Rutoff would not have sent you down with it. Harry handed over the dispatch of which he was bearer, and, as the governor ran his eye over it, his face became more and more grave as he gathered the news. This is serious indeed, he said. Most serious. Now be pleased to sit down, Mr. Lindsay, and furnish me with all the particulars of the affair. When Harry had finished, the governor said, I imagine that you can have eaten nothing today, Mr. Lindsay. I am about to take tiffin, and bid you to do so with me. I shall at once send to members of the council, and, by the time we have finished our meal, they will no doubt be here. I shall be very glad to do so, sir, if you will allow me to go into the dressing room and put on my uniform. I should hardly like to sit down to table in my present dress. Do so by all means, if you wish it. But you must remember that your colour will not agree well with your dress. I will remove these cast marks, sir, and then I shall look only as if I were somewhat severely tanned. In ten minutes a servant knocked at the door and said that luncheon was ready. Harry was already dressed in his uniform and had removed the marks on his forehead. The dye, however, was as dark as ever. He had, on leaving the governor's room, sent a servant down to fetch his wallet and to tell Abdul that he was to take the horses to the barracks. End of section 15「Section 16 of At the Point of the Bayonet – A Tale of the Maratha War – by G. A. Henty This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Suman Barwa At the Point of the Bayonet – A Tale of the Maratha War Chapter 7 an act of treachery part two the meal was an informal one the governor asked many questions and was pleased at the knowledge that harry showed of all the principal persons in poona and their character and ability at the present moment he said the information that you have given me cannot be utilized but it would be most valuable were we to get mixed up in the confusion of parties at poona I gather that you consider Nana Furnuwees to be a great man? My opinion is not worth much on that point, sir. I think that he has, over and over again, shown great courage in extricating himself from difficulties which appeared to be overwhelming. I believe him to be a sincere patriot, and that he only desires to be at the head of the administration of affairs that he may prevent civil war from breaking out and to thwart the ambition of the great princess. His tastes are simple, his house is furnished plainly, he cares nothing for the pleasures of the table, but he is honest and I believe absolutely truthful, qualities which certainly are possessed by very few men in the Deccan. I grant that he is not disposed to enter into any alliance with the British. He has frequently told me that he admires them greatly for their straightforwardness and truthfulness, as well as for their bravery and their methods of government, both in the great towns and in the districts in which they are masters. But he fears that, were they to send an army to Pune on his behalf, or on that of any of the other parties, it might end by their acquiring control over the affairs of the country, and make them arbitrators in all disputes. No doubt he's right there, the governor said with a smile. However, at present we are certainly not likely to interfere in the quarrels and intrigues beyond the guards. Nor do I see why we should be brought into collision with the Marathas, at any rate, until they have ceased to quarrel among themselves and unite under one master. In that case they might make another effort to turn us out. And now we will go into the room where the council must be, by this time, assembled. This proved to be the case, 
and the governor read to them the note that he had received from mr Utoff, and then requested harry to repeat the details as fully as he had already done there was a consensus of opinion as to the importance of the news come round again to-morrow morning mr lindsay the governor said by that time i shall have fully thought the matter out so you have been masquerading as a native again mr lindsay the colonel said when harry called upon him i can hardly consider it masquerading as i merely resumed the dress i wore for many years and i certainly speak marathi vastly better than i speak english for although i improved a good deal while i was here i am conscious that though my grammar may be correct my pronunciation differs a good deal from that of my comrades you speak english wonderfully well considering that you learned it from the natives the colonel said at first you spoke as a native that had learned english but a casual observer would not now detect any accent that would lead him to suppose that you had not been brought up in england you will of course be at mess this evening i think it would be better that i should not do so sir in the first place i should have innumerable questions to answer and in the second which is more important anything that i said might be heard by mess waiters it is quite possible that some of these are in the pair of Scindia or Holker, who keep themselves well informed of all that goes on here, and were it known that an English officer had come down in disguise, it would greatly increase the danger when I return there. I have no doubt that you are right, Mr. Lindsay. Is there anything new at Pune? Yes, Colonel and as it will be generally known in two or three days there can be no harm in my telling you scindia has made nana Funuis a prisoner by an act of the grossest treachery he has killed almost all his principal adherents and when i got away his troops were engaged in looting the town that is grave news the colonel said so long as nana was in power it was certain that scindia could not venture to take his army out of his own country for the purpose of attacking us but now that nana is overthrown and scindia will be minister to the peshwa we may expect troubles not at present scindia's army has for months been without pay he has no means of settling with them and until he does so they certainly will not move i do not think that would detain him long mr lindsay he has only to march them into other territories with permission to plunder and they would be quite satisfied he certainly can have no liking for the rajas of barar or kolapu for both of them assisted nana to regain his power and an attack upon them would at once satisfy vengeance and put his troops in a good temper but there is no doubt that the peshwa will find it much more irksome to be under scindia's control than that of nana and were scindia to march away he would at once organize an army and by holker's aid to render himself independent of scindia they are treacherous beggars these marathas the colonel said they are absolutely faithless and would sell their fathers if they could make anything by the transaction then you do not know yet whether you are to return no i shall see the governor again to-morrow morning and shall then receive orders i will have some dinner sent over to your quarters from the mess do not have too much light in the room or your colour may be noticed by the servant i will let the officers know that you have returned no doubt many of them will come in for a chat with you as no one can overhear you I do not think that any harm can be done by it. I think not, Colonel. I will tell them, the Colonel went on, that you are on secret service, that you will tell them as much as you can safely do, but they must abstain from pressing you with questions. We all know that you have been acting as assistant to Mr. Utoff, because it was mentioned in orders that you had been detailed for that duty 
but they know no more than that and will doubtless be surprised at your colour but you can very well say that as you had an important message to carry down you thought it best to disguise yourself that will do excellently colonel and i shall be very glad to have a talk with my friends again after leaving the colonel harry went to his own room where he found soera who had been fetched by abu i am sorry to say that i am going away almost directly mother he said but it cannot be helped i do not expect you always to stay here harry now that you are in the company's service you must of course do what you are ordered i am glad indeed to find that although you have been with them only a year you are chosen for a post in which you can gain credit and attract the attention of the authorities here it is all thanks to the pains that you took to prepare me for such work i don't expect to be away so long this time and indeed now that nana Funwis is a prisoner it does not seem to me that there can be anything special to do until some change takes place in the situation and Scindia either openly assumes supreme power or marches away with his army that evening harry's room was crowded with visitors the news of the treacherous arrest of nana Funwis excited the liveliest interest and was received with very much regret as nana was considered the only honest man of all the ministers of the native princes and to be friendly disposed towards the british and all saw this fall might be followed by an important change in the attitude of the marathas two days later harry returned to Pune. the next eighteen months passed without any very prominent incidents in order to furnish Scindia with money to pay his troops and to be in a position to march away baji rao agreed that ghatke should as Scindia's minister raise contributions in Pune. accordingly a rule of the direst brutality and cruelty took place the respectable inhabitants the merchants traders and men of good family were driven from their houses tortured often to death scourged and blown away from the mouths of cannon no person was safe from his persecution and the poorest were forced to deliver up all their little savings the rich were stripped of everything and atrocities of all kinds were committed upon the hapless population baji rao countenanced these things and was now included in the hatred felt for ghatgeir and Scindia troubles occurred between the peshwa and the raja of satara who refused to deliver up an agent of nana whom he had at baji's request seized as sindhya's troops refused to move pursurambha was released from captivity and raising an army captured the city of satara and compelled the fort to surrender but when ordered by baji rao to disband the force that he had collected he excused himself from doing so on the plea that he had no money to pay them or to carry out the promises that he had given them Scindia himself was not without troubles in addition to the mutiny of his troops the three widows of his father who instead of receiving the treatment proper to their rank had been neglected and were living in poverty sought an interview with him and were seized by ghatke flogged and barbarously treated their cause was taken up by the brahmins who had held the principal officers under Scindia's father and it was at last settled that they should take up their residence at burampur with a suitable establishment their escort however had received private orders to carry them to the fortress of ahmednagar the news of this treachery spread soon after they had left the camp and an officer in the interest of the brahmin started with a troop of horse which he commanded dispersed the escort and rescued the ladies these he carried to the camp of amrud rao baji rao's foster brother who instantly afforded them protection and sallying out attacked and defeated a party of their pursuers led by ghatke himself five battalions of infantry were then sent by Scindia, but amrud attacked them boldly and compelled them to retreat 
Negotiations were then opened and Amrit, believing Sindhya's promises, moved his camp to the neighborhood of Pune. But during a Mohammedan festival, he and his troops were suddenly attacked by a few brigades of infantry, which dispersed them, slew great numbers, and pillaged their camp. Holkar now joined Amrit Rao, who had escaped from the massacre. The Peshwa negotiated an alliance with the Nizam. Sindhya sent envoys to Tipu to ask for his assistance. Baji Rao did the same, and it looked as if a desperate war was about to break out. All this time Harry had been living quietly in the residency, performing his duties as assistant to Colonel Palmer, who had again taken charge there. There was no occasion for him to resume his disguises. The atrocities committed by Gatke in Pune were apparent to all, and at present there seemed no possible combination that could check the power of Sindhya. Colonel Palmer, however, had several interviews with Baji Rao and entreated him to put a stop to the doings of Gatke, but the latter declared that he was powerless to interfere and treated with contempt the warnings of the colonel that he was uniting the whole population in hatred of him. The rebellion under Amrud and the adhesion of Holkar to it seemed to afford some hope that an end would come to the terrible state of things prevailing, and Colonel Palmer became convinced that Sindhya was really anxious to return to his own dominions, where his troops, so long deprived of their natural leaders, were in a state of insubordination. If the Nana were but released from his prison at Ahmednagar, something might be done, he said. He might be able to supply sufficient money to enable Sindhya to leave, and the alarm Nana's liberation would give to Baji would compel him to change his conduct, lest Nana should join Amrit and, with the assent of the whole population, place him on the Masnad. Nana is the only man who can restore peace to this unhappy country, he said to Harry. But I see no chance of Sindhya releasing a prisoner whom he could always use to terrify Baji, should the latter dare to defy his authority. Harry thought the matter over that night, and at last determined to make an attempt to bring about his old friend's release. In the morning he said to the resident, I've been thinking over what you said last night, Colonel, and with your permission I am resolved to make an attempt to bring about Nana's release. But how on earth do you mean to proceed, Mr. Lindsay? My plans are not quite made up yet, sir. In the first place, I shall ask you to give me three weeks' leave, so that if I fail you can make it evident that you are not responsible for my undertaking. In the next place, I shall endeavour to see Nana in his prison, and ascertain from him whether he can pay a considerable sum to Sindhya for his release. If I find that he is in a position to do so, I shall then always, of course, in disguise, endeavour to have a private interview with Sindhya, and to convince him that it is in every way to his interest to allow Nana to ransom himself. He is, of course, perfectly well aware that, in spite of Baji's assurances of friendship, he is at heart bitterly opposed to him, and that the return of Nana with the powers he before possessed would neutralise the Peshwa's power. It would be an excellent thing if that could be done, the colonel said, but it appears to me to be an absolute impossibility. I would rather not tell you how I intend to act, sir, so that in case of failure you can disavow all knowledge of my proceedings. Well, since you are willing to undertake the risk, and unquestionably the Bombay government would see with great pleasure Nana's return to power, I will throw no obstacle in your way. You had better, to begin with, write me a formal request for a month's leave to go down to Bombay. Is there anything else that I can do to aid your project? Nothing whatever, and I am much obliged to you for acceding to my request. If for no other reason than that my success should have the effect of releasing the inhabitants of Pune from the horrible tyranny to which they are exposed, I shall be willing to risk a great deal to gain it. I shall not leave for a day or two, as I wish to think over all the details of my plan before I set about carrying it out. 
going into the city harry went to the spot where the proclamations of scindia were always affixed these were of various kinds such as forbidding anyone carrying arms to be in the streets after nightfall and that every inhabitant should furnish an account of his income in order that taxation should be carefully distributed to these scindia's seal was affixed one such order had been placed there that morning a sentry marched up and down in front of it lest any insult should be ordered to the paper satisfied that this would suit his purpose he called abdul to him and explained what he wanted it will not be till this evening for i want before that step is taken to collect a party of ten horsemen to ride with me to ahmednagar and back by this time you know a great many people in the town and if i were to pay them well you should have no difficulty in getting that number i could do that in half an hour sahib there are a great number of the disbanded soldiers of the peshwa's army who are without employment and who would willingly undertake anything that would bring them in a little money well you can arrange with them today they must not attract attention by going out together but must meet at the village of butulwari the next morning harry went to the shop of a trader who was he knew formerly employed by nana and purchased from him a suit such as would be worn by an officer in sindhya's service then he wrote out a document in marathi giving an order to the governor of ahmednagar to permit the bearer musawud khan to have a private interview with nana funnuis this done he told the resident that he intended to leave that night colonel palmer asked no questions but only said be careful mr lindsay be careful it is a desperate enterprise that you are undertaking and i should be sorry indeed if so promising an officer should be lost to our service i will be careful i assure you i have no wish to throw away my life when evening came on he went to his room stained his skin from head to foot put on the cast marks then dressed himself in the clothes that he had that morning purchased and at nine o'clock left the house quietly with abdul at that hour poona would be quiet for the terror was so great that few people ventured into the street after nightfall when they approached the house on which the proclamation was fixed they separated Harry went quietly to the corner of the street, a few yards from the spot where the soldier was marching up and down, and listened intently, peeping out from behind the wall whenever the sentry was walking in the other direction. Presently he heard a smothered sound and the dull thud of a falling body. He ran out. Abdul had crawled up to the other end of the sentry's beat and taken his place in a doorway. the sentry came up to within a couple of yards of him and then turned abdul sprang out and with a bound leapt upon the sentry's back and with one hand grasped his musket taken wholly by surprise the sentry fell forward on his face abdul still clinging to him he pressed his knife against the soldier's neck and said that at the slightest cry he would drive it home half stunned by the fall the soldier lay without moving without the loss of a moment harry ran up to the proclamation and tore it down and then darted off again abdul springing to his feet brought the butt end of the soldier's musket down on his head and then satisfied that a minute or two must elapse before the man would be recovered sufficiently to give the alarm he too ran off and joined harry at the point where they had separated that was well managed abdul now we will walk quietly until we are outside the town as if we met some of sindhia's men they would question were we hurrying in a few minutes they were outside the city and then running at a brisk pace they reached the residency they were challenged by the sentry but on harry giving his name he was of course allowed to pass he went quietly into his room and lighted a candle putting his knife in the flame he heated it and then carefully cut the seal from the paper on which it was fixed placed it on the order that he had written and 
again heating his knife, passed it along under the paper, until the under part of the seal was sufficiently warm to adhere to it. He placed the order in an inner pocket, put a brace of pistols into his sash, and buckled on a native sword that he had bought that morning. Then he went out again, and found that Abdul had the horses in readiness, with two native saddles, with embroidered housings such as was used by native officers, which he had by Harry's orders purchased that morning in the bazaar. They at once mounted, and started at a gallop for Wutalwari. End of section 16section seventeen of at the point of the bayonet a tale of the maratha war by g a henty this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by suman barua at the point of the bayonet a tale of the maratha war chapter eight nana's release part one at the entrance to the village harry found the ten troopers whom abdul had engaged standing by their horses he gave the order for them to march and at a brisk canter they started for ahmednagar it was a ride of some forty miles and when they approached the town they halted until the sun rose and the gates of the city were opened they then rode in the men were left at a khan abdul remaining with them they had been told if questioned to say that their leader musawud khan was an officer high in the service of scindia harry took two of the troopers with him and rode to the governor's house dismounting and leaving the horse in their charge he told one of the attendants to inform the governor that he was the bearer of an order from Scindia and was at once shown up. The governor received him with all honour, glanced at the order that Harry presented to him, placed the seal against his forehead in token of submission, and then after a few words as to affairs at Pune, called an officer and ordered him to accompany Musawud Khan to Nana Furnui's apartment this was a large room at an angle of the fortress with a balcony outside affording a view of the country round it for the governor knowing how rapidly and often the position changed and having no orders save to maintain a careful watch over the prisoner had endeavoured to ingratiate himself with him by lodging him comfortably and treating him well the officer opened the door and when harry had entered locked it behind him Nana Furnuis was seated at the window, enjoying the fresh morning air. He looked listlessly round, and then rose suddenly to his feet as he recognised his visitor. "'What wonder is this?' he said. "'That you should be here, Mr. Lindsay, except as a prisoner.' "'I am here as one of Scindia's officers,' Harry replied with a smile. "'Although he himself is not aware of it, in hopes of obtaining your freedom that is too good even to hope for nana said sadly in the first place sir are you aware of the state of things in Pune? i have heard nothing since i came here nana said they make me comfortable as you see but except for the daily visit from the governor i have no visitors and from him i learn nothing as he has strict orders from Scindia not to give me any information of what happens outside these walls, fearing no doubt that I might take advantage of any change to endeavour to open communication with one or other of the leaders. Before you tell me anything else, please explain how you managed to enter here. That was easy enough, sir. I simply wrote out an order to the governor to permit me to have a private interview with you. I tore down one of Scindia's proclamations and transferred his seal from it to the order that I had written, dressed myself, as you see, as one of his officers, got together ten mounted men to ride as my escort, and here I am. 
you will be a great man some day nana said looking at the tall powerful figure of his visitor with its soldierly carriage now tell me about affairs i shall then understand better why you have run this risk harry gave him a sketch of everything that had happened since his confinement you see sir he said as he concluded how the situation has changed amrud is nominally acting with his brother's approval but there is no question that bajee fears him amrud is in alliance with holkar Pursuram Bhau is at liberty at the head of an army and a nominal conciliation has taken place between him and bajee the latter has incurred the detestation and hatred of the people of poona and most important of all scindia is really anxious to get back home but is unable to do so owing to his inability to pay his troops and willing as bajee might be to furnish the money to get rid of him he is without resources owing to the fact that the taxation wrung from the people has all gone into the pockets of scindia gatke and his other favourites the question is sir whether you would be willing to purchase your liberty at a heavy price i think that if you could pay sufficient to enable scindia to satisfy his soldiers he might be induced to release you how much do you think he would want of that i have no idea sir of course he would at first ask a great deal more than he would afterwards accept yes i should be ready to pay nana said after considering for a minute as a prisoner here my money is of no use to me nor ever would be but i could pay a large sum and still be wealthy that is what i wanted to know sir but why do you run this risk nana asked for several reasons sir in the first place because you have honoured me with your friendship in the second because i would fain save the people of poona from the horrible barbarity with which they are now treated and lastly because the government of bombay would i am sure be glad to hear of your reinstatement as the only means of restoring peace and tranquillity to the deccan how will you open this matter to scindia i have not fully thought that out sir but i have no doubt that i shall in some way be able to manage it and intend to act upon his fears as well as upon his avarice but you say that gatke is all-powerful and he would never permit an interview to take place between a stranger and scindia from what i hear sir scindia is becoming jealous of gatke's power and disgusted both by his imperious manner and by his atrocities in poona against which he has several times protested but in vain if i am to obtain an audience with scindia it must be a secret one but there will surely be great danger in such a step doubtless it will not be without danger harry said but that i must risk i have not yet determined upon my plan as it would have been useless to think of that until i had seen you but as that has been managed so easily i fancy that i shall have no great difficulty in getting at him once i do so i feel certain that i shall be able to convince him that his best policy is to free you and place you in your old position as the peshwa's minister as in that case you would be a check upon bajee rao and would be able to prevent him from entering into alliances hostile to scindia well mr lindsay you have given me such proofs both of your intelligence and courage that i feel sure that if any one can carry this through you will be able to do so and i need hardly say how deeply grateful i shall be to you for rescuing me from an imprisonment which seemed likely to terminate only with my life and now i had better go sir harry said it is as well that our conference should not be too long a one well good-bye mr lindsay even if nothing comes of all this it will be pleasant for me to know that at least i have one faithful friend who was true to me in my deepest adversity harry went to the door and knocked 
it was immediately opened by the officer who had conducted him there and who had taken up his post a short distance from the door he led harry back to the governor who pressed him to stay with him but he replied that his orders were to return to Pune instantly after this interview he went direct to the tavern where the soldiers had put up ate a hasty meal and then mounted and rode out of the town when ten miles away he halted in a grove for some hours and then rode on to Pune. arrived within a mile of the town he paid each of the men the amount promised and told them to re-enter the town separately then he secured a room for himself in a small khan just outside the city and sitting there alone worked out the plan of obtaining an interview with Cynthia. he then told abdul to go quietly to the residency and to bring out the brahmin's dress he had before worn in the morning abdul went out to Cynthia's camp with a letter which when Cynthia came out of his marquee he handed to him there was nothing unusual in this for petitions were frequently presented in this way to rulers in india as he did so he said in a low voice it is private and important your highness and instead of handing it to one of his officers Cynthia went back to his tent to read it it stated that the writer Kawasin, an unworthy member of the shitri brahmins prayed for a private interview with his highness on matters of the most urgent import Cynthia thought for a moment and then tearing up the piece of paper went out and as he passed abdul who was waiting at the entrance said tell your master to be here at half past ten tonight the sentry will have orders to admit him abdul returned at once to harry and delivered his message that is good the latter said you will take me with you sahib certainly abdul if you are willing to go there is some danger in it and should sindhya give the alarm you may be of great assistance by cutting down the sentry before he can run in take your pistols and talwar and bring another sword for me if i can once get out of the tent we shall be fairly safe for in the darkness and confusion which will arise we shall be able to make off quietly we will ride there and fasten our horses in that grove that lies about a quarter of a mile from the camp at half past nine they started and reached Cynthia's tent at the time appointed harry's belief that he would succeed was largely founded on the knowledge that Cynthia was a weak young man who had never been engaged in warfare and was wanting in physical courage an attendant was at the door and led him to the prince's private tent which stood in the middle of an encampment composed of large tents for the purpose of receptions and entertainments for the abodes of the ladies of the zenana and for the officers in whom Cynthia reposed most confidence the retinue of servants attendants and minor officials were lodged in tents fifty yards behind the royal encampment Cynthia was sitting on a divan two lamps hung from the ceiling he himself was smoking you have something of importance to say to me he said as harry rented and bowed deeply i have your highness you are doubtless well aware that the shitri brahmins who formerly held the principal offices under your father are greatly offended by the elevation of Ghatke, and still more so by his atrocious deeds in the town of Pune. there has been a private meeting and twelve of them myself among the number have sworn by the feet of brahma to take your life either by poison dagger or musket ball and you have the insolence to avow that you took such an oath he sprang to his feet and would have touched the bell on the table but in an instant harry sprung forward with a loaded pistol pointed at Cynthia's head stop sir i beg of you for assuredly if you raise a voice or touch a bell that moment will be your last Cynthia sank down into his seat again 
he had not the least doubt that the man before him would execute his threat. Your Highness, he said, I have not come here for the purpose of assassinating you. I was first on the list, but obtained from the others permission to endeavour to put an end to the present state of things before carrying out our vow. We know that, in spite of the enormous sums that Gadge has raised in Pune, you yourself have not been enriched, and that you have been unable to persuade your troops to march, owing to your want of money to pay up their arrears. We have thought the matter over, and can see but one way by which you can obtain the necessary funds. And that is, Sindhya asked. That is, Your Highness, to liberate Nana Funuis, setting his liberty, of course, at a high price. In this way you will not be able to move your army, but you will cripple the power of the Peshwa, who would, if possible, overthrow you, now you have done his work and freed him from Nana. You are well aware, Prince, that Nana Funuis always exercised his authority on the side of peace and there is no fear that he will permit Baji Rao to engage in war against you. He is an old man, and useless to you as a prisoner. If you exacted a heavy sum from him, it would in all ways aid your views. But how do you know that Nana could raise such a sum as would satisfy the troops? We have assured ourselves on that score, and I know that it matters not how much Nana Funuis will have to give. What I would suggest is that you shall seize Gatke and rid yourself of his domination. He cannot but be as odious to you as he is to Bajirao and to the people. Sindhya sat for some time in silence. Do I understand, he said, that if I carry out these suggestions, your comrades will be satisfied? That I swear solemnly. I do not threaten your highness for my visit today is one of conciliation. You might, as soon as I leave this tent, order me to be arrested. In that case, I should use this pistol against myself, and you would seek in vain for the names of my eleven brethren. But your life would be forfeited, whether in the midst of your guards or in your tent, whether you ride or walk. You would be watched, and your servants would be bribed, and your food poisoned. If the first man fails, he will blow out his brains, and so will they all. But be assured that the vow will be kept, and that, whether by night or by day, you will never be safe. You are a bold man to speak so, Sindhya said. I speak so, your highness, because I am perfectly ready to die for the good of the country, and to secure for it peace and contentment. Sindhya rose, and took two or three turns up and down the tent. Harry, keeping his pistol in his hand, in readiness to fire should he attempt to slip away. At last, Sindhya stopped before him. I agree to your conditions, he said, and the more readily because I shall, as you say, at once free myself from difficulties and avenge myself on Baji Rao who is, I know, in spite of his professions of friendship, constantly plotting against me. Tomorrow, at daybreak, an officer shall ride with a troop of cavalry, and shall bring Nana here. You have chosen wisely, Prince. It is, believe me, your only way of escaping from your present difficulties. I know that already your soldiery are becoming mutinous at being thus kept for months away from their country and receiving no pay. That feeling will grow rapidly unless their demands are conceded. As to Gatge, the soldiers hold him in abhorrence, and his arrest and downfall would cause the most lively satisfaction among them. Your men are soldiers and not assassins, and the tortures and executions that daily take place fill them with horror, so that your order for his arrest will be executed with joy. Now, Your Highness, I will leave you. I believe that you will keep your promise, as indeed it is to your interest to do so, in which case you will never hear of myself or my eleven companions. Do not fear. 
Sindhya said. Tomorrow my messenger shall certainly start for Amandnagar. Harry, bowing deeply, turned, passed through the curtain, and made his way out of the tent. Abdul, who was squatting near the entrance, at once rose and followed him. Is all well, Sahib? I think so. I have so frightened Sindhya that I have little doubt he will carry out the promise he has given me. I will tell you about it when we get back. They passed through the sleeping camp and mounted their horses in the grove and rode to the residency. Colonel Palmer was still up, engaged in writing a report for the government. It was a dark night, and the sentry on duty, knowing Harry's voice, let him pass without question, not even observing the change in his attire. What, back again, Mr. Lindsay? The colonel exclaimed in surprise when Harry entered. I thought that it would be a month before you returned. That is, if you ever returned at all, and of this I had but little hope. As I expected, you have, of course, found it impossible to carry out your design. On the contrary, sir, I have been, I hope, perfectly successful. I have seen Nana Funnois, and ascertained that he is ready to pay a large sum to obtain his freedom and his former position as the Peshwa's minister. I have seen Scindia. Tomorrow a troop of horse will start to fetch Nana to his camp, and Gatke will be arrested as soon as possible after he arrives. How in the name of fortune have you managed all these things? The colonel asked. I will tell you, sir, now that I am back here. I shall, tomorrow, reassume my uniform, and there is no danger of my being recognized or of trouble arising from what I have done. He then related the various steps he had taken and his conversations with Nana and Scindia. Upon my word, Mr. Lindsay, I do not know whether to admire most your daring in bearding Scindia in the heart of his camp, or the intelligence with which you have carried out what seemed to me an absolutely impossible undertaking. Light your cheroot. I need not trouble about this report that I was engaged on when you entered, but will put it by until the day after tomorrow, when we shall see whether Nana is brought to Sindhya's camp. You speak Hindustani as well as Marathi, do you not? Not so well, sir, but as you know I have, during the six months that I was at Bombay, and since I have been here, used most of my spare time working up Hindustani with a munshi. I'm glad to hear it, for I received a letter from the governor this morning, saying that Lord Mornington has requested him to send an officer, thoroughly acquainted with Marathi and with some knowledge of the people, and that he has selected you for the service, as being by far better fitted than anyone he knows for the appointment. A knowledge of Hindustani will, of course, be very useful to you, but Marathi is the principal thing, as he is intending to open negotiations with the Marathas, as well as with the Nizam, to induce them to join in concerted action against Tipu. He says that no vessel will be sailing for Calcutta for less than a month, so you can stay here for a few days and see how your scheme works out. It will be a great step for you, and ensure you rapid promotion. I am indeed obliged to the governor for selecting me, Harry said, and will do my best to justify his confidence. End of section 17、section、eighteen of At the Point of the Bayonet, A Tale of the Maratha War by G. A. Henty. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Suman Barua. At the Point of the Bayonet A Tale of the Maratha War. Chapter 8 Nana's Release, Part 2. Two days later, Nana Furnois was brought to Sindhya's camp, 
news which caused Bajee Rao intense consternation. He at once sent off to open negotiations with the Nizam for common action, offering a considerable amount of territory for his assistance. Colonel Palmer rode over the next morning to Sindhya's camp and found that Sindhya had demanded three millions of rupees as the price of Nana's release and appointment as minister to the Peshwa. Nana had protested his absolute inability to raise anything like that sum, but had offered 500,000 rupees. I can quite believe that he could not pay the sum Sindhya demands, the colonel said on his return. And when Sindhya sees that he would rather return to prison than attempt impossibilities, he will come down in his demands, and Nana will go up in his offer. It is a mere question of bargaining. When Sindhya heard of the step that Baji Rao had taken, he was greatly alarmed, for he could hardly hope to withstand the Nizam's army and that which Baji himself could raise. And he therefore materially lowered his demands and finally accepted Nana's offer of 900,000 rupees. This arrangement being made, he permitted Nana to leave the camp in order to raise the money, receiving his solemn oath that, if he failed to do so, he would return and render himself a prisoner again. However, in a few days Nana sent in the money. Sindhya fulfilled the other part of his promise and insisted upon the Peshwas receiving Nana as his minister. A few days later he had Ghatke arrested by the sons of two of his European officers. Sindhya was, indeed, most anxious to be off. He did not know that the Nizam had refused Baji Rao's offer. He had received news of widespread disaffection among his troops at home and felt that he could not rely upon those with him. As soon, therefore, as he received the money from Nana, he partially paid the arrears due to the soldiers. The sum, however, was altogether insufficient to satisfy the troops, and as Nana Funuis found that Baji was still intriguing with Sindhya for his overthrow, and that no rest could be hoped for until the latter's army marched away, he advanced Sindhya fifteen lakhs of rupees from his own private funds. The latter was then able to satisfy his troops. Sindhya accepted the money, but still remained in the neighborhood of Pune. These matters were not concluded until months after Harry left for Bombay. On arriving there, he called upon the governor to report the release of Nana Funuis. I received Colonel Palmer's last report four days ago. He has given me full details of the manner in which you, on your own initiative, brought about Nana's release and the approaching departure of Sindhya. And I, of course, brought them before the council and they quite agreed with me as to the remarkable daring and ability with which you had carried out what Colonel Palmer believed to be an impossible scheme. I have pleasure in handing you your commission of captain, and only regret that we cannot break the rules of the service by nominating you major. Tomorrow your name will be removed from the list of officers of the 3rd Regiment, and you will be appointed to the staff. You will have a week before you to obtain the proper uniform. I shall not require you to perform any duties, and you will therefore have your time to yourself till you sail. I shall, of course, forward my reasons for sending you to Lord Mornington, and shall give an account of the services that you have rendered, which will doubtless excite as much admiration in Calcutta as in Bombay. I shall be glad if you will dine with me the day after tomorrow when I shall ask the members of the council to meet you. On leaving the governor, Harry at once went to the shop of the Parsi merchant from whom he had obtained his regimentals and ordered the various uniforms required for the staff. He then went to Soera, 
and to his great satisfaction found Sufta there. The latter's troop was one of those which had been disbanded when, on the arrival of Scindia, Baji Rao deemed it necessary to reduce his force, and Sufta, after staying for some time at Juni, had now come down to see his cousin. I am glad indeed to find you here, Sufta, in the first place because it is always a pleasure to meet a good friend, and in the second because you can take Soyera back with you and place her with Ramdas. But why should I leave here, Harry? Because, mother, I am to start for Madras in three weeks, and maybe, for aught I know, away for a year or more. Of course you can remain here if you prefer it, but it seems to me that the other would be the better plan. I should certainly prefer to go with Safda to my home. So Era said, I have numbers of acquaintances here, but no real friends and Ramdas and Anandi will, I know, joyfully receive me. At any rate, you shall be no burden to them, Soyera. I will give you a thousand rupees, with which you can pay your share of the expenses of the house or land, and I will give you a similar sum to hand to Ramdas as a token of my gratitude for his protection and kindness. This will enable him to add to his holding and to the comforts of his house. I would willingly give much more, but it might cause suspicion and inquiry, were he to extend his holding largely, and the authorities of Juni might demand from him how he became possessed of such means. As I told you, I have received much money in presents, and could afford to give you very much more, if it were of any advantage to you. I shall give a thousand rupees also to you, Safta. They will be useful to you when you settle down on the revenues of your district, and enable you to cut a good figure among the people when you arrive there. The day before he was to sail, a Hindu entered Harry's apartment, and bowing deeply handed him a letter. It was from Nana. My good English friend, I send the enclosed bill upon my agent as a small token of acknowledgment for the inestimable service you have rendered me. During my long life I have had many friends, but these, in supporting me, acted in their own interest. You alone have shown me absolutely disinterested friendship. I have always been opposed to your people interfering in the affairs of the Deccan, but I see now that nothing save their intervention can save the country from absolute ruin, owing to the constant struggles for supremacy among the great Rajas, and I see that it were far better we should enjoy peace and protection under a foreign power than be exposed to ruin and misery at the hands of warring factions. I grieve that I have not seen you again. Colonel Palmer tells me that you are about to start for either Calcutta or Madras to join the army that is about to act against Tipu. It is unlikely that I shall ever see you again, but I shall never forget that, had it not been for you, I should have ended my life a prisoner at Ahmednagar. Nana. The bill enclosed was an order for a hundred thousand rupees upon Nana's agent in Bombay. When Harry went to say good-bye to the governor, the latter said, It is likely that you will see your old regiment before long, Captain Lindsay. This morning a ship arrived, with orders from Lord Mornington for us to send as many troops as could possibly be spared to ascend the southern guards and join him near Seringapatam. Lord Mornington is now at Madras, making arrangements for an advance, when his brother, Colonel Wellesley, will move forward with the Nizam's troops. There is still a doubt what part the Marathas will take. Probably they will hold aloof, altogether, until they see how matters go. We know that Tipu has sent thirteen lakhs of rupees to Baji Rao, and that the latter and Scindia are in constant communication with him. 
however at present we shall take no notice of these proceedings but allow the peshwa to believe that we are deceived by the constant assurances that he gives us of his friendship although he has declined to enter into a treaty with us similar to that which the nizam has made it is enough to have one formidable foe on our hands at a time and our experience of bajee assures us that he will not commit himself by openly declaring for tipu until he sees how matters are going the winds were unfavourable and it was not until six weeks after leaving bombay that harry arrived at madras it was now november seventeen ninety eight and on landing he learned that general harris was in command of the army that was assembling at velour and that the governor-general had returned to calcutta he therefore at once went back to the ship which next day sailed for that town on arriving there he presented himself at the government house and on sending in his name was in a short time shown into lord mornington's private room i am glad that you have come captain lindsay the latter said i wish that you had been here sooner i came by the first ship sir after the governor of bombay received your letter but owing to contrary winds we have been nearly two months on the voyage i landed for an hour at madras and hearing that you had returned here i hesitated whether to come to you for orders or to join general harris at velour but i thought it better to come on and so again embarked on the ship which is only just anchored you were quite right sir for it was an agent rather than a soldier that i required i own that i thought the governor would have sent an older man i am the bearer of this letter from him i believe that in it he gives his reasons for the honour he did me in selecting me for the post i will look through it presently lord mornington said and if you will dine with me here i shall then have read it and shall be able to decide where you can be employed to the best advantage the dinner was a quiet one only the officers of the governor-general's suite being present the governor received harry with much more cordiality than he had evinced at their first interview and introduced him to his officers with the expression that captain lindsay had done very valuable service in the deccan little allusion was made to business until the other officers had left when lord mornington said i have read the governor of bombay's letter and am convinced that he could have made no better choice than he has done he speaks of you in the highest terms and has given me a slight sketch of your story and a fuller one of the manner in which you obtained the release of nana Funuis. i learn that nana has always been considered our friend although we have not been able to give him the support that we could wish as this would have entailed war with the Marathas, which bombay is in no position to undertake nevertheless his release will doubtless to some extent counterbalance the duplicity of the peshwa who while lavish in his promises to us is receiving money from tipu and will undoubtedly unless restrained by nana openly espouse his cause should he gain any successes over us you showed such intelligence in the matter that he says i can place every confidence in you although the nizam has been obliged to dismiss the french troops in his service and to send a portion of his army to act in connection with our own against mysore he is in no way to be trusted being as slippery as the rest of these indian princes and like the marathas would assuredly join tipu if he saw his way to doing so this is so certain that nothing would be gained by sending another agent to hyderabad i therefore propose to open communications with the raja of berar none of my officers is able to talk marathi though many of them are of course familiar with the southern dialects the raja is already practically at war with the marathas 
as for a long time his troops have been ravaging the territory of Pursuram Bhau, which he was invited to do by the Peshwa when Pursuram took sides against him. He is doubtless in some apprehension of an attack by the Marathas, and upon our promising to guarantee his dominions, and to give him support if attacked, he may be willing to venture into an alliance with us and his doing so would alike help us in keeping the nizam to his engagements and deter the marathas from moving this is the mission that i intend to confide to you i believe that it could not be in better hands if you will call to-morrow afternoon your written instructions and powers to act for me and to enter into engagements in my name will be ready for you and i should wish you to start the next morning you will have an escort of twenty troopers these indian princes have little respect for persons who travel unattended you will understand that the instructions recite the maximum that you are authorized to offer to the rajah if he will be satisfied with less you will of course grant as little as you can if he demands more you must refer the matter to me at any rate so long as you are negotiating he will take no active steps against us though i have learned that baji rao has already been at work trying to persuade him to join himself and tipur against us were such a treaty concluded we could no longer hope to retain the nizam and indeed should find it difficult to contend against so powerful a confederacy at any rate if the rajah will not join us you must endeavour at least to secure his neutrality the day after to-morrow you will start i will have a route map prepared for you the distance to nagpur is about eight hundred miles and you will get there in four weeks travelling thirty miles a day i have given orders to-day for one of the company's ships of war to take you and your escort to the mouth of the Gunjam, and express messengers have already started with orders to the commandment to provide wagons to carry your tent, equipage and stores. You should, if the winds are favourable, reach there in four or five days' time. The carts will delay us, sir, and without them we might make forty miles a day after we have landed for the horses of this country have great endurance a few days will make no great difference there are no towns of any importance on the road to nagpur and you would have to put up at wretched khans and would be considered as worthy of little consideration whereas i wish you to travel in a style suitable for my agent and to impress the native mind with your importance have you horses i have but one sir and a pony for my servant you must purchase another and a good one with showy equipments you will of course charge that on all other expenses and your appointment will be a thousand rupees a month i have no doubt the rajah will lodge you handsomely should he not do so you had best in camp outside the town do not put up with any inferior lodging very well sir i shall endeavour to carry out your orders to the letter harry was fortunate in being able to purchase an excellent horse and in the afternoon received his letters of instruction on the following day he embarked in a twelve-gun sloop with twenty troopers under the command of a native officer the wind was favourable and in four days they arrived at the mouth of the gunjum a large native barge came out to meet them the horses and the stores which harry had purchased together with some boxes with presents for the rajah were transferred to her and two of the ship's boats took the barge in tow to the shore the commandment of the small garrison there informed harry that the bullock carts had already gone on to a village thirty miles away and that he would find all in readiness for him on his arrival without waiting an hour he started with his escort and half a mile from the village found the camp already pitched 
it consisted of one large and handsome tent such as those used by high officials and two smaller ones for the escort he had engaged at calcutta a good cook and this man at once began to light fires and prepare a meal for the stores harry had brought with him the tent was handsomely furnished a large carpet covered the ground there was a bed four large chairs and a table while between the outer and inner walls of the tent was a bath as soon as they halted one of the troopers rode into the village and purchased fowls rice ghee and condiments for the use of the escort who were all mormons harry found to his satisfaction that another set of wagons had started that morning for the next halting place and that he would find everything ready for him there this was a great satisfaction for he had feared that the work of taking down and packing the tents would delay his start in the morning and that at the end of the day's ride he would have to wait some hours before the tents came up whereas by the system of double carriage he would not be delayed the headman told him that his party would start in the morning as soon as the cart could be packed that fresh bullocks would be hired at the village where he would halt and would travel all night so as to be in readiness for him when he had accomplished another stage and that this process would be continued until they reached nagpur end of section eighteen section nineteen of at the point of the bayonet a tale of the mahratta war this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by dion gines salt lake city utah at the point of the bayonet a tale of the mahratta war by g a henty chapter nine a popular tumult part one the journey was performed without incident harry enjoyed it much for this luxurious method of travelling was quite new to him and three weeks after leaving the coast they arrived at nagpur on the previous day the native officer had been sent off beforehand to inform the raja of the arrival of a high officer of the governor-general's and had taken on a letter from lord mornington accrediting harry to act in his name accordingly when the party arrived within a mile of the town they were met by two officers of the raja who welcomed him in his name and said that a residence had been prepared for his use and that of the escort they were surprised at harry's perfect knowledge of their language for hitherto british agents who had come to nagpura had had but very slight acquaintance with it and had had to carry on their conversation by means of an interpreter the town was large and straggling and composed for the most part of native huts built of mud there were however a few brick houses the property of flourishing traders the palace was a large square edifice without any architectural adornments trees grew everywhere in the streets and in the distance the town had the appearance of a forest harry was conducted to one of the largest brick houses in the town a host of sweepers had been at work carpets were laid down and furniture placed in the principal rooms he had no doubt that it had been requisitioned from its owner by the raja for him and the furniture supplied from the palace the principal rooms were on the upper floor and there was ample accommodation for the escort below harry requested the officers to ascertain when the raja would be ready to receive a visit from him and they returned with word that he would receive him in private audience at eight o'clock that evening accordingly at that hour followed by four of his troopers he rode to the palace a guard of honor was drawn up at the entrance and saluted as he passed in the entrance hall and staircase were lined by attendants and all bowed profoundly as he passed he was conducted to a large audience chamber where the raja attended by his principal officers was seated the conversation was of the usual ceremonial kind the prince expressing his satisfaction that the governor-general should have sent one of his officers to confer with him and assuring harry of his good will and friendship towards the english while harry on his part expressed the strong desire of lord mornington that the relations between him and the raja should be continued unbroken and that nothing should ever occur to disturb their amity 
the presents sent by the governor-general were then brought in and displayed and appeared to give much satisfaction to the chief after the durbar was over the latter told harry that he should receive him privately at ten o'clock next morning on arriving at that time he was shown into the prince's private apartment and there explained to him the governor-general's desire that he should join the confederacy between the nizam and the english i have no quarrel with tupu the rajah said at present none can say how the affair will end all say that the peishwa has agreed to assist tupu he is a match and more for the nizam while we know not whether the english company or tipu is the strongest should i remain neutral the peishwa and tipu might eat me up that is true raja but you must remember that in the last war the english showed that they were much stronger than tipu and he was glad to make peace with them by giving up nearly half his territories we are much stronger now ships arrive each day with more and more troops and believe me tipu will assuredly be unable to stand against the english power even if he were backed up by the whole strength of Pune. of course we know that messages have been sent to you by tipu and that he has promised you a large slice of the nizam's dominions if you will invade them and to prevent him from aiding the english harry saw by this change in the prince's countenance that he was surprised to find that his negotiations with tipu were known to the english government he replied however it is true that tipu has sent to me but i have given him no answer the matter is too important to be settled in a hurry certainly tipu's offers were very advantageous i can understand that they were tempting raja yet they entailed a war against the english and the nizam when they had finished with tipu instead of gaining territory you would find that much of yours would be lost but undoubtedly were you to join us the governor-general would show that he was not unthankful for the service and your assistance would be handsomely recompensed what does the governor-general offer he is desirous of knowing what your own views are raja and he will assuredly meet them if possible i have not thought of it yet the prince said i must talk the matter over with my counsellors we are good friends with the peishwa also with the nizam and with tipu we know that the english are a great people but we have had nothing to do with them save that complimentary messages have been exchanged therefore it is not a matter upon which one can come to any hasty decision the governor-general would wish you to think the matter over well before deciding raja and indeed there is no occasion for undue haste seeing that the english army is still lying near madras and is not yet ready to advance therefore i will leave the matter for the present believing that in your wisdom you will be able to see how matters are likely to go and whether the english company or tipu are likely to be your best friends it was nearly a fortnight before harry heard again from the raja the latter had returned his visit and sent over presents of sweet meats and food to his guests at the end of that time he came in one evening with only two attendants i have come to speak to you on this matter privately he said my ministers are altogether divided in opinion some say we should fight against tipu who is a cruel and implacable foe and who has slaughtered all the hindus in his territory who refuse to embrace his religion others say it is better to be friends with him for it seems that these white men intend to eat up all india already they have taken the carnatic and bengal now they want to take mysore what will they take next for myself i wish well to the english though there are few of them they are brave and strong but my counsel know of the offer that tippoo has made us and unless i can show them that the english are also ready to give us material advantages i shall not be able to persuade my chiefs that our interest must lie in an alliance with them that is so raja and if you will inform me what are your expectations i will see how far they tally with those which the governor-general has authorized me to offer i am not greedy the prince said i wish only to have what is fair and just i think that our aid is worth two crores of rupees two hundred thousand pounds and that the company should put me in possession of the lands of perserum bow together with the land that lies between us and malwan including the territories of the raja of bhopal your demand harry said gravely is so far beyond what i was authorized to offer you that i fear it is altogether useless for me to submit it to the governor-general he would i am sure consider that in naming such terms you had resolved to make acceptance impossible 
that is by no means my intention the rajah said nothing could be further from my thoughts and in order to secure an alliance that i believe would be advantageous i might be able to make some slight concession i will send off a messenger then submitting your offer and asking for instructions and requesting that i may be allowed to meet you by further concessions on my part but i fear that strained as the english treasury is by the preparations for the war against tippoo it would be impossible for the company to pay the sum you name nor do i think that they would be disposed to guarantee you the territory of bhopal seeing that we have no quarrel with the rajah of that country no doubt they might be willing to grant you a portion of the territories of mysore lying on the other side of the godavari which would be as valuable as bhopal as the rajah himself was still uncertain as to which side it would be most advantageous to take and as he thought that the campaign against tippoo would last for many months he offered no objection to harry's proposal the latter sent off two troopers the next day with a letter to lord mornington saying that as the rajah's demands were he knew altogether out of the question he had sent them to him simply to gain time hoping that before the answer arrived the army would have gained such successes over tippoo as would induce the prince to greatly modify his terms the troopers were charged not to use undue haste but to travel quietly at a rate not exceeding twenty miles a day two months passed the rajah was in no hurry for the two parties among his counsellors were so evenly divided that he was by no means sure that even if he wished it he could put his army in motion in support of either the english or tippoo and in the next place he believed that the latter would win and was reluctant in the extreme to take any step that would draw down upon him the vengeance of the lord of mysore he occasionally saw harry and although he expressed his anxiety for the return of the messengers harry could see that this feeling was only feigned and that at heart he was not sorry that he was not yet called upon to decide at the end of a month harry had received a letter from the governor-general brought by a messenger in the disguise of a peasant it only said march sixth seventeen ninety nine the army has left valor on the eleventh the nizam's contingent also marched as has that from bombay by the first of this month all should have reached the plateau the bombay army at Sedasir, forty-five miles west of serenapatam and the main army about eighty miles east of that town by the end of the month both should be before tippoo's capital siege will probably occupy a month even if berar decides against us its army cannot arrive in time to aid tippoo therefore if you extend the negotiations for a month after you receive this your mission will have been fulfilled this messenger had of course been sent off before the arrival of the troopers in calcutta and if lord mornington's calculations were correct serenapatam would be invested before they could return three days later indeed a report reached nagpur that tippoo had fallen upon the advance guard of the bombay army and had been repulsed and on the twenty seventh he had attacked general harris and had again been defeated and that on the twenty eighth the main army had forded the cavalry and had marched to sosili this news caused great excitement in the town although serenopatam was generally supposed to be impregnable and as the english had failed to take it during the last war it was believed that after another futile siege they would be forced to fall back again from want of food as they did upon the previous occasion the rajah like the majority believed that serenopatam could defy any assault and that surrounded as the british army would be by the mysore cavalry they would very speedily be forced to retire and that although tippoo might have yielded to the wishes of his general and attempted to check the advance it could have been with only a portion of his army including the contingent furnished by the nizam the bombay army amounted to forty three thousand men tippoo was credited with having at least twice that force and his uniform successes against his neighbors had created a belief that he was invincible the rajah therefore was well content to let matters rest until more decisive news reached him it was on the seventh of april that the messengers returned with a letter we no longer want active assistance from berar the army is within striking distance of serenopatam and a few thousand native horse one way or the other will make but little difference you have done very well in gaining two months by referring the matter to me the rajah's demands are of course ridiculous he is evidently playing a double part 
and if we were defeated to-morrow would join tippoo and attack the nizam you can still however offer him five lakhs of rupees but do not guarantee him any additional territory the peishwa is acting in precisely the same way the army that was to come to our assistance has not yet moved and he like berar is simply awaiting events at seranapatam the raja came in that evening i hear that your messengers have returned sir yes i am sorry to say that the governor-general considers your demands are altogether excessive the treasury is almost empty and were he to guarantee you an extension of your dominions it would bring on a war with the peishwa and the raja of bhopal but he is willing to pay five lakhs of rupees to cover the maintenance of your troops while in the field the raja flushed with anger it is altogether insufficient he said i do not say that this is the final offer raja that is the offer i am authorized to make in the first place possibly if you are willing to make concessions of a reasonable kind i may be able to meet you and you must remember that the friendship of the company is of no slight advantage and would assuredly be of infinite value to you were your territory invaded by scindia and the peishwa these may at any moment make up their differences Perseram Bo may again become the commander of the Peishwa's army, and after the manner in which your troops have, for the last two or three years, raided his Jagir, he would be your bitterest enemy. Harry saw that this consideration made a powerful impression upon the Raja, and the latter said, I must think these matters over. The sum that you offer is altogether insufficient, and cannot be entertained for a moment. However, there is time for reflection." during the next four weeks harry saw the raja occasionally but the latter made no attempt to talk business he was evidently undecided in his mind as to the best course he should take he feared tippoo more than he feared the english and he still believed that the latter would assuredly fail in capturing seranapatam tippoo's offers too had been considerably higher than those of calcutta as he had promised him a large slice of the nizam's dominions for his assistance he had therefore determined to reject the english offer and to march into the nizam's country as soon as he heard that the besieging army had fallen back harry's suspicions that this was the case were to a certain extent confirmed by the fact that bodies of armed men began to arrive in considerable numbers he felt that his own position was beginning to be precarious and the native officer commanding his escort brought in almost hourly reports of what was passing in the city the population was a mixed one and nearly divided between hindus and mohammedans the latter naturally sympathized altogether with tippoo while the former were in favor of taking no part on either side so matters continued until the tenth of may when a horseman rode into the town with the news that seranapatam had been captured by the british and that tippoo himself was killed a feeling akin to stupefaction was excited by the news and it seemed at first that it must be false for it was incredible that tippoo with so strong an army should have been unable to defend the fortress that as was believed could withstand any attack however formidable for four months the raja sent at once to ask harry to visit him as he rode through the streets he saw by the scowling faces of the mohammedan soldiers how fierce a feeling of resentment had been excited by the news that the native officer had brought in a few minutes before the raja was deeply agitated have you heard the news sahib i have raja and do you think it possible perfectly indeed i have been expecting it for some days but i suppose the english general needed time to bring in provisions from the country round to form his plans and construct his batteries to me it is astounding the raja said walking up and down the room of course harry said the proposal that i made to you cannot now be carried out and i do not feel myself justified under the changed position of things in continuing the negotiations i always intended to help the english the raja went on no doubt raja i have noticed for some time that you have been gathering a large force here but you have given me no indication for what purpose it was intended it was intended of course for service with the english the raja said and it would have been set in motion as soon as the negotiations were completed at any rate raja in spite of the temptations offered you by tippoo you have remained neutral this will be considered in your favor and i can assure you that there will be no breach in the friendship between yourself and the english matters will merely remain as they were before this war commenced except that the nizam will become more powerful than before the raja said 
that will no doubt be so for he will certainly take a considerable share of tippoo's dominions but that need not trouble you i know the desire of the governor-general has always been for peace he was driven into this war by the failure of tippoo to carry out his undertaking to release all european prisoners in his hands and also by the great preparations he was making to regain territory that he had lost but it cannot be to the interest of the company that the nizam should use his increased power to be a scourge to his neighbors and i can promise you that any wanton aggression on his part will be regarded with displeasure and probably lead to their interference in your behalf now raha i must remind you that i am here as your guest and i rely upon you to protect me as i came through the streets the attitude of the mohammedan soldiers was very threatening and i should not be surprised if they attempted to attack the house i should not say that any outrage upon the escort of a british agent should be tremendously avenged and that you would be more easily forgiven had you taken the part of tippoo than if you allow me and my escort to be massacred i will take immediate steps for your safety and should any attempt be made i shall come with my household guards to your assistance a squadron of them shall ride back with you now to prevent any insult being offered to you in the streets i will relieve you of my presence to-night harry said i do not wish to be an object of strife between you and your people and will therefore take my farewell of you at once i shall have pleasure in informing the governor-general of the steps you have taken to provide for my safety and give him the assurance that my disposition is wholly friendly and that i rely on nothing so much as to secure his friendship and to remain on the most amicable terms with him end of section nineteen recording by dion gines salt lake city utah section twenty of at the point of the bayonet a tale of the mahratta war this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah. At the Point of the Bayonet, A Tale of the Mahratta War, by G. A. Henty. Chapter 9. A Popular Tumult. Part 2. Harry had no doubt that the assurance was given in earnest. The fall of Saranapatam and the death of Tipu had been a terrible shock to the Raja, and even the fact that he had missed his opportunity of allying himself with the English was as nothing to the thought of what would have happened had he declared for Tipu. The Raja at once gave orders for a squadron of his horse to mount, and continued his conversation with Harry until they were ready in the courtyard. Then, bidding adieu to the prince, the latter mounted, and was escorted through the streets by the cavalry guard but although their presence prevented any attack being made on him the lower class groaned and yelled and he had no doubt that had it not been for his escort he would have been murdered on his way back directly he arrived he called the troopers to arms and told them to barricade the gates and to be ready to take post at the windows in case of assault looking out he saw that the raja's men had taken up their position in front of the house a great crowd soon began to gather there most of the men were evidently soldiers and had arms in their hands loud shouts were raised and it was not long before a musket was discharged quickly followed by others the native officer in charge of the guard ordered the soldiers to seize those who had fired but as his men pressed their horses forward the crowd closed in upon them breaking their ranks and rendering them powerless while this had been going on the men of harry's escort were hard at work in getting up the paving stones of the yard and piling them against the gate the lower windows were all barred and as there was no entrance except by the front gate it was felt that they could hold the house for some time as soon as the guard were swept away a portion of the crowd attacked the gate with showers of stones while a heavy musketry fire was opened at every window so heavy was this that harry would not allow the troopers to show themselves there but posted them behind the barricades of stone against the gates so that when these yielded they might be able to open fire while showing only their heads over the top line of stones harry regretted now that he had not when he returned from the raja at once ordered his men to mount and cut their way through the mob a few at least might have escaped though doubtless they would have been pursued by the irregular cavalry as it was he felt that although they might sell their lives dearly they must be destroyed to a man unless the raja sent assistance to them that he would endeavor to do so he felt sure for the massacre of a british envoy and his escort 
was certain to bring the English troops to Nagpur sooner or later, and no assurances that the Raja had done all in his power to save them would be accepted as sufficient. The house stood in a garden which extended some distance behind it, and it was here that the horses were picketed. The front gate was a very strong one, and was certain to resist all attacks for some time. Harry called off half his men, and set them to work at the wall at the end of the garden, which was only constructed of dry mud, directing them to make a hole large enough for a horse to pass through. At this side all was quiet, the people in the native houses there having gone round to the front to watch what was doing. Harry stood there for a few minutes, watching the men at work, and saw with satisfaction their heavy tulwars rapidly cutting through the soft wall. He told them that, when they had finished, four of them were to remain to guard the hole, in case any might try to force their way in, and the rest were to return to aid their comrades at the gate. He had no great fear that the attempt would be made to enter in that direction, for the windows in the back of the house were, like those in front, large, and any one attempting to climb the walls and enter the garden would be liable to be shot down from the windows, as they could not be covered, as were those on the other side, by a fire kept up from the houses outside. The entrance into the garden from the house was made by a small door, at the bottom of a staircase leading from what had been the zanana, for the gardens were always considered the special domain of the ladies. There was another small door for the servants' offices, used by the men who, early in the morning, went in to keep the garden in order. When Harry rejoined the party in front, he found that the gates were yielding. The lower portion had been almost chopped away, but here the wall of stones prevented an entrance, and the men with their axes could scarcely reach to touch the upper half presently however the hinges of the upper end of one of the half doors yielded to the weight a great shout arose from the mob and the musketry hitherto directed against the windows was now concentrated on the opening but it was no longer one-sided the troopers glad that the time for inaction had passed returned the fire with vigour they had shifted the upper line of stones so that there was room between each for a musket barrel and lying in shelter they were enabled to take deliberate aim at their assailants. At every shot a man dropped, and the crowd opened speedily, and cleared away from the line of fire. There was a pause of some minutes, and then a strong party of soldiers rushed forward, and began to try to pull down the barrier, a number of others opening fire over their heads, so as to prevent the defenders from standing up to fire down into them. It was evident that, ere long, a slope would be formed outside, by which an assault could be made that his men would for some time repel any attack harry thought certain but sooner or later it would succeed and there would then be no time to retire he therefore sent a man back to see if the hole in the wall was large enough and he returned directly saying that the men there had just concluded their work and that six of them were coming back harry now gave orders to the native officer who was standing beside him to order these men to lead the horses through the opening when he had been gone a minute or two, he sent all the men, except four, to follow the example of their comrades, while those left with him redoubled their fire, so that their assailants should not know that any of the defenders had been withdrawn. It was not long before a trooper ran back, with the word that all the horses had been taken through. The news came just in time, for so much of the barricade had been pulled down, that it could now be climbed. Harry therefore gave the word, and, with the last of the defenders, went off at a run. The troop was gathered in the deserted lane at the bottom of the garden, and, on Harry's arrival, the men sprung into the saddles and galloped off. The rattle of musketry was now very heavy, but it suddenly stopped, and, a moment later, shouts and yells told that the breach had been carried, and the yard found to be deserted. They will search the house first, Harry said to the native officer, and they will be cautious about it, as they will think that, at any moment, they may come upon us, and will be sure that they would meet with a desperate resistance. I expect that it will be ten minutes before they discover how we have slipped through their hands. They made a long detour, and then approached the palace from the other side, Harry having determined to place himself under the protection of the Raja, for he did not think it possible that they could escape by hard riding as they might be pursued by the whole of the cavalry. Just as they were approaching it, they heard a fresh outbreak of firing, the musketry being mingled with the crack of field guns. The Raja has gone out to our rescue, Harry said. He would have been too late if we had stopped there. However, we can rely on him now. 
Five minutes later they rode into the courtyard of the palace. It was almost deserted, but one of the officials came out and, bowing deeply to Harry, said, The Raja himself has gone out with the household troops and a battery of artillery to put down the tumult. He is furious that his guests should have been attacked. The firing presently ceased, and quarter of an hour later the Raja rode in. A messenger had been dispatched at once to inform him that the British officer, with his escort, had arrived at the palace. Harry and his men had dismounted, and were still standing by their horses. The Raja sprang from his saddle as he rode up. "'The gods be thanked that I see you safely here, my friend,' he said. "'When I arrived at your house I feared that all was over, for these rebels had gained possession.' you must not blame me for not arriving sooner when the firing was heard i feared that the rabble of the town aided perhaps by many of my soldiers were attacking you although until the officer who commanded the guard i had placed there returned i did not dream how serious the business was then i got my soldiers together but this occupied some time as many of them were in the town however as soon as a squadron of horse was collected and a couple of hundred infantry together with four guns of a battery, I headed them myself and, on arriving, opened fire upon the mob, who speedily scattered, some fifty or sixty of them being killed. Then I entered the house, expecting to find only your dead bodies, but there were no signs of strife. I questioned some prisoners we had taken inside, and these said that, just before I came up, a hole had been discovered in the garden wall, and it was believed that you had all escaped through that. I was about to ride with all speed, to prevent any pursuit being taken up, when a messenger arrived with the welcome news that you had just entered the palace. I thank you heartily, Raja, for having so promptly come to my aid, though assuredly you would have arrived too late to save us, had we not, as soon as the fighting began, set to work to prepare a means of escape. Once we got out we were sure that you would protect us, and therefore rode here and awaited your return. "'Tis well indeed that you thought of that plan, Sahib, for I would not, for half my dominions, that a hair of your head should have been hurt, while you were here as my guest. It has all ended fortunately, Raha, and now what would you recommend me to do? You had best stay here until nightfall. I will ride now to the camps of my men, to reproach them for their conduct, and to ask if they want to bring the army that has just captured Saranapatam down upon us, when it is dark, I will myself accompany you, with my household cavalry, until you are miles away. I pray you to report to the Governor-General how grieved I am that evil-disposed persons should have raised a riot with the intention of killing you, and assure him that I did all in my power to save you, and shall, if they can be discovered, punish those concerned in the matter. I shall assuredly report very favorably of your conduct, Raha which will, I have no doubt, be warmly appreciated, and shall let the Governor-General know that, from the time of my arrival here, I always have been treated with the greatest courtesy and attention by you. Leaving the infantry and artillery with their guns in front of the palace, lest any attack should be made upon it, the Raja rode off with his cavalry, and returned two hours later with the news that all was quiet, and that the troops had returned to their duty. As soon as it was dark the party started. The Raja rode at the head of his cavalry, Harry at his request taking his place with his own escort in the center of it, so that his presence among them should not be suspected. It is as well, the Raja said, that the news that you have left should not be known till tomorrow morning, for although the troops would, I have no doubt, be obedient to my orders, in a town like this there are many budmashes, who might, if they knew that you had started, ride in pursuit, with the intention of attacking you, after I had left you. Once out of the town they proceeded at a rapid pace, which they maintained until twenty miles away from Nagpur. The Raja then returned with the main body of his cavalry, ordering a native officer and thirty men to escort Harry until he arrived at the frontier. There was, however, little occasion for this addition to Harry's force. The news of the fall of Saranapatam had spread like wildfire, and at each village through which they passed, and at those at which they halted for the night, the inhabitants saluted Harry with the deepest respect, and would willingly have supplied him and his escort with provisions without payment, had he not insisted upon their receiving fair value for them. At the frontier the Raja's troop turned back, and Harry continued his journey, reaching Calcutta early in June. 
when he arrived there he was well received by the governor-general who told him that he had rendered a great service by so delaying the negotiations that the rajah of berar had remained neutral during the war with tippoo and that he would probably soon require his services again a descendant of the rajah of mysore whose government hyder ali had usurped was released from captivity and raised to the musnad nearly half the revenue of the country was assigned to him a large sum was set aside for the maintenance of the families of hyder and tippoo and the remaining territory was divided between the company and the nizam a portion was set aside as the share of the peishwa although he had not fulfilled his engagement in any way but it was to be given only on the condition that he signed a treaty of alliance with the english similar to that entered into by the nizam the peishwa however would not consent to do this and the territory set aside for him was consequently divided between the company and the nizam civil war was raging in the deccan the widows of madu rao had been joined by a large force and were plundering scindia's villages while jeswant holkar was also ravaging the country scindia found that it was necessary to appoint baloba who had been for some years in captivity to the post of his chief minister and through him a treaty was made with the widows of madu and the trouble in that direction ceased the rajah of kolapur was at war with the peishwa and the troops of perseram bo and those of rastia were both defeated scindia and the peishwa now sent an army of thirty thousand horse and six thousand infantry against kolapur but perseram who was in command was defeated and fell mortally wounded another army joined the defeated force and invested kolapur on the thirteenth of march eighteen hundred nana furnuiz died and affairs in the mahratta country that had been to some extent kept in order by his wisdom and moderation now became worse than ever a dispute at once took place between the peishwa and the scindia each being desirous of obtaining the treasures nana was supposed to possess scindia seized his jagir gakke was released and obtained his former influence over scindia who seized baloba and threw him into prison where he died the peishwa on his part was determined to destroy all the friends of nana and inviting most of the principal men to the palace he seized and sent them all prisoners to hill forts he now with scindia determined to destroy the family and adherents of perseram bo Apa Sahib, Perseram's son, had succeeded him in the command of the army besieging Kolapur, and receiving intelligence of the conspiracy against him, raised the siege and retired to the Karnatuk, and Scindia plundered the whole of Perseram's villages. A fierce chief in Dundia invaded the newly acquired territories of the British, and Major General Wellesley was sent against him, and totally routed his party. Jeswant Holkar, was now becoming extremely dangerous, and Scindia was at last obliged to march away with his army to defend his own dominions. He left behind him five battalions of regular infantry and ten thousand horse, and, before he set out, compelled the Peishwa to give him gold to the amount of forty-seven lakhs of rupees. On his way through Malwan, he sent seven of his regular battalions to protect his capital. One column, under Captain McIntyre, was intercepted on the way, and all killed or made prisoners. Holkar then fell upon the other party, which he also overpowered and defeated. He next attacked Scindia's artillery on the march, but Major Brownrigg, an officer in the latter's service with four battalions, repulsed his assailants. The Peishwa, while this was going on, was mercilessly murdering or imprisoning those whom he considered his enemies, and ordered Witushi Holkar the brother of Jeswant, to be trampled to death by an elephant, Scindia having sent for Gatge to join him. Jeswant advanced to meet him, and was signally defeated. He speedily gathered a fresh force, and wasted not only Scindia's country, but that of the Peshwa. And finally a great battle was fought near Pune, in which Holkar, thanks to his fourteen regular battalions, officered by Englishmen, won a complete victory over the Peshwa's force, and that left behind by Scindia. The Peshwa was forced to fly and take refuge at Basin, where he entered into negotiations for British support. 
End of section 20. Recording by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah. Section 21 of At the Point of the Bayonet. A Tale of the Mahratta War. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah. At the Point of the Bayonet, A Tale of the Mahratta War by G. A. Henty. Chapter 10. A Mission by Sea. Part 1. A fortnight after Harry's return he was again sent for by Lord Mornington. Captain Lindsay, I am about to employ you on a mission of a somewhat delicate character. There have been many complaints that ships trading among the islands have been attacked and, in some cases, captured and the crews massacred by Malays. We recently received a communication from a native chief, or Rajah, who owns the southern point of the Malay Peninsula. He says that the Dutch, in Java, greatly interfere with his trade, as all vessels trading in the east are bound to touch at Batavia on their way to Europe, and consequently very few of them visit the peninsula, as to do so would greatly lengthen their voyage to Batavia. He asks that we should make a settlement at the end of the peninsula so that our ships may trade with him, and would be willing to place us in possession of an island two or three miles from the extreme southern portion of his dominions there can be no doubt that the position would be an extremely valuable one lying as it does on our trade route to the east but it is also certain that a settlement of that kind would be viewed with extreme jealousy by the dutch whose possessions in java and other islands render them practically masters of the whole malay archipelago certainly at present our hands are much too full here to permit of our engaging in any enterprise of this kind but at the same time it is desirable that we should obtain some reliable information as to the situation there, the power of this rajah, and the advantages that the island offers in the way of ports, the salubrity of its climate, and other similar particulars. Its possession would certainly be desirable, not only as a center for future trade with Bangkok and the East, but as a port from which our vessels of war might suppress the piracy that prevails all along the malay coast and in the neighboring island of sumatra such information may be extremely useful in the future and when our power in this country is consolidated but this is not the sole object of your mission you will proceed either before or after your visit to this rajah as we will determine to batavia bearing a dispatch from me to the dutch governor narrating a number of acts of piracy that have taken place among the islands and requesting that as they are the paramount power in that district they will take steps both for their own sake and ours to suppress piracy and offering on our part that two or three of our ships of war shall if they think it desirable aid them in the punishment of the malays you will be accompanied by an interpreter there are several malay traders established here and some of them no doubt speak hindustani fluently i will have inquiries made among them and will also procure you a dutch interpreter i do not propose that you shall go in a trading vessel to java the appearance of such a vessel off batavia would be resented by the dutch of course traders do go from here down to the islands but only to those not under dutch power they used generally to trade on their way down with burma and siam but the Burmese have shown such hostility to us that it is no longer safe to enter their rivers, and they have wrested the maritime provinces of Siam on this side of the peninsula from that power, so that trade there is, for the present, at an end. I shall therefore send you down in one of our small sloops. A larger vessel might irritate the Dutch, and a small one would be sufficient to furnish you with an escort to this rajah of Johore, not only for protection, but because the native potentates have no respect for persons who do not arrive with some sort of appearance of state. You will, of course, go as High Commissioner, with full powers to represent me. I do not anticipate that you will be able to conclude any formal treaty with the Rajah of Johore. He will, of course, ask for an equivalent, either in money or in protection against some neighboring Rajah. We have no money to spare at present, and certainly no troops. Your commission, therefore, will be to acknowledge his communication, to assure him of our friendship, 
to ascertain the suitability of the island that he offers and to tell him that at present being so fully occupied with wars here we are scarcely in a position to extend our responsibility but that when matters are more settled we shall be prepared to enter into a treaty with him to open a trade with his dominions to pay a fair sum for the possession of the island if suitable and to enter into a treaty of alliance with him of the value of such a settlement there can be no doubt whatever for we may take it that before very long some of the chinese ports will be open to european traders a week later harry embarked on a brig mounting eight guns and usually employed in police work along the coast he was accompanied by a dutch interpreter a malay trader abdul and four troopers of the governor-general's bodyguard in the handsome uniform worn by that corps the lieutenant in command of the brig received harry with the usual ceremony as a government commissioner he himself was at the gangway to meet him and twelve of the sailors with drawn cutlasses saluted as harry stepped on to the deck the lieutenant a young man of about four or five and twenty looked surprised when he found that the official whom he was to carry down to java was apparently younger than himself i suppose captain fairclough harry said with a smile when they entered the cabin that you expected to see a middle-aged man hardly that captain lindsay i heard that you were a young officer who had rendered distinguished services on the bombay side and had just returned from an important mission in the deccan but i own that i had not at all expected to see an officer younger than myself i can quite understand that i have been exceptionally fortunate owing to the fact that i speak mahratti as well as english well i hope that after your reception we have done with ceremony and that you will forget that i am at present a civil official with the temporary rank of commissioner and regard and treat me as you might any young officer who had been given a passage in your brig i have led a pretty rough life and hate anything like ceremony we may be some weeks on board together and should have a pleasant time of it especially as the whole country is new to me and to me also the lieutenant said i generally cruise from the mouth of the hooli to chittagong and a dreary coast it is with its low muddy shores and scores of creeks and streams in the sutterbunds there is little to look after the people are quiet and very scattered but farther east they are piratically inclined and prey upon the native traders and we occasionally catch them at it and give them a lesson well i shall be very glad to adopt your suggestion and to drop all ceremony i have not often had to carry civil officials in this craft she is too small for any such dignified people but when i was in the tigris we often carried civil and military officials from madras and some of them were unmitigated nuisances not the military men but the civilians the absurd airs they gave themselves as if heaven and earth belonged to them were sickening and they seemed to regard us as dust under their feet whenever we heard that we were to take a member of the council from calcutta to madras or the other way it was regarded as an infliction of a serious kind well i propose to begin with that when we are down here together we drop titles you call me lindsay and i will call you fairclough with all my heart the other said what officers have you a junior lieutenant and two midshipmen the lieutenant when i am alone always messes with me we are not so strict among our small craft in the company's service as they are in the royal navy and i think myself that it would be ridiculous for me to dine here by myself mr hardy by himself and the two midshipmen in a separate mess of their own that of course they do for they would not enjoy their meals with hardy and myself i quite agree with you this is your stateroom but it is your private captain fairclough is it not well yes but i am accustomed to turn out whenever there are passengers well at any rate i shall feel very much disgusted if you do so for me i should be most uncomfortable so i must insist on you having your things moved back here when i tell you that for sixteen years i lived in the house of a small mahratta cultivator you may well imagine that i can make myself perfectly comfortable anywhere it will be quite contrary to the rules of our service the other began hesitatingly i can't help that harry replied there are no rules without exceptions and mine is an altogether peculiar case you will really oblige me very much if you will have the change made i see that you are surprised at what i told you about myself it is too long a story to tell you now 
but i will after dinner to-day repeat to you and hardy some of my experiences which you will see have been curious and account for my having the rank of captain and being employed in a responsible position at my age i suppose you will soon be getting up anchor yes the tide will be favorable now and everything is ready for a start a few minutes later the clank of the capstan was heard and going on deck harry found lieutenant hardy preparing to sail as soon as the vessel was under way he came aft and was introduced to harry the latter had inquired of the chief of the governor's staff what was customary on these occasions and whether he was to take on board a stock of provisions not at all was the reply government makes an allowance for messing and wine sometimes an official will take a dozen or so of champagne with him as the allowance though liberal would scarcely cover this but it is quite sufficient to enable a captain to keep a good table and provide port and sherry harry seeing that the voyage might be much longer than usual had sent on board four dozen of champagne some of which he thought might be useful at the table if the rajah of Johore came on board with a number of his chiefs or if the ship was visited by dutch officials the dutch interpreter was to mess with the petty officers the malay preferred to prepare his victuals for himself the wind was light and the brig drifted quietly down the river and when the evening came on anchored as on account of the sandbanks and the lightness of the wind fairclough had thought it unadvisable to continue his voyage at night as soon as the sails had been taken in the two officers went down to the cabin where dinner was ready for them it was a pleasant one for the two naval men were in high spirits over this change from their ordinary routine and the prospect of sailing on a strange voyage abdul as usual had placed himself behind his master's chair but harry said i shan't want you to wait on me during the voyage abdul the captain's steward will do that after the meal was over cheroots lighted and a decanter of port placed on the table fairclough asked harry for the story he had promised him and the latter accordingly gave him a sketch of his life and adventures i no longer wonder lindsay at your having attained the rank of captain so young that old nurse of yours must have been a trump indeed but certainly it is wonderful that you should have lived first as a peasant and then at the peishwa's court so long without any one having had a suspicion that you were an englishman fancy your meddling in politics being regarded as a friend of the peishwa and this minister of his and being the means of getting the latter out of prison and so perhaps averting a war between the marathas and bombay that was a ticklish business too at nagpore and you were lucky in coming so well out of it but after all i think the most wonderful part is that a boy of sixteen should have been a shikari and killed no end of tigers leopards and bears and after that have risen so soon to the rank of captain in the company's service why you have seen and done more than most men double your age yes i have had great luck and it is all owing to my old nurse having taken such pains first to enable me to pass as a Mahratta, and in the next place to teach me the english language and english ways well the story has been an unconscionably long one i think i will go on deck and smoke a last cheroot and then turn in if you were a new hand from england i should say that you had better smoke it here fairclough said for the mists from the water and swamps are apt to give a fresh hands a touch of fever the time passed pleasantly as they made direct for the mouth of the straits between the malay peninsula and sumatra there was a light but steady breeze and on the morning of the eighth day after sailing harry on going on deck saw land on the port side as the lieutenant on the evening before said that they should next day sight the great andaman he was not surprised on looking at the chart he said to fairclough i should have thought that it would have been shorter to go on the other side of the islands it would have been rather shorter but there are four or five islands to the north of the andaman and another very small one halfway between it and the negras so i preferred going outside when we get south of the little andaman island we shall pass between it and the nicobar islands i fancy that they and perhaps the andamans once formed a part of sumatra they are scattered almost in a line from its northern point the land has probably sunk and these islands were no doubt the summits of mountains forming part of the chain that runs through sumatra once through the passage south of little andaman we shall sail due east for a day or two 
and then lay her course nearly southeast, which will take us right up to the straits between Sumatra and the Malay Peninsula. Are there any islands scattered about there? There is one nasty little group called the Arroya Islands, nearly in mid-channel. I shall take care to pass them in daylight. Farther down there are several largish islands near the Sumatra coast, but as the passage is some sixty miles wide, there is little fear of our running foul of them. Have the Dutch any settlements at Sumatra? Two or three. Palembang is the principal. It is on a river that runs down into the Banca Straits. I believe that they have trading stations at Jambi and Siak. End of section 21 Recording by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah. Section 22 of At the Point of the Bayonet, A Tale of the Maratha War. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah at the point of the bayonet a tale of the mahratta war by g a henty chapter ten a mission by sea part two a fortnight later the brig anchored off the coast of singapore during the voyage harry had had many conversations with the malayan interpreter the latter told him that the chief who had written might not be in a position to carry out his offer not only were the small malay states frequently engaged in wars with each other but there were constant internal insurrections and struggles the various petty chiefs frequently endeavouring to set up as independent powers at the present time the tumangong or chief justice had obtained possession of the island of singapore and the adjacent district of the mainland while other chiefs had also thrown off their allegiance to the rajah of Johor who himself had usurped the power from the former reigning family. If, he said, you want only to obtain a place for trade, the Tumangong is no doubt the person from whom you must obtain it. But if you wanted the whole island, you would have to treat not only with him, but with the Raja, as, in case the latter should defeat and overthrow the Tumangong, he certainly would not recognize the cession of the island to you. Is there a good port? no but it is not needed they do not have hurricanes here as they do in the bay of bengal and in the china seas and indeed among the islands so vessels can anchor off the coast in safety at all times of the year what is the island like it is covered with forest and jungle the malay replied there are but few inhabitants a hundred and fifty or so most of these are my people but there are a few chinese and bugis the malays are not cultivators they live by piracy attacking small native vessels passing through the narrow passages between singapore and the mainland the chinese cultivate patches of land is it fertile very rain falls there more than half the days in the year if the chinese had it they would make a garden of it it is better even than the land on that part of sumatra where they produce spices and grains of all sorts the Malay Peninsula would be very wealthy were it not split up into several kingdoms that are always at war with each other. Singapore was a great place once. Seven hundred years ago it was the capital of the whole Malay kingdom, but it was taken a hundred years afterwards by the king of Java, and Malacca then became the Malay capital. The affair does not seem very promising, Harry said, after repeating to Fairclough what he had heard from the Malay from my experience of the indian princes there is very little trust to be placed in any agreement made with them they keep it just as long as it suits them and then break it without the slightest sense of having done anything dishonourable it seems to me that the position here is very much like that in deccan scindia holkar and the rajahs of berar and kolapore are practically independent of the peshwa who maintains only a semblance of authority from what the interpreter tells me, there seems to be only a puppet rajah who today possesses no authority whatever, but who tomorrow may excite a quarrel among the other chiefs and again become their master. I think that in the first place I shall have to see this semi independent chief whose possession Singapore forms part of, and afterwards the rajah of Johor, his nominal master. The latter may view the matter in one of two ways in the first place he may consider the island of no importance whatever 
seeing that even were he again its master no revenue could be obtained from the handful of people living there and would therefore be glad to ratify the cession to us for a small sum on the other hand he may consider that the elevation of the island into the position of a great european trading port would add greatly to the power and importance of the tumangong and might enable him to make himself master of the whole of Johor. it seems a complicated business certainly the sailor replied you see though this rebel chap having written to calcutta may be trusted to receive you hospitably there is no saying what the rajah may think of it nor is it clear how i am going to get at the rajah harry remarked the tumangong would no doubt object to my going beyond what he considers as his territory as it might seem that did he let me do so he would be recognizing the power of the rajah to interfere in his business however it is certain that i must carry home a clear report on the situation and to do that i must at any rate attempt to see the rajah of course we must endeavor to learn from the malays on the island whether Johor still holds any territory running down to the sea, or whether the coast chiefs have also revolted against him. In the first case, I will send up a native to say that I have a mission from the Governor-General of India to visit his court. But if he is cut off from the sea, I must endeavor to make my way through somehow. It would never do to return with only half a story. I do not suppose the Governor-General is at all aware of the state of things here, or that the chief who communicated with him is not the acknowledged Rajah of Johor. There can be no doubt that the possession of this island would be of great value to us, as it would become a center of trade, not only with the east, but with all the islands round, except of course those belonging to Holland. Therefore the first essential point is to ascertain whether the old Rajah is likely to regain his former authority and whether if so he will recognize and on what terms the cession of the island to us well i am glad lindsay that it is your business and not mine for it seems a very difficult affair and a somewhat dangerous one three weeks after leaving calcutta the brig reached the island and at harry's request sailed round it taking soundings very frequently in order to obtain knowledge of the depth of the water and the nature of the sea bottom finally they anchored in the straits between it and the mainland this varied in width from two miles to a quarter of a mile and the depth of the water at the eastern extremity of the straits was found to be insufficient for vessels of a large tonnage though navigable for ordinary native craft the island itself was some twenty-five miles long and fifteen miles wide being as fairclough calculated about a third larger than the isle of wight no high hills were seen but the whole island was undulating and everywhere covered with forest and jungle several small malay canoes had put off to them with fruit and as from what the interpreter had told them of the smallness of the population there was clearly no chance of any attack being made on the brig they were allowed to come alongside the supply of fruit was very welcome and the interpreter learned something from the natives as to the state of things on the mainland as to this however they appeared to take but little interest they admitted that the tumangong was their lord but as they were too poor for him to levy any contributions from them his mastership was merely a nominal one and they did not trouble themselves about him if he should at any time send an officer and troops to exact tribute money they would simply retire into the interior where they could defy pursuit they had heard reports that there were wars on the mainland but beyond the fact that the rajah possessed very little authority they were unable to give any information they had vaguely heard that some of the chiefs supported the family of the former rajah on the day after their anchoring a large canoe put off from the mainland in the stern sat two men whose gay dresses showed them to be minor chiefs or officials harry who had throughout the voyage worn only civilian costume of white drill now put on his full uniform as did the sowars of his escort the latter was lowered for the accommodation of the visitors and these on reaching the deck were received by fairclough his officers and a guard of honor the malay interpreter stood by the captain's side why do you come here was their first question we bring a high officer of the governor-general at calcutta to confer with the lord of singapore fairclough answered through the interpreter 
our lord thought that it might be so one of the officials said and therefore sent us off to inquire fairclough led the malays to the quarter-deck where harry was standing with his four troopers as a bodyguard behind him this is the official whom the governor-general has sent to you the malays struck with harry's uniform and still more with that of his guard all of which were new to them and impressed them deeply solemned profoundly to him i have arrived harry said as the agent of our great governor and in answer to a request of your lord the tumangong that he should send an officer of rank here to treat with him seeing this vessel of war the malay said when harry's speech had been translated to him our lord hoped that it might be so and directed us should this prove correct to inform you that he will himself come off to see you in three days time he has heard of the might of your lord in india that he has conquered great kingdoms that the rule is a wise one and that the people are well contented we love not the dutch who are hard masters and make the people labor for them and he desires to be on terms of friendship with the power which as he understands has taken their strong places in india so that they have no longer any importance there he has done wisely harry said and i shall be glad to see your lord and to tell him what is in the mind of our governor the envoys were then invited to the cabin where they were offered refreshments they ate sparingly but greatly appreciated the champagne and asked through the interpreter if they could be instructed how to make this liquor and were much disappointed on learning it could only be made from the juice of the grape that grew in a certain land in europe and could not be manufactured elsewhere though other wines which were equally good could be made that as the fruits grown in a hot country like theirs could not be grown in europe where the climate was much colder so the grape could not flourish in their hot country three days later the tumangong came off in a canoe gaily decorated by flags attended by several smaller craft as he set foot on the deck a salute was fired he appeared much disturbed when the first gun went off but the interpreter explained to him that it was a mark of honor always granted to native princes of importance seeing that no harm was done by the fire the malay approached harry whose escort had been rendered more imposing by a line of blue jackets with musket and cutlass drawn up behind them harry advanced to meet him and friendly greetings were exchanged he then invited him down into the cabin where he was accompanied by one of his chief officers harry the captain and the interpreter went down with them the malay commenced the conversation i hope that you bring a favorable answer to my letter the governor bids me say that he willingly accepts your offer of friendship and would readily establish a trading station on the island of singapore but that being now engaged in a serious war in india it is not in his power at present to engage in an alliance that might involve him in war here since he might be unable to fulfill his obligations with us obligations under a treaty are regarded as sacred and to be upheld at all sacrifices later on when affairs are more settled in india he will gladly form an alliance with you here is a dispatch in your language stating his reasons more fully but in order to show his friendship he has sent me down in this ship of war to explain matters to you and to assure you that he appreciates your offer and will later on accept it but that he cannot enter into such a treaty now as being engaged in war he might not be able to protect you from all enemies should you call upon him to do so i am the bearer of several presents from him which he has sent as a proof of his friendship towards you he touched a bell and at the signal some sailors brought in the presents consisting of a handsome double-barreled gun a brace of pistols some embroidered robes and some bales of english cloth and other manufactures also a dinner service of pottery an ormulu clock and other articles the rajah whose face had at first expressed disappointment was evidently much pleased with these presents and after perusing the letter expressed himself as well contented with its terms i value them all the more he said because they are a proof that the english do not make treaties unless able to fulfil the conditions this is far better than accepting treaties and then withdrawing from them you can assure the great lord of calcutta although i regret much that he cannot at present form an alliance with me that i shall be ready to renew the negotiations with him 
whenever he notifies me that he can do so the champagne was then produced the tumangong had evidently heard from his officers how delicious was the strange drink which bubbled as if it was boiling and was yet quite cold two bottles were put upon the table and the malays after tasting it cautiously at first consumed the greater portion the two officers only sipping theirs occasionally and filling up their glasses so as to keep the others in countenance accustomed to more fiery beverages obtained from traders in the dutch possessions the malays were in no way affected by their potations although these evidently impressed them with the superiority of the english over their dutch rivals for the tumangong remarked truly the english must be a great people to make such liquors the dutch sell us fiery drinks but their flavour is not to be compared with these i hope that your lord when he again sends a ship down to me will forward me some of this drink i have fortunately a case of it with me harry said it contains two dozen bottles i will give orders for it to be placed in your boat he could see by the malay's face that he was greatly gratified and he added i have no doubt tumangong that when i inform the governor-general that you were pleased with this drink he will order some of it to be sent down when there is an opportunity so that the friendship between you and him can be maintained until the time comes when he can arrange with you for the concession of a trading station on the island of singapore the offer shall be always open to him there is no occasion for haste the conversation continued for some time longer and then the malay and his officers took their places in their canoe and rowed off under a salute similar to that which had greeted their arrival that is quite satisfactory harry said to the commander yes there is no doubt that he thought more of your present of champagne than of the gifts sent him by the governor and your promise to let him have a consignment occasionally will keep him in good temper now what is your next move i think it would be best to finish with the dutch first if there were any delay in the other matter they might get news from malacca or some of their trading stations in sumatra that the ship has been here and in that case they would guess that we are thinking of establishing a trading station and might send and make their own terms with the tumangong there can be no doubt that if we open a free port here it will do great damage to them and divert a large portion of the eastern trade here being so much more handy for all the country craft trading with siam and china besides having the advantage of avoiding the heavy dues demanded by the dutch no doubt that will be the best way fairclough said we will get up anchor to-morrow morning in the course of the afternoon a large canoe came off loaded with presents of fresh meat fruit and vegetable sent by the tumangong together with some handsomely mounted creases for harry and the officers of the ship they continued their voyage without incident to batavia arriving there they dropped anchor and saluted the dutch flag the salute was returned from the shore and shortly afterwards a large boat flying the flag of holland and carrying several persons rowed out to them it was apparent at once when they ascended to the deck that the visit of the british ship of war was not a welcome one the jealousy of the dutch of any attempt on our part to obtain a footing among the islands was intense and the opinion on shore on seeing the brig would be that she had come to announce that possession had been taken of some unoccupied island their manner therefore was cold when harry informed them through his dutch interpreter that he was the bearer of a dispatch to the dutch governor from the governor-general i must say that it refers he said to the numerous outrages committed by the malays upon vessels owned by british subjects trading among the islands and that he suggests that the dutch authorities should join in an attempt to punish these marauders from whom they suffer equally with the british the governor will receive you at three o'clock this afternoon you will of course wish to deliver your dispatch personally to him and as we shall acquaint him with its import he will no doubt be prepared to give you an answer forthwith without further words the officials returned to their boats they are a surly set of beggars fairclough said as they rowed off i don't think there is much chance of cooperation in that quarter indeed i am by no means sure that at heart they do not approve of these malay attacks at present they monopolize the trade in spice 
the native craft from all the islands bring their productions here and there can be no doubt that the piracies of the malays act as a great deterrent both to the native traders and our own from calcutta and madras i think that very likely that is so harry agreed i do not think that the governor had any belief that they would cooperate in the matter and really only invited them to do so because it would explain the presence of a ship of war in these waters so i shall be in no way concerned if this part of my business turns out a failure at the appointed time the captain's gig was lowered and harry and fairclough took their places in it another boat carried the dutch interpreter and the four troopers they were received on landing by an official and a guard of honor and were conducted to the governor's residence another guard of honor was drawn up at the entrance they were shown into a large room where the governor was seated surrounded by the members of his council he rose and advanced a few paces shook hands with the two officers and begged them to be seated on two chairs next to him harry handed the dispatch to him it is very short sir he said and perhaps as you are aware of its import you will just glance through it the governor did so and afterwards handed it to one of the members of the council and it was passed from hand to hand i am quite in accord the governor said with lord mornington that the attacks of the malays which we as well as yourselves suffer from are deplorable and it is greatly to be wished that they could be suppressed but i think that lord mornington could hardly have been informed as to the great number of islands inhabited by the malays and the great naval force that would be required to overawe and punish these freebooters who are so bold that they do not hesitate to attack our traders even when large ships and carrying guns for their protection nothing short of a great fleet of cruisers would suffice in the next place did we undertake any operations on a large scale against the malays throughout the islands they would unite against us and might in revenge assail many of our ports and do us enormous damage even if your fleet performed half the work it is we only who would be the sufferers certainly we have not sufficient vessels of war to attempt such an operation and even were the governor-general of india to send down as many vessels as we have at our disposal the force would be altogether inadequate for such extensive operations these islands are counted by hundreds and on the approach of ships of war the people would desert their villages by the seashore and take to the interior where it would in most cases be impossible to follow them and all the damage we could inflict would be to burn their villages which could be rebuilt after the ships had sailed away to exterminate piracy would be the work not of months but of many years however i shall consult my council and will draft a reply to the dispatch to-morrow you have had a pleasant voyage down i hope very much so harry replied we have had fine weather and light breezes the conversation was continued for a few minutes and then the little party returned to their boats there is not much doubt what the reply will be fairclough said no and on the whole i don't see that the governor is to be blamed though of course he has not given us the principal reason which is his objection to our flag being seen flying beside the dutch among the islands still there is a good deal in what he says i think so too you see they are going to send their answer to-morrow which may be taken as a proof that they are anxious to get rid of us as soon as possible end of section twenty two recording by dion gines salt lake city utah